Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Engineer Your Career. We are live and virtual from our homes, which feels a bit weird. Uh, we're normally in a studio somewhere doing these events, seeing you people face to face and engaging with you in person. But as we're all here in the pandemic, we're all online together, so it's great. And we're really gl glad that you've joined us for it. Um, I'm Amanda Thompson from Campus Media. And I'm Lindsay from Campus Media. Lovely to virtually meet you all. Um, I guess maybe we'll kick off with why we're, we're all here today with this event. I think, you know, the en engineering industry is such a vast, vast industry. And we've got so many people in the younger generations who don't quite know how to get into it, quite how vast, how big it is, you know, how many different roles within the en engineering industry you can actually go into. And um, so we're really hoping to cover off as much as that of that as possible today. And hopefully you'll walk away from this with us shedding a good bit of light on that today. And also, let's not forget, the engineering sector is crying out for more young people. They need more women, they need more people from ethnic minority backgrounds to ensure a balanced and equal workforce. We know that employers understand there's huge benefits from having a balanced workforce so that they're able to deliver services that complement everybody. Um, also, companies are 15% more likely to perform better if they have a diverse workforce as well. Um, and it's key for new innovation. Yeah, I mean, also, Amanda, let's not forget today is World Engineering Day as well. So thank you guys for joining and celebrating that with us. And um, it only felt right to run Engineer Your Career today. Um, it's the third year celebrating World Engineering Day. And I think we all know that this year in particular is, um, you know, a very, very good year to highlight that. I think the engineers that have worked tirelessly to help us throughout this pandemic and really improve our lives. Um, I personally, just a personal approach, I, I know a few that have helped me. You know, I've had engineers in to help my internet and virtual setup. So um, I think we can all give a bit of celebration and thanks to that. I'm really sorry about that, everybody. I cut off slightly then. <laughs> the, the, it is the, just as I, as just as I was discussing, just <laughs> as I was discussing engineers coming out to help our virtual setup, that's the perfect example. But um, I think I'm just going to run out. over. It's going to happen right there, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly that. Exactly. Um, Amanda, do you want to run over what the in terms of the event today? I think I, well, I'll run over the agenda in a sec. Absolutely. With you guys, um, we. We've designed this event with you guys in mind. We've got everybody on uh, the event today from um, people taking their GCSEs and A-levels at college, at university. You might even be studying for a postgraduate at the minute, or you might have graduated in the midst of this pandemic and just not really know what you want to do with your degree and so today's event is designed all around that we're going to be unco uncovering myths about the engineering industry we're going to be raising awareness of hidden careers from some amazing employers um, who have a huge range of uh, engineering opportunities within their organizations and luckily we're going to be having a couple of those employers live today to talk about their different opportunities that you've got as well. Um, which leads me nicely on to saying thank you to our partners. We have um, had such an amazing support from employers and um, institutions and organisations to come together to pull this amazing content together for us today. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, the Institute of Engineering and Technology, um, and the RAF who share our common goals in trying to change these stereotypes within the engineering industry so that we're all achieving a diverse and equal workforce. The IET.TV are also streaming this event. Hi Lee and Tom, who are the background team. Sorry to panic you there when I lost connection. Um, smoothing it out. So uh, the IET.TV guys are gonna be bringing this event to you seamlessly. Um, and I'd also like to thank everybody at home as well for joining us. And you've sent us in some amazing questions so far for our panel discussion. So thank you for that. 
Any new questions, please put it in the chat. We want to hear your comments. We want to hear your questions. Uh, we've got all of our employers and our speakers are going to be joining in on the event today to answer your questions. So please pop them in. Don't be shy. If you're wondering it, chances are somebody else is wondering it as well. So pop it in the chat and you will have people there to answer it as well. Absolutely, absolutely. But I think um, we'll kick off actually introducing you to our agenda today. Um, I'm sure a few of you have seen um, across our social media channels, we've got a great lineup of sessions for you guys today, uh, right from youth and the Royal Air Force uh, student panels and employer panels, great panel discussion. So as Amanda said, please, please, please get your questions in because we'll do all we can to get them answered. We've got some inspiring podcasts for you to give you guys a bit of a break, a bit of an eye break so you can go off and get yourself a drink and a snack throughout the event. Um, We've got a round table, an engineering round table discussion, which actually is really, really, really good. So definitely tune in for that. We've got all things RS. We've got apprenticeship opportunities. We've got undergraduate engineering courses. And we've got graduate employers discussing what it's like to work for them and what it's like to be a graduate engineer. So definitely, definitely tune in. Um, and if you, know, if you don't manage to catch all of the sessions, then please, please, please catch them on demand if you've registered you will be able to catch them on demand but I am confident Amanda and I are confident that you'll walk away from this with bags and bags of advice and takeaways from this event so please please do check out our agenda to see what's coming up today and we will see you soon we're going to leave the agenda up there for you to have a look through um, make sure you make a note of the times if you definitely want to miss uh, don't want to miss it um, also if you've got classes, we know, we appreciate that as well. Everybody is trying to work from home, everyone's trying to homeschool as well. So um, this event is really designed to fit around your, your day. If you miss anything and you've already registered for the event, then we'll be sending you some content through Absolutely. after yeah. the event as well. Great, should we kick off? Let's, yeah, let's start. Good afternoon. I'm really happy to be here today at this virtual conference. My name is Melissa Ramid and I'm the owner of an engineering consultancy company called Techwoman. I'm here today to give you an insight into my career so far, how I promote gender equality within the STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths industries and to showcase the opportunities available to you. I'd like to start by talking about how important it is to have female leaders within STEM industries to look up to and to be inspired by. So what is a female leader? A female leader is one who is passionate about advocating change and identifying innovative ways to improve solutions. So women have come a long way throughout the years from gaining the right to vote, to being able to join engineering institutions and flying an aircraft. This is mainly due to strong female leaders standing up for what they believe in and paving a path for the rest of us to follow. We look to role models who already guide us in other aspects of life. We follow the most popular TV shows, the latest fashion trends and the newest songs by following trending artists. In the same way, we need successful female role models in technology and engineering to demonstrate that they are an option for women despite both being male dominated industries. This is why I am an advocate for women in STEM industries. And here is my story so far. I was born in the Maldives in 1994 and lived there till I was four years old. We then moved to Manchester in the UK for me and my sister's education. 
Since I was young, I've always been very creative and curious, spending hours exploring and trying to understand how things worked. Growing up, I was inspired by seeing my father in aviation. He spent over 24 years working in the airline industry with roles as a station manager in the Maldives and as an aircraft dispatcher for various types of aircraft, including the Airbus A380 for Emirates in the UK. I was also inspired by my grandfather, who was a mechanical engineer for the parliament in Sri Lanka. I loved watching him invent gadgets as I was growing up and explain the engineering theories to me. During school, my favourite subjects were science, maths and art. I was very practical, but it was steered away from the more hands-on subjects like engineering and more towards separate sciences. This naturally made me think that medicine would be a career to consider, but being practically minded, I struggled to be certain of this until I had experienced this firsthand. So how will you know if you like doing something until you experience it? I'm fortunate to have very supportive parents who organised a range of work experience placements so that I could have a sneak peek in different industries and roles. This included creating design marketing material for Weber Shandwick, a public relations company in the UK. I was very lucky to get a placement at a general hospital in Sri Lanka, where I got to watch an emergency caesarean section being performed. Let's just say that the mother wasn't the only one who was scarred for life that day. While in Sri Lanka, I also went to Holson Lanka, a cement manufacturing company where I got to understand the quality of engineering processes. Back in the UK, I spent some time in a pathology lab to investigate different specimens for potential diseases. My final placement was shadowing an engineer at Oman Air at Heathrow Airport, where I actually got to experience being in the tug when it was towing an aircraft, and it was the placement that I enjoyed the most. This work experience was invaluable as it gave me an instant feel of my likes and dislikes in certain jobs. As Einstein once said, the only source of knowledge is experience. My work experience was invaluable and made me realise that engineering encompassed my creativeness and curiosity and was a subject for me to pursue. With my decision made to pursue engineering, I started a degree in aeronautical engineering at the University of Salford. After researching, I decided that I wanted to take a placement year to get real life working experience. So I worked hard to get a first in my first year to help me secure one. I secured an industrial placement year at Technicover, a mechanical engineering company who specialised in security products, which protect the critical national infrastructure. This experience I gained from my placement was invaluable. I was able to gain engineering skills that I couldn't have learned at university. The beauty of engineering is, lies in the fact that it's such a vast industry in terms of specialisms. The skills you learn are transferable, so you aren't stuck in one job role. No one told me that at the time and I found this out for myself during my placement year. Here I found my passion as a design engineer and I gained real life practical experience of the operation of a typical engineering company. After achieving a first class degree, I always knew that the next step in my career was to complete a master's. I secured a knowledge transfer partnership, KTP for short, which allowed me to manage a two year funded project in industry, gain personal development, as well as complete a master's all at the same time. My KTP was between the University of Salford and Technocover and focused on security products. The project aim was to improve the design process for security products and make it more cost effective and quicker. I was able to do this by creating and implementing modern prototyping and research tools, which can be used to predict future testing. The methodologies introduced at the company were shown to reduce 42% of the physical test costs of a product and reduce the timescales of a new product by 21 days. The KTP was a big stepping stone in my career so far and allowed me to gain skills which I can now use in my career moving forward. I had a development budget and I needed to choose how I was going to use it. I split this up into management skills, engineering skills and skills needed for the future. The management skills were a Chartered Management Institute Level 5 Award, 
and a yellow and green belt in Lean Six Sigma. Engineering skills were a solid simulation course and an understanding structural behaviour course. These, along with my master's degree, allowed me to become an incorporated engineer affiliated with IMECI, and I'm currently working towards my chartership. I was also involved with a lot of STEM promotion through events and networking, but found having a full-time job, it was hard to commit my time to this, even though it was a passion of mine. On the completion of my KTP and Masters, I was looking for a way to still do engineering projects, as well as promote women in engineering and STEM. I've made it my mission to be a female leader in engineering, to be the female engineering role model I never had when I was at the start of my career. This is why I set up my own company, Tech Woman Limited, so I could still work on engineering projects, as well as devote time to promote women in engineering and STEM. The Tech Women is an engineering consultancy company specialising in design engineering for the physical security of critical national infrastructure. Our company's mission is to empower women in engineering, improve gender parity in the industry and promote STEM careers to the next generation. Did you know only 13% of engineers in the UK are female? We need to do more to improve gender equality in all of the STEM industries. So what do we do to try and change this? We write and feature in blogs, raising awareness of STEM and diversity. We participate in campaigns, offer mentoring services to females considering a career in STEM, be active STEM ambassadors and role models, as well as delivering STEM activity days. Here are a few companies and institutions that we've collaborated with so far to make our voice heard worldwide. A few of my personal highlights included being part of the One Million Women in STEM and writing articles for Avanti and the Female Lead to celebrate International Women in Engineering Day 2019 and 2020. Check out our social media profiles to follow our mission. We've partnered with Up Education to guide students wanting to study abroad at six universities and 13 colleges throughout New Zealand and Australia. But the services that we provide include guidance on an appropriate course, supporting students through the enrolment and visa processes, as well as throughout their studies and during their stay in New Zealand or Australia. And finally, career guidance following the completion of their degree. So there's evidence to show that girls lose interest in STEM subjects as they get older. And I have experienced that firsthand. I was one of two females in my physics and maths A-level classes, which had around 20 to 30 students. One of five females of a batch of 60 in my first year of my degree, and the first female employed in the technical department on my industrial placement year. These facts spurred me on to make a change. Tech Women delivers activity days to primary schools across the UK to promote STEM at a grassroots level. So these are bespoke activity days which provide pupils with the opportunity to meet our STEM ambassadors who have a variety of different roles in STEM industries. They're from different backgrounds and they are of different genders. These activity days are designed to provide opportunities for pupils to understand STEM concepts but also whilst having fun. I believe the best way to promote STEM is by using real life STEM role models from the industry so the pupils can speak to our STEM ambassadors and hear about different job roles and they realise that they don't have to look or behave a certain way to embark on a particular career. The Tech Women STEM Ambassador Programme is designed to train people from the STEM industry to give back to the industry by being role models and allowing them to share their career pathways and knowledge. So far, Tech Women has successfully delivered STEM activity days to over 1,300 pupils across the UK. And this is just the start. I'm proud to say over 70% of our ambassadors are female. So what's in it for you? It's a rewarding role with an opportunity to give back to the next generation. Networking opportunities within our team of ambassadors, mentoring from the Tech Women team. You also get a daily rate with travel, accommodation and food expenses covered. 
The activity days take a lot of organising, but hearing girls announce that they want to be an engineer, just like me, at the end of an activity day, and seeing how much fun that the pupils have had fills me with pride. Looking back at my time in school, I wish that I had these opportunities. Maybe then my decision to choose engineering would have been made much, much sooner. The key pieces of advice I would like everyone to take from today are to try and get as much work experience as you can. This will help you understand your likes and dislikes and decide the best career for you. You might not always end up in the job that you are studying your degree in, and that is fine. In this industry, the skills are transferable, which can be used in many STEM careers. Get involved in campaigns to be role models for the next generation. We are always looking for more STEM ambassadors. If you're interested, apply on the Tech Woman website. If you believe in something, get involved and see how you can help make a difference. Always give 100%. If you're not fully committed, you'll never know what you could have achieved. Thank you for listening to my story and please follow our mission on our social media platforms. Everyone wants to have a positive influence on the world in the best way they can. In my opinion, engineering is the best way to do that. It goes all the way from something as simple as a microchip in the, in the latest phone to building a rocket and engineering encompasses all of that. At the moment, I'm focusing on the development of Hyperloop. RS was pretty fundamental in our development. We were able to go onto the RS website and look through it, see which parts we need, which made it really easy. We didn't have to shop around. We knew exactly where we needed to go to get everything we needed, which meant that if, if we needed a part, you could go look at RS, find it, click, buy, and it's there the next day. And that was fundamental in our prototyping. In Waverley train station, there's a quote from the great Sir Walter Scott, that the increasing powers of steam will one day waft friends together in a matter of hours. Now, with the Hyperloop, we could turn those hours into minutes. To say I had a part in that transformation, would make me immensely proud. The Hyperloop work on a theory that you have a, a vacated tube in which you have a, a track and then you don't let your train roll on rails but instead you levitate it. Therefore there's no rolling resistance and no air resistance. My involvement last year is I, I developed the brakes. We used a similar system as our levitation using magnets because not only do they create a lift force, there's also a slight offset which creates a drag force we utilise that drag force to slow the pod down without any contact. Actually having these really strong magnets and handling them and fitting them into the pod is really challenging because you need to think of every movement you do from picking it up to moving over the room to putting it into the pod. The first team stems from the first SpaceX competition. We've got more people interested and now we've got so many people that we feel like we can not only make a reasonable prototype, actually make it a, a much bigger prototype. And at the SpaceX competition, it was very like awe-inspiring because you're, you're one of 24 teams out of hundreds or thousands which applied. We were one of four in Europe and we were the only one in the UK to get that far. So we, we definitely felt a sense of almost responsibility to represent the UK. What we're doing here isn't, isn't easy but as long as you have the right people around you and everyone is quite like-minded and all very driven to get this, this done and to get it to work properly, you can do anything. I've been interested in engineering and science and technology for a very long time. I can distinctly remember physics lessons and maths lessons. I find it amazing that just through some equations and some math, you can predict and influence the world around you. Hyped and Hyperloop is really attractive because it does let you create. We've enjoyed it every second and it's really good to investigate and explore and try. I'm really looking forward to the stage where our designs are done and we're ready to start manufacturing. That's the part I really like. I really like actually building stuff and turning things from theory and design into reality. I get inspired by what, what potentially could I do.
And I think the best way to find out what I could potentially do is to go out there and do things, because who knows where you could end up and what you could do. The future inspires me. I'm Macaulay Verzi, a member of Team Hyped, and I'm an engineering student. I love apprenticeships because it allows people that are willing to learn the opportunity to get a job within the industry. It makes it possible to earn a living while getting that invaluable experience that will eventually open doors for you in the future. The reason why I love apprenticeships is because it gives you an opportunity to learn and earn and be able to get the knowledge and skills to jump on a very good career pathway. I love every single aspect of apprenticeships. New people you get to meet, the job on training, the college work, the work in general is just amazing and all the different people you get to meet and actually putting something into the community which you know is going to be there for a long time is an amazing feeling and I love everything about it. For me, one of the main reasons I like apprenticeships are the hands-on side of things, you know? You're not sat behind a desk all day working, you're actually machining things, making things with your hands so you can go home at the end of the day and say, oh, you know, I did this, I did that, I made this. Um, you get to experience quite an array of uh, different working environments um, as you go around each department, so this can really help you decide where you'd like to go in the future. I love apprenticeships because they teach me the theory side, they teach me the practical side of engineering, as well as allow me to network and learn lots of different stuff from other engineers around me. I'm an ex-apprentice myself and I've been managing, looking after apprentices and trainees for many years. They are our future and here at Oxford Space Systems we make sure that we give them the best opportunity we can and we want them to be the best in the business. Apprenticeships, they're the perfect way to launch your career. As you learn and you earn and you get to put that learning straight into application within your workplace. I'm very proud to say I started my career as an engineering apprentice. I love apprenticeships because they give each apprentice the opportunity to develop the skills that employers need. You can see the confidence of an apprentice develop over time as they learn the skills and behaviours to help them progress. I also love apprenticeships because you can see the value an apprentice brings to a team as their employer guides and trains them to be a skilled and reliable member of the workforce. There is such a breadth of industry in which you can partake in apprenticeship in now. The perfect amalgamation of vocational and academic development, and they are a great gateway in career path for so many people from so many backgrounds, irrespective of your diversity and characteristics. So, for me, that's why I love apprenticeship. The OAS team are incredible. They are the reason that I love my apprenticeship. It's thanks to them that I learned so many things. Currently I've been using the lathes and it's thanks to trainers like Mike that I've been able to make things like this. This is a lightsaber that I made. I've never done anything like this before. Good morning and thank you for spending your World Engineering Day with us. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our youth panel this morning. We've got a great lineup of panellists, right? They're all at different stages of their engineering journeys, right from engineer at apprentice level right through to uh, graduated and first year in the engineering industry. Um, so I think before we kick off, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody that has sent in 
your questions so far for our panel session. Um, we will hopefully get all of them covered. And please, 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 throughout the session, if you have any more questions, please do drop them in the live chat box and hopefully our panel members will do all their best to get them answered for you. Um, but let, I think let's, let's kick off. Let's start with some introductions to our panel members. Okay, so hello, my name is Erin. Um, I'm 21 years old and I did my apprenticeship um, through a company called RS Components. Um, I got a level four qualification in data analytics and I graduated last year um, in April. I'm now in a position where I work full time for RS Components within RS Components. I work for Design Spark um, as a digital development specialist. Hi, I'm Jay Bridges. I work for Mott McDonald as an assistant engineer in rail and track design. Um, I'm also in my last year of an apprenticeship uh, with uh, London Southbank University studying, studying civil engineering. It's, it's been quite a, quite a long, because um, you have to manage your studies with work and also with your social life. So um, it's, it's been interesting compared to, to the graduate route. So uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so lovely to be here. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. My name is Bayer Hamid, but I go by B. I study innovation engineering, which has adopted the slogan of problem solving at every level at the University of Portsmouth. And I'm currently on my placement year at SAP as an innovation lab associate and going on to my last year of study next year. Hi everyone, my name is Slavena Pavlovich and uh, thank you so much for inviting me to the panel. Uh, just like they said, uh, feel free to add me on LinkedIn and uh, we're also here to network. Um, I'm a recent graduate, I graduated uh, from Imperial College London in September 2020. Uh, before that I did my undergrad at UCL Information Management for Business um, and I uh, graduated in 2019. Uh, now. Uh, as, uh, I'm uh, working as a technical product manager at Proximity. Proximity is a startup. Great. It's it's yeah. It's really great to see um, so many of you all at different levels in your um, career and where you're kind of thinking of taking it off to. So I think that's really what we'll be discussing um, today. So um, Jay, obviously you you touched on um, you know it's 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 been a bit of a challenge to balance both studying your social life, working in the workplace. So um, that's obviously taking that route and doing an apprenticeship. I, I, I completely can understand that, I think. But you also get that insight into the industry a lot sooner than a lot of people that like B, who maybe didn't chose to go and Slavian that did a degree and potentially maybe didn't get that insight into the industry as soon as you did. Um, so really, maybe we'll start with what made you, what, what made you, choose the route that you did? Why do you choose to go through an apprenticeship route rather than straight to university? Um, I think straight that, to the workplace? Well, the main reason for me was um, I know that my uh, my work ethic for myself, sort of pushing myself, wasn't exactly where I wanted to be when I was leaving school. So I went into an apprenticeship because I knew the company would help me um, and my development would improve sort of linearly with my um, progression within the company and also while I'm sort of learning and earning at the same time. Um, another big thing for me was the fact that you you have more support. So um, through school, I had a lot of things where you're, um, you, you think about what you're doing, you're like, well, actually, how am I going to use this in real life? Whereas now I'm in the workplace and also studying at the same time, I see where the practical applications of these skills are. And also it gives you, it makes you want to learn more about it because you know you can actually apply it and how it will affect your, your role. Yeah, so um, it's quite similar, but um, I think for me it was, there was a lot of pressure from school that you kind of had to go to university and that's the route that you had to take and um, things like that. And I always knew, um, like even with my A-levels, I did A-levels but felt quite pressured doing A-levels. I probably, if I could go back, would not have done them. But um, I think it just comes from a point where that's kind of like your only option when you, well, especially for me at school, they didn't speak about anything but other than university um but in sense with me i've always been hands-on with things so like i'd much rather learn through doing things rather than learn from being taught things if that makes sense um yeah. but like uh i've been working since i was 14 so for me it was always i just want to get in and work 
agree yeah i think i think that that's that's great and i think apprenticeships are are definitely on the up i think the exposure to them are becoming you know there's there's a lot more exposure to apprenticeships which i think is a really good thing um but equally you know studying at university i did it myself you learn you learn skills that you potentially may you know you may not have learned from not going to university life skills are just as important as the skills that you learn do it throughout your degree as well so b over to you what um what made you choose the university undergraduate route rather um, than another other option? Yeah, so the route is initially was instilled by my parents. Like you should you should follow university pathway. And to be honest, I really like education, so I fell into it and I was happy to do it. But yeah. actually finding the course that I wanted was the the hardest part for me. So innovation engineering was a course that was like no other at any other university and it bridged the gap between one specialism to the other and that's not what drew me to the course it was the continual failure in like my personal statement which actually the lack of authenticity in it trying to find the different engineering pathways was what really damaged like me applying to university at an earlier stage i ventured into hr pathways and stuff like that and um, but I took a step back and my head of sixth form kind of redirected me and told me like, stop building your own ceiling for yourself. And that's mm -hmm. what then um, got me to explore different, um, yeah, the different courses. And I searched and searched for hours, but then this one spoke to my heart. And um, then I began writing what felt like the millionth version of my personal statement, but it was a reflection of myself and my passion. And that's why I picked innovation engineering as a degree course it that that actually takes us quite nicely on to um one of the question that we've just had in now um but before ha before so uh slaviana what what made you choose your progression yeah sure thank you for the question um well essentially like i'm interested in technology and uh, my undergrad was um uh, technology and uh, like lots of modules around it. So like it was partially computer science, partially management and business. And um, by the time I was finishing my undergrad, I wanted to specialize in one particular field in technology. And then I was uh, doing my research, just like B said. Initially, I didn't know what I want to do. I'm interested in data science. I also interested in machine learning, but I also want to specialize in something specific in tech. And I came across like uh, like an accident, more like <laughs> uh, I came across this master's in Imperial and bioinformatics, which is essentially computational biology, um, letting me stay in the tech field, but at the same time diving deep in the field of biology and learning more about what's happening in the world with around this. Um, so it's more like it was a natural progression, uh, but initially I wouldn't have uh, thought that I'm after doing my undergrad, I'm going to do postgrad. Um, the benefits of uh, doing this research, you afterwards studying, what, like basically it matches then your expectations. Uh, if you spend your time of finding the undergrad that you want to do, postgrad that you want to do, afterwards when you're studying these modules, you don't feel like you're pressured by someone, by your family or friends, whoever, like uh, to do this stuff and it's coming from you and uh, afterwards it basically pays off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, like you say that we it's funny actually because we just had that question in is how did you choose was it you know was it just through research how did you choose which how did you know which part of engineering you wanted to go in you know it's such a huge industry you can go into you can specialize in all types of engineering you've got you name it you've got it so i think coming up from you know from college or even you know leaving school your it's I remember it so well you leave school and you're just your eyes are open to all of these different industries all of these different avenues that can possibly go into and it's so overwhelming and like I say in, engineering is one of those it's, it's a huge industry so how did each of you choose exactly what avenue you wanted to go for me um it kind of there was like a few things that I was interested in so I didn't really I think that also comes down to part of why I didn't go to university because I just didn't know what to do but yeah. um because I've always been interested in maths, maths has always been one of my passions and um, I have, I guess you could say I have an eye for the details as well, so like I always love problem solving and um, reading between the lines for things and showing the progressions of things, so when I 
um, seen the, the opportunity to do data analytics as an apprenticeship because um, that also contained a lot of data science and you learn on machine learning as well, which is also super, super interesting. So um, for me, that kind of just fit so many of my boxes that it, it just made sense to at least try it because I mean, I'm still young at the end of the day. So if I did decide I wanted to do something else, there's the options there. But I think it's such a great thing to go into um, straight away because uh, you get to see so much of the business as well um, just through doing data. So I think for me that that was the main main reason why I decided to start with that, really. Yeah. What about you, Jay? Was that was that similar to you or did, did you always know you wanted to work within construction or was it a a researching phase in your in your life that led you to that for me it was a bit different so similar to the fact that I, um as, as a kid i always liked to know how things work so i liked meccano i liked lego i liked connects and things like that and you sort of learn how things work mobility and um when i started to look into engineering i looked at all different professions so electrical mechanical and then I looked at civil and civil sort of encompasses all other uh, engineering disciplines from a design construction background. So I thought that civil engineering will, will um, probably the opposite of what um, Slaviana has done is I wanted to come away from a specialism and see where exactly I wanted to fit in, in terms of engineering and in terms of the business. So um, I've been lucky enough to work in railways. I've worked in bridges. I've worked in foundations and geotechnics. Um, I've also done mechanical and electrical. So I've got quite a, an experienced background in sort of different wow. variations of engineering and then I have chosen where I sort of want to sit for maybe not the remainder of my career but for a big part of it and um, sort of leading into the, the project management side as well. Yeah no that's great and I think that that leads on to you B. I think now you're in your placement year have you had a kind of have you thought actually this this is a new avenue this is something that I'd quite like to explore a little bit further is that is this still now you're on your placement year is this has it given you a change of heart or is it still this still your avenue that you want to stay in so my course has mechanical engineering electrical engineering a bit of business uh design engineering and also um environmental issues exploration within the course so i had the widespread um opportunity to look at different work experiences and different internships um according to each engineering um, area and I really like the electronical engineering side of it the bit where it was coding the bit where I could use MATLAB to kind of destroy the maths and like build a backup I, I just enjoy the coding side of it so I thought okay I'm going to apply to something that uses anything that's VR related machine learning related augmented reality to kind of infiltrate the corporate life and that's why I picked SAP in the innovation labs um, would I like to stay on to it um, I think I would like to switch so I'm currently doing a master's degree in the actual innovation engineering but after this year I'm thinking to switch back to a bachelor's and master in software engineering or computer science to then take that passion forward yeah so do you feel that that's come off the back of your your placement year you, you you know you've learned something from going out into the industry see I think that's where I think that's where it's great I think that exposure early on that exposure to the industry I think can can really shape should help shape your future um and Slaviana I know um you whilst you were studying you um landed a, some some roles within the industry um uh, do you feel that that helped shape your route to um go on to kind of be where you are now within your role uh well like right now i'm working in the field of finance and the two main products are proxy voting and shareholder disclosures which is definitely not something you cover in undergrad or masters yeah. no matter which course you would pick so um in terms of uh, uh why technology uh, originally i'm coming from belarus and uh, i came to the uk only about seven almost seven years ago and in Belarus, there is a very strong um, uh, like focus on IT. Let's let's say let's say it this way: you have uh, programming classes even in school. However, it is in Pascal ABC, so it's nothing that is used in the UK, and no one probably has heard of it uh, here. Uh, so I learned uh, Java initially on my own in Belarus because I was doing my research and figuring out what is there in the industry. So back th back th back then, I thought uh, Java is the way forward and. Um, when I came to the UK, 
I was learning Python on my own. And uh, the reason really why why tech is because I saw I can make an impact. Uh, at that point, I didn't know like in which field it's going to be, where exactly I wanted to be in tech because I know that it doesn't matter where I'm coming from, like what my gender is or like uh, anything about me, I can do code and uh, it can make an impact. And this is like what mattered to me the most. And uh, that really like to get started, all you need just computer and uh, passion and just a bit of curiosity, finding out how to solve the problems. Uh, and this is something that you get uh, with technology. It's um, you get lots of problems. You can't find an exact solution on the internet. You may find some tools that can help you, some modules that can make your life easier. But after all, it's coming down to your logic and if you can solve the problem. Uh, during my undergrad, uh, I was uh, there were still modules in Java. They still are. It's a foundation of uh, computer science of object oriented programming. But I was still doing my own projects and I focused my dissertation on Python. It's not something that was taught in my course and uh, this was uh, this like learning python was the best thing that i did in my tech career i'm still learning i'm not an expert in any way and probably will never be uh, it's a continuous learning which is very important and uh, it's helping me now in my career i'm working in finance and as i said it has nothing to do with my undergrad or masters but it is about the technology uh, there like even though my role uh, the title is technical product manager i'm implementing um technical solutions myself. I'm not just uh, managing existing products. Uh, so these solutions, uh, they have been uh, written in Python and uh, they're saving uh, time and uh, lots of resources for the company, which is great. Uh, so both sides are happy. I'm solving like this, like interesting problems and the company is getting very quick solutions to their problems. Great. Yeah. I mean, you, you touched upon there, you know, you've done some, you've gone out of your way to teach yourself Python, you've gone out of your way to kind of build your, build these skills, uh, you know, on the side of studying. So um, that actually, that touches on the question that we've had in. You, um, what sort of, in your opinion, you kind of, what, what extra support have you given yourself? And what extra curricular type of, if you have done any extra kind of skills that you've built alongside your degree to kind of help you path your way your way within um this industry you know um erin i know you were mentioning obviously when you were looking for apprenticeships obviously a lot of it goes down to kind of just researching looking did you did you attend any kind of events like this so you know these types of events are great but, you know you guys being on the panel discussing your different routes are just it, it's vital for people that are at that point in their lives where they're not sure what route they want to take they're not sure they're interested in engineering but they're not sure how much they want to pursue it if they want to you know dive into a three-year undergrad even a master's or they want to do what jay and erin have done and gone through to an apprenticeship level did you guys do anything you know extra curricular did you attend any kind of job fairs did you have a work experience to do a day on on site or did you do anything extracurricular that kind of helped you think yes absolutely that's helped me i didn't actually but um knowing how much that it would have helped i now try and push as much of my time into sort of STEM events to encourage people into science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or um, careers fairs, um, panel discussions like this one. And I try and sort of show that the apprenticeship is a is a viable route into the industry and arguably as good as a, a graduate route. Um, obviously, everyone's experiences will be different. So, um, and the the route that you choose might not be applicable and an apprenticeship so data sciences might not be as easy to get into as construction or so um it is something you have to weigh up and going to sort of career fairs and stuff would benefit but uh, i didn't attend any but now i try and push as much as my time to um, attend them from the other side so that people will get the benefit that i didn't have I first want to thank campus media because after venturing into the women in engineering event I got to meet um, Melissa, who is like the head of uh, Tech Woman, and she reached out to me and tried to, and we uh, now volunteer at child, uh, at schools who don't who don't get exposed to where the children don't get exposed to STEM subjects. So then we pushed the idea of you know STEM and how you could go into it, whether that's through an apprenticeship or whether that's through university, and just exposing them to science, technology, engineering, and maths and uh, I don't. I wouldn't have had that networking opportunity without attending that Women in Engineering event that you guys have led. 
Um, I've also done a bit of work experience with my sixth form prior to joining, prior to applying to university, which helped me then narrow down what engineering I wanted to because I had the opportunity to, to, to do a week's worth of civil engineering. And that didn't speak that, um, that much into my heart. But then talking to um, those type of events like uh, work, the, what are they called? The work center events? I don't know. Where you could talk to all the different companies and just, yeah, yeah. just the idea just gets you thinking about where could I see myself? Where does my personality fit into? And how could that, that then build my confidence into applying to that kind of subject? Great, yeah. What about you, Slavia? And I know you 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 worked um, Microsoft whilst studying. Um, do you feel that that helped shape your yourself in kind of your post grad or your role you're, that you're in now? Do you feel that that helped benefit you or carve carve your way, shall we say? Yes, so I was a Microsoft student partner later for Microsoft during my time at university. However, like all these like things with networking and the uh, companies have started to, uh, started to prior to that. And uh, when I was in Cardiff System College, for example, I was very interested in 3D printing technology and I wanted to find out more. And then at that time, uh, I tried to find in Cardiff where there is a 3D printer and I couldn't find any. So <laughs> instead, uh, like at that point of time, I decided to do a bit of more research. Uh, in my free time, of course, like all of us, like we're occupied, uh, but then if you're passionate about something, you will find time, you will find resources to do this. Otherwise, there will be lots of excuses. In my case, I was really interested in 3D printing, still am. And uh, what I did instead, I was uh, doing notes and uh, like sort of research about the technology. Afterwards, uh, or like in uh, June or July, um, 3D, uh, like basically a scientific journal, uh, academic journal approached me and uh, is because there's some more publications on some public forums and I got a publication out of this. So lots of the things and opportunities you can create, they yeah. don't uh, really need to be coming from something like, or someone, like it's not about spoon feeding. And I believe the best things that you can do in your life are probably done like by yourself or like with the help, like a network. However, like in my situation, like I'm just trying to show an example that you don't need to have all this tech and all these resources to get on going uh, to learn something. Um, during my time uh, at uh, Sixth Form, I also wanted to learn more about the UK politics. So I had no exposure to that before at all. Came from Belarus, knew nothing about it. And um, two months I was after in the UK, I was already volunteering at the National Assembly for Wales and I was political researcher writing speeches for a politician and uh, doing more research about that. So it doesn't really uh, need to be uh, like something like specific opportunity created. You can always contact contact uh, individuals on LinkedIn, um, approaching the company. They all have all email addresses. And the same goes even to proximity. Even though like a current company doesn't advertise some like entry level positions, they have email address at careers and you can send an email and uh, with your CV and uh, you will get considered. Um, you will hopefully like get reply and uh, everything will be fine. And the same way during my time at university, the number of times I was uh, trying to approach the company's network. Yeah, of course, there were yeah. uh, countless number of career fairs and events as such, and they were super useful. And then you, what you're trying to do is to build up the connection, even with the speakers. Like, so for example, after like watching this event, like why don't you send a LinkedIn request and um, check how to build your LinkedIn network and uh, investigate this because afterwards it will pay off. Let's say like, in future you want to hypothetically to work for the company a and they have let's say a referral system you will afterwards ask this person could you please write an internal reference for me yeah. so i will get a quicker consideration or like this application will go straight to the recruiter so there are lots of benefits of doing this and i know um it it does it doesn't uh, like hurt doing this you just need to step out from your comfort zone and start doing this and not being scared approaching people online that you have never met before or like the yeah. companies that you have never met before in real life. It's fine. Um, you can find these opportunities and create them yourself. That you, yeah, I think Slavian, you're completely, you're completely right there. I think uh, going back to what I said earlier, you know, in terms of apprenticeship, I think if I could go back again and uh, there was more exposure to apprenticeships, oh my God, I'd a hundred percent, you know, I would, I would definitely, definitely, definitely try an apprenticeship. But, you know, as much as I say, there's not much exposure. It's also exposing yourself to those opportunities. Like you say, you know, putting yourself out there and be like you said earlier, um, 
Melissa Ahmed, who um, if you guys are all tuning into this event, you will have seen um, that Melissa does discuss her STEM ambassador programme and her email is always open. So, you know, shooting Melissa an email to say you're interested in becoming a STEM ambassador, look where it's landed be, you know, it's, it's, it's experience that she, she's got now to build her portfolio in, within the industry. So it's finding those little ins, you know, saying that's actually something I'm interested in. So yeah, and capitalising on that. Um, that, I think that that kind of it, yeah transitions on to the next one. This is always this next question that we've just had in is is always a, a funny one because we're at such like I said with you guys you're all at different stages and some people are at such pivotal stages where something some something could happen it'd be a huge change or you know you're at a, a, a point now where you're just flying in your industry in your career. So uh, the next question is if you could go back or you could make any changes. Um, at the beginning of when you started your journey within engineering or tech, uh, what you know, if you could make any changes, what changes would you make? Um, so not in terms of doing the apprenticeship. Um, it, or if anything, I would have started it sooner, to be honest. But um, mm. I think when I'd first started my apprenticeship, I think if, if there was one thing I could go back and change would be learning Python sooner, because or any form of coding sooner than I have because uh, especially in the field that I work in, it's super, super relevant and super important. And it's quite thought after at the moment as well, um, having that skill. Oh, so yeah. um, I definitely would have learned that a lot sooner than I did. So that would probably be the yeah. only thing that I would go back and change if not having just started it sooner. What about you, Jay? Are there any changes that you you feel that you would have made if you could? Oh, you no, still can, it's not too late, is it? No, I don't think I would. Um, I, d I did apply to uni. I went through the UCAS system um i got offers and uh i decided that i didn't think uni was for me so um maybe not such maybe not a change but maybe just a piece of advice would be to explore both options because you're not you're not tied down to anything at that point you you've got nothing to lose if you find a role in a company as an apprenticeship that would suit you more than the university you applied for which is what i did um it's not a problem you're you're not stuck to one or the other at that point so just look at both and don't restrict your your view on yeah. it immediately completely agree with that completely and it, it goes down to pressures as well you know not, don't don't fall under the pressures of all of my friends are going to university so that's naturally that's the next step that i need to take it's 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 that's i think that's also a big one but at that age you know when you're first leaving school it's it, it's definitely changing now there are more events like this and there's more exposure to to get yourself into the field and see how big it is but and kind of a bit more direction I think when I left there wasn't really that so uh, it's definitely changing which is good what about you B have you got any I mean it sounds like they like said earlier it sounds like you're semi sort of making that change now but um is there any other changes that you feel you would have made yeah actually after my first year I wish I wish I would have explored summer placements during my first year so that I could then try an engineering firm during the summer before the next, before second year, which I think would have been such a, an amazing, like eye-opening experience and would have given me more um, of a segue between the tech that I'm doing now and what my course was originally designed for. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the, the beauty of placement years. You just put it to practice and you can see exactly how it's, how you, how you do it in industry. What about you, Slaviana? Uh, what I would have done differently, I would have uh, probably created my LinkedIn account quicker. I created it when I was in my second, uh, in A2, uh, second year of A-levels. And I think if I have, if, if I did this in my, uh, like basically AS first uh, year, it would have benefited me a lot. So I could add uh, like more speakers that I attend, like all this, like um, expanded my network from the start. And um, even though I created it quite early, it may seem like relatively, I feel I could have done it uh, much quicker. Um, another thing is um, there are um, careers, uh, career teams uh, throughout universities in the UK. Um, and uh, it's something that uh, I, I think it's a great free resource. I mean, like you're paying for your tuition fees. It's something that you should uh, use. Uh, and um, a lot of jobs uh, sometimes get posted specifically on university career boards and they're not getting publicly posted like on LinkedIn or other job boards that you may know of. Mm. So it's something like to take advantage of and uh, really getting in touch with the career team, trying to find out um, and getting even advice, like what do you think about my personal statement? And of course, with the things like personal statements, cover letters, you will show it to 10 people, you will get 10 different opinions. After all, it's up to you to decide 
what is actually that should be going there that shows who you are. But it's yeah. very nice to get advice. Like if there is advice there for you, why not use it? That's exactly that. I think you, you've, you've answered some great pieces of advice there. So um, for, for our audience to take away there, that, that actually answers our last question, which is if you guys have any advice to people that are at a point, you know, that any stage, you know, some a student, we've got school leavers watching who are having an interest in engineering that potentially don't know which route they want to go down. Uh, we have current students that are on their undergrad. Um, any piece of advice that you guys, Laviana, yours were absolutely great. And I advise anybody watching um, to definitely watch this back because there's been some absolute great pieces of advice here that you guys can definitely take away from this. Um, and also on just touching on that in terms of advice and you know excelling your skills we have got soft skills workshop um later on today as well uh, so i definitely tune into that because don't ever this is my piece of advice i'll start us off uh, don't ever feel like your skills you know don't don't forget about the skills that are beyond just what you've learned at university you know you can pick up skills anywhere you know if you've worked in your part-time job when you were 16 was working in Tesco's or you worked in a clothes shop and I, you know that was my first job I worked in a clothes shop and I take those skills with me everywhere I go that built my confidence that built absolutely everything from when I was a school leader so you know those soft skills are really really important and um, that there, there's much more to you in your application beyond just your academic and what you've learned at school uh, so we have got a workshop on that later um, but yes has anybody got any any advice for anybody watching now that um is is kind of at a point where they're thinking do i don't i where do i go well i'll say do it like don't be your own ceiling shout at the top of the rooftops and be confident in your abilities as lindsay said and like don't limit yourself to a job description because sometimes they put the hardest description in there and um you tend to be like oh i don't match all these points no apply anyway do it like search through universities, th search through apprenticeships and find what matches your personality and do it. Never say don't do it. Apply always. <laughs> Love it. Do it. Yes. What about uh, you, Jay? Have you got any pieces of advice? I think it would be to just to have a look around all different types of engineering because I'm going to be honest, I didn't know anything about the, the engineering that the, the other sort of panellists have spoke about today. So um, that, that's probably myself not doing enough uh, exploration into what else that there is out there and if you do think engineering is for you you really need to have a look and see what type of engineering because it is such a, a broad subject um and yeah just have a have a study about what different types of engine there are and just try and figure out where you think you'd want to fit in in that sort of big spectrum of roles responsibilities and uh, types of jobs that you can get from from that industry and um, what about you erin you got any words of advice for anybody that's thinking of getting into the industry? Um, so I think the main thing I would say is just don't let anyone else make your decisions for you. Like you do, you need to understand what you want and what works best for you, not what social situations put you in or what your teachers tell your, your parents or your friends. You just need to make sure that you know what you, you need for yourself because at the end of the day, it's your life. It's no one else's life. So... Um, if you know that you're going to work better being stuck in the situation than um, attending school again, essentially, then that's what you need to do. But vice versa, if you know that you need to get in there and you need to learn through that, then that's what's going to be better for you. So I think the only thing I can say really would be just know yourself before you need to make the big decisions. Great. I think that's, yeah, that's perfect. I think I'm walking away from this feeling inspired and motivated. So I hope everybody at home is. Um, but I think that's it at the end of our panel session now. So um, if anybody has any questions for any of our panellists, um, as I mentioned earlier, that we will do all we can to get them answered on the live on the live chat so please 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 do answer ask any on there like Bea and Slaviana said if you'd like to learn any more about any of the industries that they are in please do add them on LinkedIn um, and have a chat and I guess all I've got to say is just yeah good luck with um your journey that you're going to do but thank you so much guys I think um you've been you've been great on the panel and I think people are going to be walking away from this feeling really inspired and hopefully more open-minded
that was a brilliant panel. Uh, thank you so much, Lindsay, and the, our panelists uh, for sharing everything. Um, and it was really refreshing to hear, actually, that not all of you had it all planned out and knew what area you wanted to go into. And Jay, thank you for being so open about not really knowing all the different uh, areas of engineering you could have gone into to do an apprenticeship as well. Uh, we have got Mott McDonald in the chat room offering careers advice. Um, so for those of you that have got any questions about apprenticeships or graduate opportunities with Mott McDonald, you can pop that in the chat to be answered as well. We're really sorry if we didn't get round to answering all of your questions. We had so many come in before the event to get through as well. So please pop them in the chat if you haven't done already. Our panel members are going to be joining us in the chat room um, to answer any extra questions on there as well. I just want to say thank you to Melissa Ahmed um, for opening the event for us and also brilliant um, to hear that B had managed to also become a STEM ambassador with Melissa on hearing about her opportunity uh, at one of our Women in Engineering events that we do in the autumn. So it's really great to see that you're, you're building on your this opportunity, B, and gaining valuable work experience from the opportunity with Tech Woman. So uh, we're going to pop in the, the chat box uh, how to get in touch with Melissa at Tech Woman if you're interested in finding out more about her STEM ambassador program. I know they've got a, 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 an ambitious schedule of activity days coming up in schools from Easter. And so she will be looking for more people to get involved and find out how to be a STEM ambassador there as well. Um, so what have we got coming up next? We um, the Institute of Engineering and Technology every year run an amazing award uh, called the Young Engineer of the Year Award. Funnily enough, it's taking place tonight. It starts at seven o'clock um, and you can register to find out more about it. Um, but it's a phenomenal event. I go every year. It's a shame we're not doing it in person this year, but I'll be there at seven o'clock online watching who's going to be crowned this year's Young Woman Engineer. Um, the lineup of these incredible women is just awe-inspiring how they are going to pick a, win a winner from this. I have no idea. Um, but what we want to do now is just show um, an introduction really to who these women are, what they're currently doing in their role and why they have been selected um, as a runner-up or uh, one of the finalists to be Young Women of the Year. So um, in a minute, we're, we're going to start rolling that BT. And welcome to this special Young Women Engineer of the Year programme, new to 2020. I'm Danielle George, President of the Institution of Engineering and Technology, and I'm so excited to be part of this programme, shining a light on this year's YWE finalists and the outstanding work they're doing up and down the country to engineer a better world for us all. The IET's Young Women Engineer of the Year Awards have been celebrating women working in modern engineering for more than 40 years and aim to help change the perception that engineering is predominantly a career for men by banishing outdated engineering stereotypes of hard hats and greasy pipes. The awards continue to raise awareness of what engineers do by honouring the very best early career female engineers working in the UK today. 
Generally, people aren't aware of the incredible breadth of engineering in the 21st century. Today, engineering covers everything from designing our future cities and transport to coming up with new healthcare technologies. Engineering and technology are improving our world and shaping our future, touching every part of our lives and recognising and showcasing the outstanding female engineers has never been so important. As well as highlighting female engineering talent, the IET Young Women Engineer of the Year Awards seeks to find role models who can help address the UK science and engineering skills crisis by promoting engineering careers to more girls and women. Even though one in five people work in the engineering profession, the UK still faces a nationwide skill shortage. What's even more surprising is that just 12% of those working in engineering are women, highlighting that there is plenty more to be done to promote equality, diversity and inclusion in STEM fields. I can't wait for you to meet this year's finalists. From supercars and submarines to healthcare and keeping people safe, these young women are doing incredible things every single day to improve our world. Ahead of the ceremony on the 4th of March, this programme gives us the chance to get to know this year's finalists and to find out what inspires them and why they chose engineering in the first place. And we'll end with a live Q&A session so you can ask the finalists any questions you might like to ask. But first, here's a sneak peek into what our Young Woman Engineer of the Year Awards are all about. We're thrilled that you're able to join us here this evening to come together and witness some of the truly talented and inspirational young female engineers. If we have the skills and enthusiasm, then you can succeed, no matter who you are. So thank you so much for, for coming on this evening and good luck to all the finalists. I have no doubt that your stories will inspire many, many young girls to take a closer look at the remarkable things they could achieve as an engineer. This was an amazing event, much fun. It's been just leading up to this and all the IT TV work that we've done. It's been awesome, so thank you guys so much. Capture the imagination of young girls everywhere, change the world. Wow, as you can see, they really are such inspiring awards and each year YWE just gets bigger and better. This year we received more than 135 applications for the awards, so the YWE team and the judges had some really difficult decisions to make to narrow it down to just our final six. This year, YWE is sponsored by some incredible companies and you will get the chance to meet them at the ceremony in March. So let's get started. Our first finalist this year is an electronic engineer at LV. She engineers smart tech that improves the lives of cis women and trans men whilst breaking down barriers and smashing taboos. Meet Shrook. It took more than 160 years to realise that people who breastfeed do not want to be treated like dairy cows. At LV, as an electronic engineer, I get to work on really cool tech like smart, silent, wearable breast pumps. And other cool tech like smart pelvic floor trainers solving problems like incontinence, something that happens to around 80% of people who give birth, but it's such a taboo, people don't talk about it, that people who experience it don't know that it's something that could happen to them until it does. Didn't really realise that a place like this exists in engineering, somewhere that really aligns with my values and somewhere where I feel like I can be completely, totally and unapologetically me. I love that I get to transform people's lives for a living. Being an engineer is my superpower. It's great to meet you, Shrug. I love it that your work improves the lives of so many people and there must be so many great things to love about your job. But what do you love most about it? 
Um, I love that I get to transform people's lives for a living. That's probably what I love the most about my job, but I just love kind of the sheer amount of engineering that I get to do. And um, for the past six months, I feel like I've done more engineering than I've done probably in the past three years combined. And I've never really kind of given an exact design brief. I'm just given a problem and asked to go and solve it. And I love that. I really love that. But what I also love about being an engineer generally is that I feel I can do whatever I want. Um, I built a machine that can detect cancer based on electron quantum spin. I built a car and raced it. I've made robots for a living. And right now I'm working on an emergency ventilator for coronavirus patients. Um, and I just feel like being an engineer is my superpower. Oh, that's so good. Is that why you chose engineering then? Just because because you love solving problems, you love not knowing how to do that and the challenge of how, how to actually solve that problem? I didn't really know it was called engineering. So when I became when I became interested in engineering, I just thought it was magic. I remember like watching my TV and realizing that the people on it are not actually real people living inside it. And back then, those TVs were huge, like they could have been small people living inside it, right? Um, and just realizing that this is a machine built by people like me was just mind blowing. And I was like, wait, does that mean I can do the same? Can I do the same magic? And honestly, I feel like if it was introduced to me as engineering, I might have not ever been interested in it because there's this very specific idea of what an engineer is that maybe people talk about, which is not true at all yeah and i mean that's what we're trying to do across the iet but certainly this year in our 150th anniversary year is sort of smash those stereotypes you are absolutely the engineer um that that we need to see and we're celebrating like difference makers like you from from all over the world as well um which is really exciting and i'm, I'm super honored to be to be president while, whilst we're doing this as well is there a difference maker out there that inspired you to get into engineering somebody who really had an effect on me when I was younger was my science teacher um, in primary school and she told me a real scientist always asks why. Why are these people on my TV? Why can I breathe? Why, why is there a voice at the other line of the telephone? How does this all work? And I think that for me just made me really curious and really wanting to understand how everything works on a really, really kind of um, basic level, so like the lowest level possible. And I'm like, okay, but how does the transistor work? And how does it make all of these gates, which makes all of this kind of software work together, you know? Um, and somebody who inspires me still today, um, I think would be Yuande Akinola. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great so, maker, yeah. She's incredible. Um, I remember finding out about Yuande Akinola um, a few years ago and realizing that you know she's a principal engineer she is mbe and she's kind of presented all of these engineering programs on on discovery channel on channel four and, and she's creative she's a dancer like me and just to see that somebody as a role model is just incredible and it's that creativity as well because i feel like we're missing out on so much creativity in engineering and i really just wonder what the world would have looked like if we told these creative people that engineering is for them too. What kind of amazing inventions would we have had by now? And that's such an important message, isn't it? Creativity is very much a part of, of engineering and that, that sort of mindset, isn't it? You know, we have, we want to be problem solvers, we build up resilience and we're definitely creative as well. Is it, do you think it's important that we have role models for, for young people? Absolutely, I feel, hmm. Like growing up, I felt like I didn't really have a role model that represented me enough as a child that I could look up to and be like, yes, this is the person I want to be when I'm older. So I felt like I had to be my own role model. You are such a difference maker. And I love talking to you, Shrug. Absolutely inspiring. And uh, congratulations um, and very best of luck as well. Thank you. Our next finalist this year is a Royal Academy of Engineering Research Fellow at the James Watt School of Engineering at the University of Glasgow. 
She leads a research group focusing on rapid and cost-effective systems to improve environmental and medical diagnostics. And her work crosses the engineering, science, clinical and social science disciplines to help achieve a healthier world. Meet Melanie. When you're making art for someone, it is a whole creative process. Thinking about what the person might like, the tools you might need to the actual doing part. Engineering is the same process. It is all about creating to make people's life better. In my case, it starts with a challenge. For example, the clinician asking if we could create something to better diagnose a disease. As an engineer, you have access to a whole set of tools and knowledge to tap your inspiration from. You start connecting the dots in a way no one imagined before. And this process is noted by your own curiosity, engaging with people, working in lots of different fields and all together, keeping an open mind on what can be created. And trust me, that curiosity can take you very far. I'm now working on some of the biggest medical challenges and I haven't studied biology at school since I was 17. That's the beauty of engineering. Hi Melanie, it is great to meet you. I think it's fantastic that you've been able to incorporate your love of art and design in your engineering job as well. Uh, what do you love most about your job? So what I love the most about my job is really the fact that it keeps challenging me, you know. It's having the opportunity to work on different medical challenges, but it's also the fact that the environment is very dynamic. So for each challenge, I will gain new knowledge and I will also work with new people. So I work with clinicians, but I also work with designers. I work with teachers. So it changes for every project. So that's really what keeps it, you know, very interesting for me. Is that why you chose engineering as a, as a career path then? That sort of challenge mentality? Um, so it was the challenge mentality, but it was also the fact that I saw engineering as that science at the interface of other sciences, if you want. And because I like very different fields of engineering, I thought that that would work quite well for me. And just to give an example with my, you know, process engineering degree, I had the opportunity to work in very, you know, different fields from renewable energies to water treatment and now medical sciences. So yeah, we definitely do it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> well, um, as you know, the IT, we're celebrating our 150th uh, anniversary year. So it's a really special year, I think. Um, and, and we're celebrating difference makers and you are an amazing difference maker. Um, and we're celebrating them from all over the world as well. Um, is there a difference maker out there that inspired you either when you were younger or inspires you now? It has to be my mom. And I'm not just saying that because she's watching. <laughs> and, but she's not working in a STEM subject. But um, I grew up in an environment where I was given the freedom to explore what I wanted to be, you know, without judgment or what I could or could not do. And with a lot of support. And, you know, I think parents are key influencers when it comes to what a child is going to consider for a career. So that made such a massive difference for me. So, yeah. Thank you very much, mom. <laughs> that is lovely. Yeah. And, you know, part of what we want to do um, generally in the IET, but definitely in, in our 150th year is, is um, inspire that next generation and make sure we've got some amazing um, engineers working on the, the amazing challenges that we've got um, throughout the world as well. Uh, what would you say to someone who is maybe thinking about um, starting a, a career in STEM? So what I would say is that from my own experience, a career in STEM is extremely fulfilling because it is about better understanding the world that we live in, but also how to act on it. And my advice would be to try to gain, you know, as many experiences as possible with people working in STEM, because it's not only about the job description, it's also about the environment that is going to work for us. And, you know, it might take a couple of tests before we figure out what works for us and that's absolutely fine. So the sooner we can start that exploration work, the better I would say. How would you describe engineering to, to maybe someone in primary school? 
So I would say that engineering is about using science and technologies to solve challenges to make people's life better, really. And we are surrounded by engineering, you know, even if we don't realize it, it's from bridges to makeup, it's, it's everywhere. <laughs> How important is it, do you think, that um, as engineers, we do go out and, and help inspire the next generation so, so we do get the, the children who see the spark? It is essential. So diversity is just, you know, so important for the survival of the field. You know, we see diversity everywhere in nature, right? <laughs> well, we need the same thing for engineering. That's what makes it work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the brain is really good at making associations between worlds. And we know that, you know, worlds related to science can tend to be more associated with, for example, male figures. So if we want to work on those unconscious biases, there is no other choice. We need to increase visibility. Good. And it shouldn't just be like a byproduct, should it? Or something we do if we've got a bit of time. It should be no. absolutely part of our role, I think. It should be embedded, yeah. It's the role of everyone because we, you never know what kind of impact even unconsciously that can have on, on someone, just the fact that they saw you. So absolutely. Yeah, great. Well, it's lovely talking to you, Melanie. Um, you are without a doubt an amazing difference maker. Um, best of luck, uh, huge congratulations um, for, for becoming a finalist and best of luck to you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Our next finalist is a project engineer at Transport for London. Working in the major projects directorate, she currently manages work on the Elephant and Castle station capacity upgrade project. Meet Neera. Having been born and raised in London, TFL has been a massive part of mine and my family's lives. The buses helped me to get to school every morning, the trains helped me visit my parents on the weekends when I was at university, and the entire network now helps me connect with old friends who live on the other side of the city. I'm now working for the oldest metro system in the world where I get to positively impact my friends and family's journeys in and around London. The transport network is the beating heart of the city and I am proud to help keep London moving. I'm now volunteering at girls' schools across East London, where I'm paying it forward and trying to encourage as many girls as possible into the engineering world. I'm trying to break down the stereotypes to show them that women can design buildings, women can code, women can be leaders, and most importantly, women can be engineers. Hi, Neera. It is great to meet you. Uh, you must be so busy managing the Elephant and Castle upgrade project. And, uh, and there must be so many great things to love about your job. But, but what is the one thing you love the most? So working for TFL, I think naturally working for something that impacts the city is like really the exciting part of it. But for me, it's the fact that every day I learn something new because um, so working on Elephant and Castle, for example, it's a multidisciplinary project and my background's predominantly mechanical. So I've got to learn about so many different things and every day I'm Googling or you know, trying to go through my old lecture, lecture notes to find out stuff. And um, so it's really like that's the most exciting part. The fact that one day I might be doing something to do with, you know, heavy civils like pipe jacking, which I've never even done before. And another day I'm looking at, you know, human factors aspects on how the station's going to operate and stuff. So I think for me, it's just the fact that no day is the same and everything's so different and I'm learning so much constantly, but also the fact that I'm actually impacting the city at the same time by doing all this. So it's really cool. Yeah, it sounds very cool. And as a university lecturer, I'm very glad that you uh, look at your <laughs> notes as well. That's very good. <laughs> um, what, made you, what made you get into engineering in the first place? Um, so I always say it's kind of like a really unconventional way I got into engineering because I, when I was growing up, I was in a predominantly female household and my dad probably didn't even know what engineering was properly, I guess, and I don't have any family in it. So it was really kind of, I came to it by chance, by literally just Googling. And when I was in college, basically, I had to fill out my UCAS application. And I literally, I think I went through about 30 different things to, that were involved with like 
art and maths and you know all these random things and I came across mechanical engineering and um, I took my dad to the open days at university and he was just like what the hell is, is this really what you want to do because he didn't he'd never heard me say that I wanted to do it um, but it was really just through reading and researching um, and the internet basically that I found out what mechanical engineering was and what it meant to do it in industry after my degree and um, it sounded like something I would like so I took the gamble and just went and studied it at university and like I'm so lucky that it's it, it's almost like the perfect fit for me but I just didn't really know it until a lot later down in my like educational life. What is it about engineering that that attracts that sort of challenge mentality do you think? So I think the thing that always made me kind of feel it was really interesting is the fact that you're solving problems, number one, but also the way you solve those problems can be so varied. And I actually really believe it's a, a creative role because you have to think of different ways to do things. And if something's been, so for working at TFL, things have been done the same way for hundreds of years. And sometimes, you know, they don't work or things need to change because we've got new technology. So it's kind of like thinking out of the box, like how can you do something a little bit more different or, you know, how can you, yeah, like slightly put your twist on it. And that's why I kind of love it because it's really technical and geeky and, you know, maths and physics orientated, but then it's really like cool and creative and, you know, you get to, try out new like processes and come up with all these wacky like workshop ideas and stuff so it's like for me the best of both worlds I think. You're making a difference I mean and that's what engineers do don't they you and you are you will be an amazing role model for for so many young people as well which I think is lovely. Yeah it's great and you know I kind of always think back like who are the people that have when I look at watch tv or you know do my research on the internet all these people that I've looked at and thought oh my god that's amazing wow you know I'd want to do what they're doing and it's quite a nice thought to think although I'm really early on in my career if I can even just do that for one young person in a school if I want to do STEM events or in the future like that's just it's gone it's on a full 360 so it's really it's like a nice idea. Well as, as you know at the IET you know we, we celebrate difference makers uh, all the time but especially in our 150th anniversary year as well we get it to sort of shine a light on on difference makers all over the world. Um, um, was there a um, sort of one specific difference maker that inspired you when you've been growing up? So I think um, because I didn't really know about the whole engineering world, I think I've more had, um, so Roma Agrawal, she's a structural engineer, but she's more been the difference maker for me for since I've like been in industry so I think during my university and college days I was a bit all over the place didn't really you know know anything or didn't have a plan but since I've um kind of been in the industry I've been opened up to like so many different amazing men and women in the engineering industry and Roma for me is such a great role model because it's easy to kind of look at someone that looks similar to you and think I can do what you're doing and you know the great thing about I think Roma is She's not just an engineer, so she's a fantastic engineer and she's, you know, worked on the Shard, which is so cool. But she's also been in, you know, an M&S lady, leading ladies adverts and she's done TEDx talks and she's written a book. And so for me, she is like the, you know, 21st century modern female engineer. And it is like just so great to see it. And she literally, everything new she does, I'm there for it. And, you know, that, that's kind of the thing that I think is amazing about her. Yeah, and she's a mother as well, which, you know, she's yeah. got her parenthood in there as well. She's got it all going on, hasn't she? And what would you say then if you were having that conversation with um, with a younger person who was maybe thinking about going into STEM? I would say 100% go for it because if someone like me who didn't even know probably what an engineer really was um, until I basically applied for a course at university can do it and I'm really enjoying it, if you're even just thinking about it, you 100% enjoy it. And it's so varied, like you can't, you know, it, you could be doing anything. Like if you love marine engineering, medical engineering, railways, it's so varied that I definitely believe there is an engineering job out there for every single person that wants to do it. And that's the great thing about it. Thank you so much, Neera. Um, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. I wish we could talk more. Um, uh, <laughs> so much on um, on becoming a finalist of, of YWE. You should be super proud of yourself. You're, you're a massive difference maker. Um, so thank you very much and good luck. Thank you so much. It was lovely speaking with you. Our next finalist is a materials engineer for luxury British supercar maker McLaren Automotive. She's responsible for all the material investigations in the business across development phases of the company's supercars, from concept drawings 
all the way to customers in the field. Meet Ella. I consider myself to be a hybrid scientist, engineer, someone who creates a solution for application, but also presents it in the best possible way. It's a common misconception that engineers are not creative, they're numbers people, they don't have an impact on product design, when actually this is the furthest thing from it. This attention to detail is what inspires me. My day-to-day -day involves me analysing things on a microscopic level. It's making those small changes that allow us to make something so elegant and beautiful. When we bring those small changes, that is where we're able to make something harness extreme performance. And it's this making a difference that I deem as engineering. It's more than just function. It's tailoring the laws of physics to aesthetics, beauty and style. Okay, it's great to meet you, Ella. What an exciting job you have on uh, McLaren's incredible supercars. Uh, there must be so many things to, to love about that. What do you love most about your job? Oh, it's such a tricky question. Um, I absolutely adore my job. And I think it's very easy for engineers to say that they love fixing things or coming up with solutions. It's quite a, a cliche thing for a scientist or an engineer to say, but of course I absolutely adore that aspect of my job. But for me, I think it's got to be the performance element of it. So yes, I adore coming up with solutions, but it, the thing that gets me absolutely excited is coming up with a solution that can shave off two kilos off of already the world's lightest supercar and I think for me that's what makes it so exciting. We also have um, fantastic opportunities of getting cars around tracks and if I have that opportunity to contribute towards the world's fastest lap around the Top Gear test track for example or being able to contribute to something a bit bigger than just a function and solving a problem is just it's so awesome. <laughs> During our uh, 150th anniversary year, we're, we're celebrating Difference Makers um, and, you know, trying to shine a light on Difference Makers from, from across the world as well, which is brilliant and you know, super exciting. Um, is there a Difference Maker that really inspired you, either in your job now or maybe when you were growing up? It's a good question. And it's something that I think when I do these STEM talks and I go to schools, like a lot of students do pick up on the sense that who was your role model who would you look towards in in your industry and things there and one of the main difference makers that i loved and was a big key to me going to manchester was alan turing mm. so i absolutely of course what he did for modern day technology the way he's advanced computers and everything that we have electronic wise um that he's done today is incredible but i think also his personal story um, battling with what his beliefs were and, and what his journey was, but still completed what he loved. And that's such an important thing for me. And I think girls getting into science, girls getting into engineering, we do come across a particular sort of kink in our journey that would make us think, oh, am I suited to this? Or there aren't many people out there who are relatable to me, for example. Um, it, should I still follow this passion? And he did it anyway, and he just did something amazing. And uh, I think he is an underappreciated hero. So I absolutely applaud him. Yeah. Do you think it's important that the sort of next generation does see people who are relatable to them? Absolutely. And I think we should continue all that incredibly important work of getting people to highlight those positions. I've been fortunate in the sense that I have been involved with like Harper Collins fictional novels and rewriting stories about getting girls um, in dressing up boxes and going on a magical adventure into, into what it's like to be an engineer. And absolutely, we should highlight and showcase that. But I do think we should also broadcast the fact that it doesn't matter if you want to be um, an engineer on an offshore oil rig and you don't see many girls doing that because you've got to aim for it anyway. If that's your passion, you should do it. And I, I think we've got to be careful in the sense that um, 
we shouldn't wait for a relatable figure to come and occupy that before we uh, before we aspire to do it. So that's what I what I say. And to be honest, I wouldn't be where I am today if I wanted to look for someone in that particular type of position. Growing up, if you want to work with cars, people would be like, "Oh, Ella, that's not you. you." You wouldn't. I don't think I can see you in a boiler suit or with a spanner. And I'm like, actually, I don't think I can either. <laughs> and it makes you question it. So you just got to aim for the stars anyway. Is that what you'd say to someone um, who was maybe thinking about a, a career in STEM? Then I think if someone was interested in getting into STEM, I would say if you want to make a difference, if you want to change the world, it sounds cheesy, but I think it's so that. The way that the world is moving, there are so many opportunities in STEM subjects. And like I said, there is so, everyone could have a job in a STEM related subject. It's, it shouldn't be painted with the brush of having a stigma that it's just simply for numbers people or people who think logically. Um, one of the things that I chat about in my video is that creative thinking as an engineer and artistic thinking is actually just as important as the, the logical mindset of problem and stuff like that so I would say make sure you do your research because there are so many different branches of STEM related subjects that you can get into um, and make sure that you're aware of them all and you'll definitely find one that, that you're passionate about it's not just fixing things it's uh, broadcasting to the world and changing the world as well yeah, that's a really good point. Oh, listen, thank you so much, Ella. It's been a pleasure, an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, many congratulations for uh, for becoming a, a YWE finalist and best of luck as well. Lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Our next finalist this year is an apprentice non-destructive examination engineering technician at BEA Systems Submarines. She's responsible for ensuring the structural integrity of submarines working alongside technicians, confirming critical components are free from unwanted defects. Meet Denise. Working to guarantee the production of high quality products, it's imperative that we all keep quality at the heart of everything we do. For over 150 years, my hometown, which is famously known for its shipyard, has left a lasting legacy to produce high quality vessels protecting our nation. It gives me a great sense of pride to be part of history being made where the people living and working within our submarines have put their trust in our quality. It is great to meet you, Denise. Thank you so much. What a huge responsibility you have in your job, ensuring the integrity of submarines. What do you love most about your job? Every day as a non-destructive examination person is different from the other. So the various scientific methods we use alongside this cutting edge technology basically means we make things invisible, visible. One day I could be using magnetism to find surface breaking cracks unseen with our human eyes to one day using sound energy to produce this actual image of what lies beneath the surface. Mm. So each new day definitely brings a new challenge which always um, encourages me to constantly keep learning. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And is that why you went into engineering in the first place, that sort of curiosity challenge side? Yeah, so with that, it was definitely the interest and curiosity, as well as living within the heritage of my town, being so well known for its shipyard and industrial history. What made, uh, what spiked my interest really stemmed from growing up knowing that this small town is the main location for the design, build and commission of really complex nuclear submarines. And did that inspire you at a very young age? Did you always know you wanted to be an engineer? At a young age, I actually wanted to be a princess, not because of the tiaras and crowns, but I wanted to change the world. I always knew that I wanted to make it better than uh, what it was when I came into it. So I just knew that I wanted to make a really big difference and make a positive change. 
That's brilliant. And that, that, I love the parallel between a princess and an engineer. You know, you, you want to change the world. Well, you're doing that, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. Uh, during our, our 150th anniversary year, we've got an amazing opportunity to sort of shine a light on so many difference makers across the world as well. Um, do you feel and do you realise how much of a difference maker you are? At first, I didn't realise until it hit me that I was um, working and like being promoted as a role model against five other difference makers. And I was like, wow, the power that we have as a collective and what we um, are going to encourage to the world is just super powerful. And that really just like inspired me and then made me realise. Brilliant. And was there a difference maker that inspired you when you were growing up? I didn't really see many like Filipinas like me that I could relate to so my difference makers were my parents and my um, family who have a really strong line lineage of really powerful women so all their values that they taught me down and encouraging me to be the best I can be without losing myself really um, inspired my growing up and like made me to the person I am today. And, and were they sort of role models for you the fact that you had a, a strong sort of female network around you growing up was that key to you sort of becoming what you become it was just um knowing my um auntie's stories and then my grandma's stories because actually they're halfway across the world in philippines and then i grew i came here when i was two years old so i didn't manage to get that much connection with them but the calls that we do have and then just like updating with them really made me feel powerful like these women are holding their own and fighting their own battles that really encouraged me to follow along their footsteps yeah um do you do you have time in your role to sort of go out into schools and to sort of chat to the to the next generation about engineering so as a stem ambassador lots of my um chatting to the younger generation was done in-house on site or um, done at a really big level at the World Skills Conference where I could speak to loads of young people and um, families and anyone who just wanted to listen about how we can really shape um, our world and situation through STEM and engineering and how broad it is and the vast opportunities there are. It's such a lovely feeling isn't it you know when you when you're talking to to younger people and um, and you talk about your work and stuff and they're like oh that's so cool I didn't know engineers did that yeah so one of the main things where I did hear a lot of that was my work um leading our NDE stall for a road to engineering event hosted by BAE in collaboration with IET themselves and a few other institutions where we had 350 year six kids taking part in these different interactive workshops and with the scientific techniques we do, they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know you could see cracks with magnetism. Oh, wow, that light's showing up the crack. It's like, it's like magic. And I'm like, whoa, it really is. And you just <laughs> open your eyes to it. Thank you so much, Denise. Uh, it's been lovely, lovely talking to you. Um, many congratulations on, uh, on becoming a, a wider viewer finalist and best of luck as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danielle. And finally, we have a junior software engineer at Ultran UK. She is currently on a graduate apprenticeship scheme and her work involves developing and testing safety critical software to help keep people safe in their everyday lives. Meet Bethany. I work in software engineering where I develop cutting edge software that keeps people safe in their everyday lives, including when they capture train. Engineering can be very complex, so being able to simplify complicated concepts and explain them to clients and new teammates is an important part of what I do. This skill also comes in handy when I'm communicating STEM to young people, which I did as part of my university dissertation and I continue to do as a Cub Scout leader. 28th Barhampton Cubs must be the most STEM literate Cub Pack in the UK by now. It is great to meet you, Beth. And, and wow, every day must be different in your line of work, mustn't it? Uh, what do you love most about your job? 
Gosh, well, as you said, I love that every day is different. I love that no two days are the same. I think that's something that's quite inherent with a lot of jobs in engineering is that because you're solving problems that perhaps haven't been solved before or because you're building something brand new that, you know, there's no necessary instructions on how to do it and you have to work it out for yourself, that you get to, you know, set yourself new challenges and learn new skills every single day and it's not boring, to say the least. I would never describe my job as boring. Um, but I also love that in my particular field of building safety critical software, that my work has a tangible positive impact on the world around me. So I'm keeping people safe as they travel by plane or by train, things that you wouldn't necessarily think about, but I know the massive impact that has. And I think that that makes my job really rewarding and helps me enjoy it more. Yeah, yeah. And it's really important, isn't it, that, that we we find huge satisfaction in our jobs because we do with them for a very long time don't we so yeah it's really good to uh to make sure we, we feel satisfied doing it as well why did you um why did you choose engineering what made you go into engineering in the first place so i've always had an interest in science and maths i did a physics with astrophysics degree and when i went to university i thought that's what i wanted to do forever i was going to go get a phd and sort of go straight down the research line um, but then in my final year, I did a computational astrophysics module, which taught me how to code for the first time at the age of 21. And it opened up this whole new world of possibilities of, you know, just with a computer, I can build so much stuff, so much different stuff that um, I wouldn't have been able to do before. And how could this help other people? How could this help the world? Mm -hmm. So I completely switched tact when I left university. I started looking for software engineering jobs. Um, I wanted something where I could have an impact, whereas I thought maybe doing physics research wasn't going to have as much of a direct impact on the world. And I wanted to do something with my hands as I learned that that's how I uh, learn best. I learn best by doing rather than reading or listening or anything like that. And so I completely switched and went into software engineering. And I'm very grateful that I managed to find a graduate apprenticeship, which meant I could completely retrain and learn the new skills I needed to move into this profession. Yeah, absolutely. Were there any um, sort of difference makers that really inspired you, either in your job or when you were growing up? Uh, definitely. My mum is probably my biggest inspiration and the biggest difference maker in my life. Hmm. Um, she never has worked in a STEM career and I was the first person in my family to go to universities but she always you know nurtured my love for science and maths encouraged me when I was having days where I might be bullied at school for wanting to be a scientist she would let that get me down and she'd always push me and be there for me and um, she's just been a role model in her work ethic and teaching me that there's no obstacle that can't be overcome it doesn't matter what life throws at you if you want something, you just go get it and you don't stop until you've gotten it. And I don't think I'd be where I am, you know, venturing out into a brand new profession after spending four years doing a degree, which I know a lot of people would have seen, will think that's a bit of a waste. Why did I bother going if I'm just going to go do an apprenticeship? But when I told her that's what I wanted to do, she said, go for it. If that's what's going to make you happy, you can make a difference to the world any way you choose. I know you will. And so if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be where I am today. Do you, in, in your job do you get the chance to go out um, I know you do a lot with with the, the Cubs as well um, but do you go out in, into schools and, and talk about sort of your career and engineering there as well yeah I do um, so obviously not at the moment not been into any schools uh, yeah. recently um, but before Covid and the lockdown I was helping at local digital festivals so in Bath there's the Bath Digital Festival um, where I went and helped lead a a stall um, about my work where we were showcasing some of our VR work um, where we use virtual reality to train Airbus engineers in how to build gearboxes mm -hmm. and it was an application of VR that a lot of children hadn't seen before they generally associate it with video games not with oh you can use VR at work and that made them think that the world of engineering was really cool really um, sort of with the times using the newest technology um, to do something different and that was really great um, I'm also a member of the Wise Young Professionals Board with work as well. So I can't use that role to campaign for more gender diversity and gender equality in STEM industries. And so through that role, I've been speaking in lots of webinars this year to, gosh, lots of audiences from primary school girls to mums and daughters to people in East Africa, um, pretty much anyone that will let me talk to them. I've been talking to um, through work and through WISE, just about engineering and about how it really is for anyone and trying to 
push that point to as many people as I can. Well, you are an absolute inspiration and a huge difference maker. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, Thank many you, congratulations uh, becoming a, a YWE finalist uh, and best of luck. Lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. It's been so lovely chatting to our finalists and getting to know a bit more about them. But now it's your turn to ask our finalists some questions. Well, are you inspired now or what? How amazing was that? Um, now we've got a chance to, uh, to ask the amazing finalists some questions. There's been some really good questions. I've just had a quick look on the chat. So, um, so let's get started with that. So hopefully we're going to see everyone in the room at the same time. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hey. Hey. <laughs> so I can point to people now. Um, okay, so we've had lots and lots of questions. Let's start with uh, the first question is from Ali. Why do you think engineering has such a perception problem? Now, um, feel, free, feel free to chip in, but I'm going to start with Beth. Why do you think engineering still got a perception problem? Or has it got a perception problem? I think it definitely does still have one. I think it's a smaller problem than it used to be. And with each year that goes by and with events like this and more outreach and a bigger push for diversity and engineering, it's definitely a problem that is going away and hopefully will one day no longer exist. Um, I think it exists purely because when engineering started out, well, I don't know when you can say engineering started out, but <laughs> modern engineering started, it was definitely a more male dominated workplace. Um, it was during a time when women perhaps didn't even really work at all or weren't expected to work. And I think the image of engineering just got so set in our minds as a collective society. And it was set so strongly that it takes a lot of effort to get those stereotypes and those images out of your heads and replace you know, what you think an engineer is with who they actually are. Um, I don't think any of the six of us perhaps look like your stereotypical engineer. And I think that we are working really hard as a group and as a nation and a world to reduce that problem further. Mm. Wouldn't it be great to get to a point where you are the stereotypical engineer? I'd love oh. to get to a point where there is no stereotypical engineer. <laughs> yes. There we go. <laughs> that would be amazing. Good point. Good point. Um, okay, so uh, next question. Um, was getting a job in engineering difficult? Now, Nira, I'm going to pass that to you because you, you, you know, we, we just heard about your really interesting route into engineering. So, so was it getting a job in engineering difficult? I think when I graduated, there was quite a lot of engineering jobs out there and um, there weren't that many in London and that's where I kind of wanted to be. So I found that a little bit difficult um, and applying for the actual grad schemes and jobs was actually really difficult. I remember doing my coursework on the trains when I was going up and down the country doing assessment centres and everything. So whilst I think that the actual application process and the assessment process is quite tough, um, there, are, there is so much opportunity out there and I think we know that there's far more jobs for engineers than there are people finishing with engineering degrees or joining apprenticeships. So um, I would say that that's actually a positive for everyone kind of leaving school and um, higher education. Um, so yeah, don't worry about having any issues about getting jobs because engineers are always going to be needed. Anybody else want to? I'll just add on to the back of Nira's comment. I think the crucial point there being is that there are so many um, engineering opportunities in the country and there are more jobs than people at the moment. So don't be put off by the fact that it's got a stigma that you have to be really smart to be an engineer. You have to um, put in a lot of effort. I mean, the application processes are long, but it's not, no different to any other jobs. And make sure you do your research because there's definitely an engineering career out there for you. And I'd also like to add that um, you don't have to take kind of the degree routes. There's a lot of companies now that are offering apprenticeships and internships, and you can kind of do both at, on the job as well. So there are companies that will take you on as an apprentice, but also pay for your degree so you don't end up with any student loans. Um, and for somebody like me, because I came to this country as a refugee child, I actually didn't have access to engineering for, for many years because of my status in the country. And I would like to tell all the refugees and asylum seekers out there that, yo, there are now 75 universities and counting that accept asylum seekers to universities. So hopefully these routes will be available in all universities soon as well. 
Amazing. That's a really, really good point. Really good. Um, okay. What engineering challenge would you like to solve? I'm going to give you three different um, eras. So, Shrook in five years, Ooh. Melanie in 10 years, and Denise in 20 years. So, Shrook, what engineering challenge would you like to solve in five years? In five years. I've always wanted to have things that I've designed that go into space. I'm not sure if that will happen within the next five years, um, but I'd love to solve, you know, some of humanity's greatest problems like, um, uh, like carbon emissions, for example. And I'd really love to put femtech on the map even more and not just kind of slap some, some pink over something and be like, here you are, this tech is for women now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that is a good challenge. Five years, off you go, Shrug. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Melanie, 10 years. So um, it's something that is quite dear to me, but I'm currently working on the diagnosis of sepsis, which is basically when your immune system overreacts to an infection or an injury. And we have people dying from sepsis every hour in the UK. And engineers have a really big role in, in also helping health professionals to develop new technology. So I'm definitely hoping that within 10 years, you know, I will be able to um, yeah, develop a technology that will be able to make a change for sepsis diagnosis. Wow, that sounds so yeah. good. Absolutely. Great. Okay, and Denise, 20 years. Um, I think the engineering challenges, I think the main two that I'd say would be our kind of global world that we live in, as well as improving quality life. So just touching on the first one, kind of, um, kind of engineering these new solutions to improve the world we live in, renewable energy sources, and kind of um, then lead on to quality of life where we're engineering things that kind of help people that being from kind of getting food and water, clean water, clean air and just um, everything affecting our everyday lives. And do you think that's doable in, in 20 years? I think so with the amount of talent that we've got in the world currently and the amount of talent we're going to curate in our future generations from role models such as ourselves and other people working in the whole entire industries that there's definitely going to be more engineers and geniuses going to kind of create a huge better world for all of us. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're in pretty good hands just in this room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Now the other three, you haven't got off it because I've got another question for you three. <laughs> um, so for Beth, Nira and Ella, where do you see yourself in 30 years? Wow. Wow. I'd hope to say retired, but that might not happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. <laughs> um, I would like to see um, myself still working in the construction and transport industry. I feel like I've found a real passion and love for it. And the fact that I you know, can use the tube and see what I've been doing at work impacting um, me actually physically using using it I wouldn't want to lose that sense of um, being so in touch with what I do at work um, but I would hope to be in a stage where I can have a bigger platform to be able to reach all of these young men and women uh, much more than I have been able to now because at the moment I go to a couple schools and um, here and there and you know use kind of like my spare time so I'd like to have a bit more time dedicated to that sort of STEM activities ambassador role um, in the future and hopefully bring along people with me because that's I think a very important thing for people that don't do STEM events and activities how do we encourage more people to use their voices so um, yeah a bit of a professional one but also um, about STEM um, ambassador work. Nice, really yeah I would be exactly the same really I don't want to lose my technical craft that we've been doing for for these years. you know being a material scientist engineer at heart I don't want to stray too far away from that I've absolutely loved the combination that I can bring like real techie stuff that I do in the lab to go cars like I love that hybridized um, element of the lab and and business so I want to remain an engineer um, I would love to use the platform and hopefully develop the platform even further, just like Nira said, by reaching people who know what engineering was about or didn't think engineering was them, or if, the, if I relate to just one person, I think that would um, be a success. So really love to touch on my platform and then maybe own a McLaren. <laughs> maybe I can get one by then, you know. Nice. Yes. And remember your friends here yeah, when you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Please. 
Gosh, in 30 years, I think I definitely still like to be a software engineer. I hope I'll be chartered in 30 years or less. That would be really exciting, uh, taking on the next steps in my professional development. I don't know what I'll be coding, though. I think a lot of um, industries today are going more and more digital by the second and relying more heavily on technology. So, you know, right now, whilst I'm working mainly in the rail industry, I could be helping code spaceships, which I would love. And the European Space Agency, if you're here, uh, let me know. Um, but I'd love to be involved in space. I'd love to just be coding something that still makes a difference to the world. I think that's something I do love about my job. I think Ella mentioned it in her part of the video earlier is that um, we're not just solving problems for the sake of it. We're having an impact on the world around us that's positive and helps people. And so I hope I'm still doing that. Um, I also hope I'm still involved in outreach as heavily as I am. I imagine I will still be a scout leader in 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, <laughs> and that will never change. And I hope I'm still actively um, promoting diversity in engineering if it's still needed. Ideally, it won't be needed in 30 years time. But if it is, I hope I'm still supporting the cause and championing all the amazing women in engineering that need a spotlight shone on them. Mm. I think it's lovely you've all, all said a very similar thing either you know during uh, the chats we had or, or now in the Q&A where you, you still see very much part of your job to inspire that next generation it's not something that you might do on a Friday afternoon if you've got a bit of time it's, it's still a very much a fundamental part which I think is really important isn't it um, okay I'm going to try and wrap up a couple of questions together um, what and I'm going to ask you all this okay, uh, what's the most exciting hardest project you've worked on and include something that you failed in along the way because failure is really important for us right so so something that is exciting or hard or something you failed in okay Melanie I'm going to come to you first all right um so I'm going to go for I worked recently on a project where we manufactured blood so I didn't know that you can do that so like wow blood. <laughs> um well obviously we still need trans right so <laughs> so haven't solved the issue um but what was quite hard is that obviously because it is to inject in people you need to be very careful on, on how you process um the samples and obviously you have a lot of regulations around that that can be quite hard to it, it can be quite hard to find an engineering solution to solve everything so it was exciting and challenging at the same time but you know still working on it so um and yeah especially as a researcher i can say that we learn through failure my job is to build knowledge and that knowledge comes from failure so you know that's how it works good thanks Lonely. right i'm gonna go this way shrook <laughs> hi um so i'm gonna say actually my very first engineering placement um and i was to the students then and um, I joined a, like a group of eye surgeons, so people, so surgeons who operate on the eye, and they wanted me to develop this system that helps them with eye surgery. And I was like, I've literally got one year of engineering under me. Why do you think I can do this? And the thing is, as soon as I related it to a game I used to play with when I was younger, I was like, wait, I got this. I can do this, and I did it. And it's just like, you know, this, these toys that we play with as as young people have have really such an impact on us and we're like why do we give you know legos to to boys and barbie dolls to to girls and i think we mm -hmm. could all do our bit to challenge that and change this for the future brilliant thanks Rook. right this way denise so i think i'm gonna touch on two things so one of my failures to now which is leading into one of my most exciting projects I'm working on. So as an MD engineering technician, we actually need to be professionally qualified um, in our various techniques. So my first kind of exams I had to go to was the magnetic particle inspection. And with that, you have to pass the theory side and practical side. Did really well on my theory, but missed um, a defect in one of my practical samples, which means that I couldn't gain that qualification. So I had to then go resit that. Luckily, I got it on the second time round. And with that kind of failure, it did knock me um, in the beginning. Obviously, I wanted to excel in it and do really well. But further along the line, when I did start um, using my techniques more and then going on more of these kind of professional qualifications, I'm now working um, on implementing new modern technology into the business called Eddy Current Array, which is trying to act as a better alternative 
compared to the magnetic particle inspection method that I dipped on the first time. So I think that failure kind of gave me the boost of confidence to kind of do even better in the future wise and failures are always going to be inevitable inevitable don't be scared of them as like advice they're there to help you learn and sometimes you get more lessons out of that as well as celebrating all your small mm. successes brilliant yeah fail fast and learn brilliant thanks Denise okay this way Beth gosh so there's a, a failure that sticks in my mind which is when I'd um, I've been on my first project for only three weeks and I'd only been in the business for six seven weeks at the time so I was still very new um, in general and this was a really great first impression to make on all my teammates. Um, so I was programming away. And um, so once you've finished um, programming on a branch, you merge it into the main piece of code so that everyone else can access the changes you've made. And I accidentally changed a file that I didn't realize I changed, um, wasn't supposed to change. And the change went into the main branch and everyone said it was fine working away everyone sat next to me and then I got some emails from our remote team over in Portugal who had told me I'd broken a lot of their tools that they were trying to use that day and I needed to fix it immediately and that was incredible um, incredibly embarrassing and obviously got it fixed very quickly and it was all sorted but I think if anything that just taught me that because I thought my team would be upset with me but they're all incredibly supportive helped me get it fixed really quickly we all laughed about it very soon afterwards and I think it taught me that, you know, no matter how new you are into a company, if the culture's right, you'll, you'll feel like a family very quickly and everyone will always bond together to work together to solve problems, which is something I love about engineering is you're never on your own. Even though I'm sat here in my home office away from my team, I'm never on my own and everyone will always pull together to help. Really nice. Thanks, Beth. Um, Neera, and then Ella is the last word from you because we've run out of time, unfortunately. So Neera first. Um, so I'll say that the next, most exciting project I've worked on is the bank station capacity upgrade. Um, so when you go to bank station and you're walking around, you would have no idea what's happening underground. There is a massive amount of work that happens literally just like, you know, a couple of feet below you. Massive brand new tunnels, tunnelling while people are working, walking, the buses are going. And that project was the real con first construction project that I worked on that I thought, I stood there and I thought, wow, this is insane. Like it's the most amazing thing I've seen. Um, so that's a really exciting project, Google it if you've not heard about it. Um, and the hardest thing I'll say is when I um, got promoted from assistant engineer to project engineer, I joined a new team at the same time as getting my promotion. So I had a new project I was managing, I was managing a multi-million pound package of works and I had to manage people and I, I was really chucked in the deep end and I actually quite struggled. I struggled with, you know, the organisation of managing people and a project. I struggled with you know how do you keep to time how do you keep to budget it wasn't I wasn't kind of kept I didn't have my manager to fall back on anymore I was that person and I did struggle and um, but I learned from it I learned that I needed to be more confident I, need, I learned I needed to not second guess myself um, and I kind of leaned a lot on people like my friends at TFL that I knew were in um, senior positions so it was something that I didn't you know overcome it was something that I still think I could have worked on but I know now that when I do get a senior role, I'll, I'll kind of be in a more, you know, better situation to kind of help, like figure myself out. Yeah, thanks, Neera. Uh, and Ellen? So it's funny, actually, my sort of failure, or what I consider failure or stumble um, in my path would be similar to what Neera is saying with like people. Um, it was also on my industrial placement year and I was fresh out of uni, quite a, uh, you know, energetic engineer. I wanted change the world to do all these things that I came into um, McLaren as like a process engineer straight into the manufacturing line and they basically wanted me to adapt and enhance processes to make us a more efficient uh, production line and I learned very quickly <laughs> that you couldn't be um, you couldn't be bossy you had to be your individual self and it was kind of like a big personal lesson for me I thought I had to be very masculine very tough I had to be a bit shouty. <laughs> I was brought down a peg or two and it was really interesting because trying to get message across to different people but also to a large body of people and we're talking about two shifts of about 200, 250 people on the manufacturing lines. I'm listening to a younger person from um, a female younger person fresh from uni would have been challenging anyway so understanding that dynamic was um, was proper key for me going on to my career in McLaren later on. 
In terms of my best uh, project, I think the latest one with the speed tail for me was fantastic. Um, these cars, as we tend to bring out a new idea, I think I said in the video, like when these cars come out, sometimes you do sort of catch yourself and you think, oh my goodness, how did we do this? And there are so many features on the speed tail that are an automotive world first and so many challenges that bringing it from the lab to production and how thin things are and how beautiful and the materials that we use on there, everything from platinum gold to carbon fiber to graphene, like it's, it's really exciting. So that one still has a special place in my heart. Brilliant. And make sure you tell those stories to everyone. They're, they're so inspirational. Um, it's been just amazing talking to you all. Absolutely fantastic. Um, a round of applause for you for the difference makers. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you all for the view. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and thank you uh, to, to everyone uh, watching and uh, who's given us the, the questions as well. Sorry if we missed some. Um, we'll try and tweet some if we can as well. So thank you very much. And I can't wait to see the six of you in March. Thank you very much. Bye. Wow, there were some great questions during the Q&A session. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed that what incredible finalists we have this year. The work they're doing is so varied and really important and I've absolutely loved chatting to them all and getting to know them. I hope you've all enjoyed watching this programme today and are even more excited about the ceremony in March. I know I am. And registration for the ceremony is now officially open. You can head to iet.org forward slash YWE for more information. A big thank you to our sponsors for supporting and celebrating our YWE awards. And a huge thank you to all of our incredible finalists. You're all amazing difference makers. Thank you all for joining us today and we hope to see you all at the ceremony on Thursday the 4th of March next year. Hello and welcome to the Beyond 1% podcast, powered by the 1% campaign by Sir Robert McAlpine. This series is all about empowering and inspiring women both on and off-site. We will be smashing stereotypes and confronting the realities of building a career in construction as a woman. Today, we were talking about the benefits of having a diverse workforce. I'm joined by three guests with extensive careers in construction. So to my guests, please introduce yourselves. Hi there, my name's Robin McKenzie and I'm a property consultant. Hi, I'm Les Waters. I'm a community manager for Sir Robert McAlpine. Hi, I'm Emma Shakespeare and I'm a senior design manager for Sir Robert McAlpine. Thank you. Uh, so today's topic is diversity in the workforce and we're including all types of diversity in this conversation, so not just gender. So to begin with, um, can you all please share what you do now and how you got into construction? So I got into construction, I think I'd, I'd always wanted to, to get into property, um, was my end goal. And I always looked at construction as a way in um, and found civil engineering. So I went to university and studied civil engineering and got my master's in that, which I absolutely loved. And then I was lucky enough to um, to get onto the grad scheme with MIS. So I worked for them in a, on a big London project as a construction manager and then project manager um, managing different packages. I then moved um, to a smaller contractor 
and project managed a site out in Surrey, which was great, high-end residential housing. And then I, I went consulting for a little bit um, as project management. And then I've opened up my own firm um, as a property consultant. So I started investing myself a few years back um, and I help other people do it as well and still project management wise. How about you, Liz? Me? I am. Um, well, I'm, I'm one of those that fell into it. So I used to work for local newspapers um, and do marketing and branding and was unfortunately made redundant. And I had a friend who said to me, I, I was freelancing for a little while. So I was sort of doing events, working with loads of different types of businesses. And um, a friend said to me, I was kind of moaning because it was quite difficult to chase money. And they said that they had a job that they knew of that was going. And, and that actually they said to me, I don't think you'll like it, but you'll be able to kind of settle in for a little while and get yourself kind of onto a level and decide what you want to do. So um, it was in construction and it was as a community manager um, in London. And actually, I loved it. So I started and within, once I'd kind of picked up what it was all about, within a, a couple of months, I, I kind of thought, wow, this is brilliant. This is great. And so my role at the moment is it's a community manager. So there's two elements of it. I look after a couple of projects in London at the moment where we look after stakeholders and communications. So make sure that our impacts while we're, we're constructing a kind of managed and also that we're communicating with people and then the other kind of flip side of that is looking at community investment and social value so what we're putting back to the communities that we're building in so kind of two elements of the role over to you emma <laughs> yeah um well I was pretty fortunate. Um, at school, I did um, sort of uh, sciences and uh, there was sort of one of those those uh, careers fairs that came around and there were some construction people on that um, and uh, I pretty much knew that I wanted to do engineering but when I saw that fair I that's what I knew I wanted to do it straight away I was about 17. I went to uni I didn't do too well in my levels and, and um, one of the reasons I did do too well because I wasn't actually very good at sciences and all my teachers told me that um, I was no good at it I was going to fail so that actually made me think right <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to show you. So I didn't do too well, but I did a, a civils HND because I couldn't get onto a degree course, and decided I didn't want to go down the civils route. I did then a, a construction management degree. Um, I did a placement year um, at Leeds. It was actually on the Leeds University building that I I was on, which is quite interesting. And then I went um, to join the company that was uh, I did the placement with in Leeds as um, a site engineer for a little while, and then I went uh, to be a planner with that company. And then I went to London and uh, sort of stayed there. Really. Really. I went to work for um, MACE as a um, package manager and I've been as a project manager for MACE as well and then I went to work abroad as well um, on some quite exciting projects um, and um, I came back to England and worked for McAlpine as a package manager again on site so that's managing the works on site, managing what's going on out there, um, organising the trades etc. Um, and then I moved into design management and um, decided I wanted to take a slightly different track and um, I been a design manager for about five years now so that involves sort of like um if you manage a construction project imagine a construction project like a sort of lego kit so i i uh, make sure that all the pieces are there and that they can all go together and that they're going to look right at the end so that's a sort of simplistic look at it cool thank you so that's quite a range of experience there so this is the beyond one percent podcast and it's because studies show that it's about one percent of women who work on the tools in the construction industry so what does this stick to, uh, statistic bring up for you guys, and is it a surprise? Um, I'm, I'm going to start there. We, uh, part of my role is to do a lot of educational engagement with schools, colleges, universities, so it doesn't surprise me at all. We find that um, a lot of kind of women or girls, people that we engage with, they don't have a clue about the opportunities that lie within construction, unfortunately. They don't see it as an option for them. I, d I mean, I started in construction later because I wouldn't have even considered construction, to be honest, when I was at school or college or uni. So the statistic doesn't surprise me at all. I think if you look at the wider element, so where you've got kind of the, te the technical roles, you've got the administrative, the support roles, and obviously that number increases, but yeah, unfortunately the 1% doesn't surprise me. I'm, I'm not sure. No, that. it doesn't surprise me either. Um, yeah. I think it's definitely changing, um, but there's not enough visibility into what, what the roles are in construction because I do some, some schools engagement 
Um, and, you know, I, I go to them, first of all, look, I don't lay bricks, you know, because that's the common <laughs> misconception about what construction is. Um, and it's just opening up that door to them to say, look, it's all these things. It's ecology, it's um, property management, it's uh, building stuff, it's materials, it's um, the acoustics of things. It's, it's so many different things to just say it's not just about that one thing and you don't have to you don't even have to go on site if you don't want to. <laughs> yeah, you, you're both completely right. I mean, Liz, that's great that you're going in creating awareness. Um, I've been the same, Emma, going into schools and talking to, you know, younger children up to teenagers and they still just don't know what, what there is out there. There's so much more than, you know, there's trades on site, but there's also all the supporting roles and the consultancy project management. Yeah, there's loads loads to get into. I remember going to a, to a school and the little one said, oh, can you really build a wall? And I was like, no. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't want me. Really bad you, wall. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want me to build that. But yeah, I know people I know that do. someone else can build a wall, but... Yeah. 100%. <laughs> yeah, we can yeah. arrange that for you. I do think it's interesting how there's so much focus on women in, on the tools. I think, you know, obviously it's important to to educate people that those opportunities are available and it should be open to all. But I think sometimes, you know, when you talk to people, their kind of assumption is that that's what's important. But actually, when you talk to them about the wider scheme of things and the wider opportunities, you know, actually there's a lot more women, for example, that are in those roles. And sometimes I think those roles get forgotten because it's almost like people want to push, no, you know, you've got to be the, the hardcore people on site and that's what we want to shout about. And you kind of think, well, yeah, that's great and it's brilliant we do need more people to do that but there's so many so many options available that you know you don't want to blindside people to think that that's all they can do if they come into construction yeah so that's actually the perfect segue to talking about diversity there so thank you for helping out on that one so <laughs> generally speaking um i'll ask i guess two questions um the first is what does diversity mean to you and do you think the construction industry is diverse? Yes and no. So I've worked abroad. So yes, it's diverse abroad. I'd say similar issues to here. There's still not a lot of women. I worked in Asia, so not a lot of women at all. Um, I think it's getting more so, but I don't think we're there yet. I really don't. Um, I think there's still sort of a a bastion of the middle-aged white male. I know that sounds a bit stereotypical, but there is. And some senior management roles, if you look at the senior boards of a lot of companies, it's it's white males. And that's not a cross-section of society, is it? No. no. With diversity, I think what's happening at the moment is there's so many different segments of groups that people are put into. And I think what's the danger is, is uh, yes, I don't think construction is as diverse as it could be in some elements, but there's others. You know, if you go onto site, during different stages of the project, you will see people from different countries, you will see people from different ethnic mi minorities. Um, you might not see many women, you see people of different ages, you know, and, and it depends where you are, whether you're on site, whether you're in the office, because a lot of the technical kind of roles and the new innovations and digital roles now, you do see, you know, diversity is ev every kind of aspect of, of society. So you do see younger people doing that, for example. So if you look at the age element of that. So I think in some ways it is very diverse, but in other ways it isn't. And I think the problem when you look at diversity is you have all these groups and people concentrate on the groups. And to me, diversity is everybody uh, within society. It's, it's actually looking at individuals as well and, and who they are. Um, rather than always just concentrating on those one boxes um, sort of solely, individually. It's, it's kind of bringing everybody together and being all inclusive of everybody. Yeah, Liz, I completely agree with you. So, you know, in terms of projects that I've been involved with or working on at the minute, I think that if you have the diverse background, you, you come to a solution or answers that you alone could never, ever have picked out. You know, everybody chips in their bit from either life experience, what they've learned, what they've seen before. And, and that's fundamental, really, to a good project because you there's, there's never one straight path to the answer, is there? There's always, you you know, you have to just build up and work to it. Um, so diversity comes in in that way, whether it be age, gender, background. Sometimes there's a, a default point that people in, that coming into construction or thinking about it, thinking you have to have an engineering degree. Mm. And that's, that's not the case at all. It's not where you have to come from. A lot of the things you can learn 
and sometimes that, that might, they may take time or you might have to experience those things but you don't have to have an engineering background you don't have to be good at maths and physics you have to be organized and you have to be willing to learn and knuckle down and do some technical stuff but actually it's a misnomer that you need maths and physics and that, and that is the first thing i say if i go into a school you don't need that yeah i think you're you're emma you're completely right i mean in terms of uh, the degree that i did i I learned so much in it but actually that knowledge and the, the pure engineering have i applied that to my to site you know it's helped inform decisions in term from an engineering point of view but i'm i'm not doing engineering on site it's it's a lot more and it's people based as well it's very very people based you know if you can build relationships and get on with a team and and bring people together to to get the best out of them i think the project will it'll always be a success it's, all, it's yeah. always people skills, hugely. Yeah. So we, I'm sure we all know some absolutely amazing engineers who've got brains the size of planets, but can they communicate it? Often not. So it is a people skill, definitely. Yeah, and that's why uh, diverse groups are so good, isn't it? Because you get those different people working on a project together and you get your people that aren't particularly good at communication, um, but then you get your, your people that are very good at communicating or people management and you get people that have different backgrounds, so you get apprenticeships who have come up through the college and kind of through experience um, from an earlier age, for example. Um, and then you get your graduates who've got that more technical training and, you know, so, and the age age as well. So you've got people that are older with experience, you've got people that are younger that are almost mentoring the older people to learn the newer techniques of doing things. So I think that that all kind of leads into the diverse element, doesn't it, as well? So. Um, it's again the people, the different people coming together with different skills that's important. Yeah. Thanks for that. I think it's very clear from even those initial discussions that diversity is really important and it gets very clear, tangible results. So moving on a little bit. So one of the key themes at this year's Women in Construction event was diversity and inclusion. So as the industry as a whole considers this, how what do you think can change or how can things change? I'm gonna go back to education again because I think it's all, you know. For me, I don't want to be a statistic. I don't want to be a number. I don't want to be somebody trying to hit a target of so many women within construction. I, I want to be there because I'm good at what I do. Um, I'm skilled and I'm respected as an individual. Um, and that's why I'm there. It, a lot of companies are in danger of kind of targeting numbers and thinking, right, we've got to get 50 women in now. We've got to get, you know, five same people and, and all this kind of stuff. And what I think needs to happen is if you focus at early ages and really highlight the availability and what's, what's possible for anybody, whoever you are, and construction is open to everybody. I think if you highlight that at a very young age, then you cut off having to deal with the problems of, of having a lack of diverse workforce later in the day. So you open those opportunities up from a very early age, educate people to say, yes, yeah, you can do anything you want. You can enter construction. Sounds really cliche, doesn't it? Anything you want. Um, and then, um, you know, they can come into construction. I think that's what's needed. It's, you know, getting in there early and making sure people know. I think it's also, um, it's our visibility and, and what, you know, we, we hear or work in construction, so it's getting out there, are people seeing that there are different people in construction. I think we do have to tackle some of the things in our own camp in terms of, you know, some of the sites you do see and some of them you go on to, I'm sure you've probably experienced this as well, is that it, it is quite macho. It's quite, um, you know, sort of a little bit testosterone filled. That's not all sites, of course, but there is still that element of it. So I think sometimes we need to tackle that within our own camp to say, actually, that's not the image we want to portray. You know, um, we've, we've cleaned up a lot hugely over the past 20 odd years um, and that's really really good but I still think we have some way to go on that yeah yeah I completely agree you know like the the female toilets and what have you there's still on some sites there's there's ways to improve but it, I guess I'm a, probably the same as you when when I realized I wanted to be in construction or do my engineering degree I I didn't ever think oh there might not be any women I, I didn't no. really realize that that wasn't a thing until people outside and it wasn't even on people on my course they were great and there was there was a good group of girls but we were all friends with the guys as well um and there was the same with the lecturers there was ladies that that were lecturing um and they were amazing i think that you don't realize that you're the minority until somebody from outside says oh there's not many women that do that and i was like 
ah, really? <laughs> Sometimes I think there's junctures when you do, like if you walk into a room and you're doing a presentation involved in something and then you go, you suddenly look around the room and you go, ah, I am the only female in here. It doesn't really strike you until you actually, you know, make that conscious sort of connection other than getting on with your job, but yeah. Yeah, you look around and you're like, oh, right, okay. But it, if you enjoy what you do, that's yeah. not that's not a thing for you. Um, so it's maybe maybe highlighting that to, I don't know how you highlight that to, to people in schools. Well, I think it's always going to be the case, isn't it? Because we're never gonna, we're never gonna level it up totally because construction isn't for some people, for sure. Again, it's the image of it, isn't it? People don't think it's, it's sexy, it's exciting, it's all those things, but actually it really is. I mean, I, my job is amazing. I get to build something. I get to build something from nothing, be involved in that. Um, I get to go to different countries to see different materials and choose marbles from Italy and gold leaf from wherever and go to see a piece of glass, huge glass, piece of glass being tested and smashed up. All those sorts of things, you know, is exciting, but people don't associate it with that, do they? And that's the thing is that I think it's sort of the hard grind of everything, but it's not. So again, it's education into what is this thing of construction. And at the end of the day, look what we produce, something absolutely incredibly amazing that is someone's home. It changes their life. It's their workplace. It's a community space, whatever. It's a really exciting thing, but people don't associate it with that. I think it's because they see that, they see people working on the roads, they see people working on a site, and it's not that connection of that thing afterwards, because actually, at the end of it, you all go away. You're not involved in it anymore, are you? You've mm -hmm. done your job, and that there's not that connection to it. Yeah, there's a lot of work that goes in to a pro I mean, we all know that, a lot of work that goes into a project before we even get to site or before it starts being built, you know, it's gone through the design phase, it's been project managed, it's been programmed in health and safety, the ecology side of it. It's all it's all steps leading up to, and that's probably not the visible part, like you say. Like we've kind of talked about education and attracting people in, but there's also when they get in there, what you get, you know, if you want to keep and maintain um, a diverse workforce, you've got to cater for that the first work was like we said the toilets we always come back to the toilet um but things like what you're seeing on sites now that are changing is you've got prayer rooms you know you've got facilities you've got well-being rooms you've got and a lot of sites not all of them unfortunately yet but you know and and things like when there's religious festivals there's a, always something that goes out to watch out for your colleagues while they're fasting so it's you know there's there are a lot more elements that are coming into construction but sometimes i think it's not quick enough. It's kind of, you know, we st like we said, again, back to toilets. <laughs> There's still some sites you go on and the toilet facilities aren't good enough for women. There's no sanitary bins, for example. Um, and you kind of think, well, hold on, we should be there already. That is not something that we should still be kind of fighting for, you know, and, and, and things like that. So I think once you get people into um, construction, and that's just one ele element of it, I think it's, you know, you've got to be able to keep them and also provide them with the right tools or the right um, facilities and want to be in that, stay in that role and stay within that industry. I think sometimes it's our language as well. Um, we have to be, be more conscious of it, um, of what we say and how we say it. Um, I think in some of the previous podcasts, there's been a lot of emphasis on, you know, the he, the him, that sort of thing. But it's not only about that. It's being a bit more culturally sensitive sometimes. I always um, find it quite amusing, really, that every morning, if there's something special going on, they put bacon sandwiches on. <laughs> now, what percentage of those people can't eat bacon sandwiches because they're Muslim? Yeah. It's just that awareness, you know? Of, of that thing or that a lot of you know there's a lot of events that run around alcohol and going to the pub that's quite of a throwback really a lot of people for religious reasons for health reasons don't actually drink anymore so I always think it's a bit of awareness of how we portraying ourselves in this industry we need to be a bit a bit smarter sometimes about what people think of us and what we put out there unconsciously sometimes definitely the actually the last large site that i was on um there was such a diverse that everyone was from different backgrounds and different cultures and different religions and we had a day of everybody bringing in their food from their from their background of their home and and everybody shared and i guess that's not very covid friendly but <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> but it was great because you tried things that you would never try that maybe you walk past in the supermarket and think, oh, 
well, you know, what what's this? But you just never try it and you try it and it was fantastic. So that was that was a good way and a good way to get everybody to bond as well. And that was people from the site office and from site, everybody was invited in, which is also great because that can sometimes be quite a quite a split. Yes. Mm, it's all about that consideration for people that you work with, isn't it? And again, it's that people skills. It's, you know, talking to each other, getting to know them and not necessarily just thinking, thinking out the box a little bit and just taking a bit of an interest in, in the other people that you're working with um, and who they are, what their background is, um, that kind of thing, really, isn't it? And just integrating everybody together. Yes, I think it's taking that time sometimes just to, you're right, just to have that conversation, just to, even if it's a hello every morning, because that hello every morning will turn into a conversation later in the week or in the next week or whatever, you know, just to, because sometimes, and we're all conscious of it, especially construction, we've got tight deadlines, we're having to do to a budget, someone's screaming for another report somewhere, and we've all got our heads down, haven't we? So it's just t taking that five minutes to just, you know, it doesn't take much to just have that conversation or smile at someone or whatever, and then it, it opens up a whole different world, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, definitely. So that's, that's great. You've actually covered and moved across a lot of the questions I was going to ask. So thank you. I'm glad you all read the notes. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about age, ethnicity and ability. Like how does that affect diversity on site? I think age is an interesting one because you are seeing a lot more younger people coming into the industry now. Um, and I think in some cases you see there are also a lot of older people that have been in the, in the business, not necessarily just McAlpine, but in the industry for a long, long time and they're very set in their ways. And I think what you see is quite a lot of young people that are coming in that you know older people could learn from, especially like I said earlier with the new technologies. Um, but I think there's still a little bit of resistance for that because traditionally, you know, you had, if you look at the apprenticeship sort of role um, and mentor, normally, um, traditionally, you would have someone who would got a lot of experience having an apprentice working for them and they would learn the ropes from the older person um, who had all this experience. But I think now it's kind of flipping a little bit the way that things are changing within the industry. So it's quite interesting, but there is still a little bit of resistance to that. You know, there's still a little bit of I've got the experience and this is how it's always done. And traditionally we do this. So I think age is always an interesting one because you, you're always going to have to have younger people, new people coming into the business. Um, but you need to, again, include them in what you're doing and actually take time to listen because it's, again, like with any diversity, it's another fresh approach, a different way of looking at things, which can only be productive and helpful to your project, really. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, age-wise, um, when, I, when I came into it and went on to site, and I'll say it's the guys that I was working with, you know, the, the, the site I was on did have a lot of women, but in my team, there's mainly guys and, and you, you're working and you, you're learning and you, you're progressing with the project. And it's even so much to say, yeah, we've always done it this way. Okay. Yeah. Why, why is it done that way? You know, could it be done this way or is it just, are we set that way? And then, and you could see they're like, oh yeah, I don't know don't really know why just because it is and you know there's, it's always challenging boundaries isn't it and asking if there's a better way which I think construction is quite good at championing um new new I don't know industries and ways of ways of thinking and and ways of doing things I think there's actually a bit both ends of the scale that you're right um, we do tend to dismiss younger people quite a lot and they, we, we think there's a rite of passage that they have to learn all the ropes and they have to do all these things and they have to make the tea and yeah. all that. Some of them are worse <laughs> than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I think actually at the other end of the scale, there's, a, there's a, a bit of an ageist thing as well. I do. And I think that's um, totally inappropriate these days where there isn't an age where people have to retire at. Um, people are perfectly hit, fit and healthy into their, you know, 80s, basically. I'm not saying people have to work to there, but I think there's that as well, that end of it, um, that people think people are all fuddy duddies. And yeah, of course, people are going to be set in their ways, but actually, there's a huge amount of influence and um, experience to draw on. And, and sometimes it's difficult to draw that out of people because they're sometimes not willing to give it over. But actually, it's the it's the conversation thing. It's the drawing out of them because that, we really need that experience and that had what, what have you done this before? What mistakes have you made? How did you make this better? That sort of thing. And, you know, we, we've all got to come together to, to draw those things out both ways and share that knowledge. 
Yeah, definitely sharing knowledge because you don't want the knowledge at the end of a project. I think everybody's really good at that. They go off and they're like, right, that was good, next. And you need to, that sharing the knowledge needs to go round and round so that, you know, your colleagues three streets away get get given that knowledge and they can implement it. You know, they haven't had the experience, but they know what went wrong, what went right, and they can they can then help and implement that into their project. These are all great points, so thank you. Another question, do you think age, ethnicity, et cetera, play a role in securing a job? I'd hope that everybody gets a job because mm. they're the best candidate for it. So on merit. Yeah, yeah 100%. But I... Liz did speak earlier about the targets, and I guess you see it a lot more. Yeah, I think, well, it's difficult because it depends on the re recruitment practices, which I'm not necessarily involved in. But, you know, some companies have taken, so you don't have to put your date of birth on anymore. Some companies have taken off um, if people have criminal offences. In the past, you know, um, some people, I mean, there was a stage, I think, that where people were putting photos on their application, uh, applications mm. and CVs. I think that's gone now, which is good because yeah. that would be completely judgmental. Even it could be unconsciously, you would always judge someone and be biased towards something. To be honest, I'm quite a fan of like blank applications. So you literally get the merits of someone, you see what they do, you see what they've done in the past, but you don't know anything about them until you meet them. I don't know if many companies actually do that or if there's certain elements of information they need, but I don't know. There's, like I said, there's conscious and unconscious bias as well. So people might not even realise they're doing that when they look at applications. I think in construction, we're, we've got a bit of a habit of concentrating on people's qualifications again and what they've done. Where in actual fact, I think a lot of it is willingness to learn and get on and be keen in construction because a lot of it you can learn, you but you've got to have the willingness to do that. I know that sounds for lots of industries, but with construction particularly, you, you have got to work hard because it, it's, you know, <laughs> there are points when you have to work long hours, et cetera, but you've got to be willing to problem solve and get on with people. And if I can see that with someone that wants to get on, they're keen and as mustard, then actually a lot of it you can teach them. Yeah, definitely. And they're going to go far. That's great. So thanks for that. So we are seeing a positive trend in the perception of sort of female tradespeople, et cetera. And as we continue to encourage inclusion across all levels of construction, like what do you think we can do to drive this across the industry and like the wider community? And I know this is circling back a bit to what we said, but just a, another opportunity to go through that. No, it's fine. Yeah. So uh, it's just visibility again, isn't it? And maybe training and different ways of getting into the industry. I mean, I honestly didn't think there was a different uh, another way other than going to uni. I hadn't, I didn't know anybody in it. I didn't know anybody that could help me, you know, get in or talk to the right person. And so from going to uni, I mean, I got my first job by, I told Nick this the other day, but got my first job on site by, <laughs> um, I, I asked somebody outside the construction site and said, do you know where the project manager is? And then he, he was like, are you sure? <laughs> and so I went to the project manager and asked because otherwise, you know, you, you do, you get put up, your CV gets put in a pile. And I was like, I need experience. I want to have a really good career and I love construction. I'm willing to learn. And, you know, I think that younger people or, or anyone really, you need to go out there and push it and, and keep going until you, until you get there. I think that's that's fine because I think we're all fairly driven here and we probably knew what we wanted to do. What what happens in construction, there's usually two camps, isn't there? There's the people that absolutely wanted to do it and love it and there's the people that have fallen into it because there was nothing else for them to do and they thought that might be a good idea. <laughs> um, and, you know, a lot of them stay there and become very good people. But um, it's um, the realisation that actually all apprenticeships aren't manual. There are lots of apprenticeships that QS apprenticeships, all sorts of things that have no manual element whatsoever. Um, it's taking people on under your wing and bringing them in and, and giving them the experience for work experience. People to just give them that opportunity for a week to look at different trades in the industry from schools to say, and some of them will go away and say, I definitely don't want to do that. That's fine. But some of them say they do. In fact, there was, um, I didn't even realise it. Um, I took on a, um, a work experience girl for a day. It was about, oh, probably about 10 years ago now. And um, about three years ago, I came across her again in McAlpine and she comes to join the company. She said, thank you. And I was like, like I didn't even realise it was right. you. But from that experience from at school, 16, 17, she, she realised. And that, that is a, a great feeling that you've, 
you know, you've opened someone's eyes to want to do that. It's brilliant. I think it's all about giving them an insight. So showing them what goes on behind the hoardings, if you like, you know, and I yeah. think it's, it's not, and role models always have a great place to play, you know, because people can aspire or they can look up to them, but also get an understanding of the job roles. And I don't think that necessarily, I think it doesn't necessarily have to be that you have to pick a certain person that falls into a certain box and use them as a role model. It's just highlighting the different jobs and the people that they work with and the interactions that they have. I think that's really important because then people get a good idea behind it. And again, it's seeing that that there's opportunities for everybody within construction, um, no matter of who you are. So I think sometimes if a company shouts too much about how diverse they are, what they're aiming to achieve, that's not necessarily going to attract the younger generation or people into the industry. It's actually seeing, it, again, it's people. It's seeing the people that work in the industry, seeing what they do and, and seeing the relationships they have in the role. I think that's what really attracts people and how much a lot of them love their job as well. Because, I mean, who you know, you see someone who really enjoys their job, like Emma was saying, you think, oh, I want to be that person, you know? So yeah, that's, that's important. It's good. And, you know, as Emma was saying earlier, she's she's done different roles within construction. You've moved around. And I think that's a real that's a crucial thing to somebody that, you know, where I started and where I've ended up aren't at all the same. And you don't have to at 16, 18. It's quite young to decide what you want to do for the entire rest of your life. You don't have to stay in that that one role. And Liz, you haven't either. You know, you all of us, I think, have moved around. And, and that's also great to have that. It obviously depends on business needs and, and what can be accommodated. But, yeah, knowing that if you go into this, try it and maybe on a rotation. I, I, I just think construction is such an amazing thing because it's a transportable skill. You can take construction and your skills anywhere in the world. It's pretty much the same basis anywhere. It's a very diverse industry. You can, as we've said, you can you can go to from different routes that are very, very diverse within the industry if you don't like it. And often you'll be given the opportunity because no one wants to keep you in a role that you don't want to do. So you can move around to do other things. And that just expands your remit about your, your knowledge, doesn't it? Um, and, you know, actually, it's really quite well paid. So it's, it's a win-win, really. Yeah, and I think the people you meet in construction are brilliant. You know, it's you meet so many different characters from different walks of life. Again, it's diverse. It is diverse from that point of view, you yeah. know, because everyone's got different backgrounds. And once you speak to people, they will happily like chat away to you and tell you, you know, where they're from, what their experiences are, what they're, you know, and that kind of thing. And I think that's the beauty with construction as well. When you really delve into those people, that the people that work in that the industry and their stories and backgrounds. It's fascinating and it's what makes the job to some extent because you, you need to get on with people that you work with, don't you? And I think it's great that you, you, you work on a job for a, it is a finite time but and you'll say goodbye to those people on that team and then you meet a new team. But actually a couple of years later, you'll bump into this other people again and then you can catch up and, and find out what they've been doing and, and share share that you know stuff and everything. And, and that's amazing is that you actually, it comes full circle quite a lot of the time into the people that you've worked with and you work with again it's brilliant yeah you bump into them in the street as well that's how <laughs> small the industry is you walk in down and they're hi <laughs> we still have a group going from from the first i mean nick knows but from the first project and you know we go out for dinner every so often and um, it's always the planner that arranges that he's quite good at programming <laughs> that one in but you know it, it's great and those people they they become your friends not just your colleagues yeah so this is this has been a fantastic um, podcast so far. And we're going to start wrapping up. We've covered a lot. So the last question from me, it's the one I throw in. It's what's your favourite part about working in construction? From uh, people, it's the people. Uh, I think that's what I love most about it. Yeah, that, I can't really expand on that. People. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, same. I completely agree. It's the people and the projects. You know, I've seen some amazing things and then and, and doing my own stuff now and helping people and you know, it allows you to help people how you how you'd never thought you could through through property and and projects and spaces where people can live, work. It, it's great. And you can never I find it really rewarding. And the people that you meet on the way, there's um, there's, there's some good characters. <laughs> I don't know if there's one thing. It's very difficult to say that. 
Um, <laughs> people, of course, that is amazing. But um, for me, it's the whole package. For me, construction actually really stretches me sometimes. And there are some quite technical things that you have to get your head around, and I really enjoy that. Um, the scale of it, of what you're doing, you got it on a piece of paper, then you build it, and you're like, wow, that's really big, you know, even though you know how big it was. But physically, the physicality of, of actually producing something, and then literally at the end of the day, walking away and giving someone the keys and you know, you walk past it every now and then going, I was part of that. And that, that's a really cool feeling that you were part of something that is quite amazing. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. Thank you to Robin, Emma and Liz for joining us for episode three. For more information on the topics we discussed, please visit the 1% campaign website at uh, srm.com. If you'd like to ask a question or suggest a topic, tweet us at We Are Macalpine. We hope you can join us next time. Thank you for listening. I'm Thank you for listening. I'm um, thank you for listening. I'm um... My name's Flight Lieutenant Nasheen Chowdhury and I'm an Air Systems Engineering Officer in the Royal Air Force. When I was younger I joined the Air Training Corps and um, it inspired me so much that when I went to university, I decided to apply for a Royal Air Force bursary. And having successfully gained that Royal Air Force bursary, I went to university to study engineering and then straight into the RAF afterwards. The thing I enjoy most about my career in the Air Force is the variety of job roles it offers me and the variety of locations I could fulfil those job roles in. For example, I could be posted overseas um, if the opportunity arose. The, the teamwork within the RAF is second to none. Um, I've worked in close-knit teams in high-pressure environments, uh, out on operations, and everyone pulls together. And this is primarily because of the training we've had and uh, the types of environments that we have to work within. The opportunities I've had in my career so far have been quite diverse, especially with respect to sports. So I've been given the opportunity to represent the Royal Air Force in sport overseas um, and at home as well against different teams within the UK. Uh, I've also been given the opportunity to uh, pursue additional studies and I've completed two additional masters and uh, a BSc part-time whilst I've been in the Royal Air Force. My family is quite proud of me. Um, initially, they were sceptical before I joined the Royal Air Force, but fortunately, I joined at the same time as my sister, and uh, we went through that journey together. Since then, they've, uh, they've learned to appreciate everything that I do, and they're very proud of me. Uh, my friends think it's an amazing opportunity, and um, a lot of my friends are actually uh, within the RAF as well. If you're looking to join the RAF, I would suggest that you contact as many people as possible and do as much research as possible. There are so many different roles and the different roles suit different people. Um, so if you can visit an RAF station or talk to the people that are actually serving, that would definitely help. Hi everyone, I'm Lorna Bennett and I'm here to tell you about my journey so far. In 2011, I graduated with a BEng Honours degree in Product Design Engineering combined between the University of Glasgow and the Glasgow School of Art. It was a largely mechanical engineering degree based at the university with a lot of art and design project work at the art school. Unfortunately, due to creative differences with my final year supervisor, I didn't achieve the first class degree I had been working so hard towards and lost out on the opportunity to study a PhD in wind energy systems. Of course, I was naturally incredibly disappointed and spent a few days feeling very sorry for myself. But then I had to pick myself up and find a job. But before I talk about that, I want to tell you some of the things I wish I'd learned while I was at university. 
First of all, is take advantage of all the opportunities that your university can offer. I know things are very difficult right now with the, the pandemic and Brexit, but the universities have international collaborations with other countries. There's the Erasmus programme, there's IST, there's so many ways to take advantage of studying or working abroad. And that's actually leading me on to my second point, which is my biggest regret from my time at university was not taking advantage of these opportunities because my boyfriend at the time didn't want me to go away for the summer. And it's th the single thing I regret most is not taking that chance because my friends on my course that did take the opportunity to go and study overseas, they had a fantastic time and they have made friends for life all around the world. And many of them have gone to visit them on holidays ever since. Thirdly, is again, take advantage of all of the institutions and societies. I didn't discover the Engineers Without Borders until my final year and I had such an amazing time doing different projects and sustainable engineering with them and I sincerely regret not having discovered them sooner because I was so focused on my studies and trying to do my coursework. The Institutions of Mechanical Engineering and the IET and most of the others, they have student branches and they have regular events and meetings where you can meet other people from other disciplines and learn so much more about what's happening in different areas of engineering and get involved in projects and nights out and site visits and so many amazing things. So definitely take advantage and do these things. And lastly, it's not the end of the world if something goes wrong. Exam results don't mean everything. I was so upset when I didn't get the first class degree because I lost the chance to do a PhD. But if I had done the PhD, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do some of the amazing things that I have been able to do during my work life. So remember and have fun and take advantage of these events and activities and don't burn yourself out by studying every hour of the day. So on to my first job, I was offered the position as a mechanical design engineer within two months of graduating, despite not having gotten onto the PhD programme and not having a job lined up. Cali Ocean Systems designed offshore lifting and handling systems, so mostly for the oil and gas industry, but they were starting to diversify into the offshore wind industry as well. I absorbed an incredible wealth of experience and got the opportunity to travel the world and made friends in countries that I never thought I would visit, particularly my friends in South Korea, who I have been back to visit on holiday since I finished working there. And they came to visit me for their honeymoon uh, in 2016 as well. Absolutely fantastic. I was then approached by a recruitment agent who had found my CV from when I graduated on LinkedIn and asked if I was still interested in working in renewable energy. So I, of course, jumped at the opportunity to work for Palamas Wave Power. It was such an incredibly exciting place to work at the forefront of technology development, de designing what was supposed to be the world's first commercial wave power generator. I got to travel to Orkney and actually go inside the machines and see how they work. And one of my first projects was designing a new access system to make operations and maintenance easier. Unfortunately, in 2014, the wave power industry almost disappeared and my company collapsed three weeks before Christmas and I was left jobless and not knowing what to do with myself. Three weeks before Christmas, not many companies are recruiting, but again, had to pick myself up after a few days of feeling sorry for myself and find a job. Again, within two months, I accepted a position as a development engineer with a consultancy in the aerospace industry. What I forgot to mention was at Palamas, I had started a master's degree in marine technology to advance my knowledge in the area I was working in. My last module had been in marine engineering, where our final project had been to design a ship's propeller. I was able to explain to my new boss that the principles behind a ship's propeller were basically the same as those of an aeroplane intake fan, and I was offered the job. I learned so much about an industry that I would not normally have considered working in. And although it was interesting, the work I was actually doing was incredibly boring. And I found myself so sad that I had left such an exciting industry behind. But the renewable energy industry was in turmoil after the collapse of the wave industry. And I had to wait and see what was going to happen. 
Luckily, in 2016, my new boss didn't really know the difference between wave and tidal power. And when approached by a former colleague to help design a tidal test device, I was asked if I would like to go on secondment. I, of course, jumped at the opportunity to go on a three month secondment to the offshore renewable energy catapult. I have now been here for over four years and loving every minute of it. I get to work with academics, technology developers, SMEs and owner operators from across the whole of the offshore renewable energy industry. I get to work with the Leave and Mouth Offshore Demonstration Turbine, the Nova Innovation World First Grid Connected Tidal Array in Shetland, robotics innovators who are trying to make offshore operations safer for technicians working offshore, innovative foundation developers for different types of offshore wind turbine. I've presented at conferences and get to do loads of exciting STEM activities with schools, including this picture here of our VR tour of the Leavenmouth Demonstration Turbine. One of the most exciting projects I get to work on is with the Leavenmouth Demonstration Turbine. I get to work with technology innovators, testing out new technologies and sensor systems to improve the operations and the safety of offshore wind turbines. This is just some examples of some of those systems that we've tested in nearly 100 demonstrations in the last three years. I'm also a really enthusiastic STEM ambassador, having registered in 2010 for the Glasgow Science Festival while I was still at university. In 2018, I applied to the Royal Academy of Engineering for their ingenious grants and was successful in setting up a STEM engagement strategy initially in our Glasgow office at Worry Catapult, but now supporting and coordinating STEM ambassadors all across the country, from Aberdeen to Wales. In 2018, I had a very successful and busy year with several award nominations and achievements. Now, I'm not telling you this for the kudos. I'm telling you this because I definitely was not the best student at university. I didn't get a first class degree that I was working towards. In fact, I didn't even get the two one that I thought was my fallback. I did not do nearly as well in my exams as I had hoped when I was such a good student at high school. These awards are a recognition of my passion and enthusiasm for the industry I work in. And they are excellent things to be proud of, but it shows me that those exams that I was so worried about were not the end of the world. So I hope some of my turbulent experience gives you hope for the future and that the stress and anxiety of COVID and the lockdown doesn't take too much of a toll. You can do it. Just keep going. Thanks for listening. The Women's Engineering Society is almost 102 years old was founded in 1919 at the end of the First World War when the women who had worked in engineering were sent home so that men coming back from war could do their jobs. Our founder, Lady Catherine Parsons, said it seemed unfair that women who'd been trained to build the weapons of war were now no longer able to build the foundations of peace. Since then, we have grown and we are now the largest network of women engineers in the UK. We have a glorious history of women who have changed the world as they became engineers. But we don't want to rest on our history because we know that those women who founded WES 100 and odd years ago wanted to become engineers and they made history on the way. And we want to encourage women from all ages to join WES and make their own history. As part of our community, we have regional clusters where you can join and meet women who are in your industry or others so you can share tips. We are, have a lot of member content on our website to support you as a professional female engineer, including information on COVID, links with organisations like Pregnant Then Screwed, and also support from our cluster coordinators and our staff to support your needs. We have a mentoring programme called Mentorset, which you can join for an additional fee, which will help you to receive expert advice on how to further your career. If you want to become a greater part of WES, we also have opportunities for governance, whether that's joining our university groups board as one of our university student groups, our apprentice board, or our early career board, or even joining one of our committees that help to advance our membership, partnership, events and communications, 
that's all available to you. And later on in your career, you may wish to become part of our main board and one of our directors. And we also have role models in promoting engineering to the next generation. So for example, we have the She's an Engineer facility on our website where you can read the stories of young women who entered engineering and how they work with their colleagues. We also have the Top 50 Women in Engineering Awards, which celebrate those women who've made great strides in the year. These were founded about six years ago, and last year in 2020, they were about sustainability. We were looking at climate change and those people who were helping to respond to the Sustainable Development Goals. And we did our first award ceremony online, and you can see a montage of our 50 winners. Uh, and that they're all dressed up as if they were able to come to our afternoon tea. The WES Top 50 Women in Engineering in 2021 will celebrate the engineering heroes, the best, brightest and bravest women in engineering who recognise a problem then dare to be part of the solution, who undertake everyday heroics as much as in emergency ones. Engineers deliver and maintain critical services and infrastructure and they keep civic society functioning at every level and support lives and livelihoods, as we found during the pandemic. And that's why WES is celebrating those heroic women who support our society and keep us safe. Nominations close at noon on Monday 8th of March 2021 and can be made at www.wes.org.uk forward slash we50 where you can nominate your female engineering hero. of hours um i hope you enjoyed that um but i the iet young women engineer of the year award who was going to win can't, it they can't call it what an insane lineup of women we just can't wait for this evening uh we actually went to last year's event didn't we amanda we did they are all deserving winners um and you know they they are all winners at the end of the day whoever does win tonight Absolutely. but if you do want to check it out it will be um live at 7 p.m um and we're going to move on now actually i just wanted to say thank you to lorna bennett um such an inspiration laura and thank you for sharing your story it's really great to see you know don't lose heart if things don't turn mm. out the way you planned. You know, not everybody has a plan um, of where they want to be in the next few years. But if you do and it doesn't work out, you know, taking a different route to get there, that's fine too. And actually, you gain a lot more experience, um, harking back to what Melissa Ahmed said as well, in gaining that experience from working in different areas along the way. To make you a much more rounded yeah. engineer. Yeah, um, I hope you guys all enjoyed our podcast. By the way, I hope it gave you a bit of a bit of an eye break. We have got another one coming up later as well um, from STEM Learning, so that's a really really good one to tune into as well. So we're we're moving on now to our next session um, from RS Components. They're going to be sharing the amazing work that they do with universities through their RS Grassroots Education section. 
Um, these guys do so much. They run competitions. Mm. They work with the faculties to deliver all of their parts. Um, they've got an award-winning apprenticeship program. There's just so much to hear from these guys and they've got so much advice coming your way. So um, stick around and find out more. We'll be cutting to them very next, shortly, right now. Hello everyone. This video will highlight the help provided by RS Components to PowerHab during the COVID-19 lockdown period, as well as highlighting how this continued help allowed us to continue manufacturing and developing our prototypes, which we then brought to the Agluna 2020 virtual field campaign in Luzerne, Switzerland. Agluna is a project collaboration involving the European Space Agency, the Swiss Space Centre, and over 150 students from various universities all across Europe. This in turn means that PowerHab's goal within the Agluna 2020 project was to develop a lunar habitat power system and demonstrate the bleeding edge technology available for energy generation, storage and distribution. This in essence means we are able to influence the next generation of space exploration by presenting the key technologies that we feel will be feasible in the near future. Well, I'm sure as most of you can imagine, it was pretty bad. To start with, we had team members flying home um, and ultimately what was the worst uh, impact as of COVID was that the university labs shut. Once the COVID pandemic hit, I communicated a lot with Sam Presley, who helped me negotiate the loaning out of various pieces of equipment in order to set up my own home electronics laboratory. Uh, they also provided me with all the necessary components I needed in order to finalize my lithium ion battery management system prototype, which we successfully brought to the Agluna 2020 virtual field campaign. Here is the lithium ion BMS prototype one with recorded cell measurements and the circuitry powered up by the lithium ion cells that you can see here. This is connected through the emergency stop button into the circuitry. And then we have the lithium ion BMS prototype two. This was assembled on Vero board and as you can see has soldered connections on the back. The PowerHab team finished in the top three universities out of 16 teams that participated. The ability to be able to work on lab experiments and circuitry both at night and at weekends um, was a huge benefit. Frankly, I wouldn't have been able to do it without this added convenience as it were. Yeah, we finished in the top three and as a result we got to present to the European Space Agency Director General Jan Werner as well as the Swiss Space Centre Scientific Technical Advisor Johan Richard. There was an added level of maturity, I'd say, to the project that we had to develop this year to basically work off our own backs and come up with the goods, basically. And it's been one of the most influential uh, things I've done in my life to date, I'd say. And welcome to a snapshot into the world of RS Components and Design Spark, and what we can do to help you as budding engineers and technologists to further your careers and exploit the most of the opportunities around you. I'm Isabella Mascarenhas, VP of Grassroots Education at RS, and I'm joined by a few colleagues here today who we'll do the rounds of and do some introductions to. Over to you, could I? Hi guys, uh, my name is Kutsai Mandiri. Um, I work in corporate sales and I look after the education sector, so all schools, colleges, universities. And what does that mean in layman's language? So it just means that I spend a lot of time listening to educators and students from the different institutions and just try to find out what your needs are, what the educators' needs are 
and I basically take all this information around the stuff you need and take it back to our business so we can try and actually develop solutions and give you guys the stuff that you guys need. Um, over to you, Tim. Thank you, Kudzai. Yeah, my name is Tim Beasley. I'm the Apprenticeship Program Manager at RF Components. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, Tim. Uh, hi, all. Uh, I'm Mike Bray. Uh, I lead DesignSpark as part of a group innovation function. Um, DesignSpark, if you don't already know it, is our design engineering community uh, and platform that's yeah, built around a community of engineers yeah, from undergraduate level through to professional engineering and those who are approaching the end of their careers and are wanting to give back. Uh, and it's 10 years old. Um, you reached 10 last October. Um, we're now over a million members and we'll be talking a lot more about how that can help you uh, in terms of your future career development, including how we work with Grassroots, which Isabella can talk more around. Yeah, so what is Grassroots Education? A rather random title. So we do all of the kind of value added services around the edges for students and young professionals. Uh, we do STEM outreach, we have STEM ambassadors in the company, we do volunteering opportunities, competitions, challenges, employability skills training, all of the things around the edges of your studies that will hopefully allow you to be the, the brightest, shiniest version of yourself. So RS Apprenticeships, they've been really, really successful over the last few years. We've, we were nominated uh, within the top 100 UK apprenticeship employers uh, this, last year, now 2020 we were nominated, we came 27th, which was fantastic considering that as a business, three years ago when I joined, we had one apprentice in the business. So we've come leaps and bounds with this and it all comes down to our apprenticeship strategy that, are, that was put in place. Every single apprentice that we've recruited so far that's graduated has found a permanent place within RS. So what positions are we talking about at RS that we really struggle to recruit for? One example that really stood out to me was software engineering. Now, as a department, we, we really struggled to find local talent that were skilled in software engineering. And we'd bring in contractors that we'd pay a very, very expensive day rate to, but and it was unsustainable really. So we sacrificed some of the headcount that we used for contractors uh, and we started to employ some apprentices as software engineers. And every single one of them, like I say, has now found a position as an associate software engineer once their apprenticeship uh, completed. So at the end of it, they've, they've achieved a degree in software engineering. They've gained at least two years experience within the business and, and they have different parts of the business. And they've got their first step onto a career in a job that we really, really need. So it's unlikely that they're ever gonna face a redundancy in the near future. And that, it's been really, really successful. And I'm really, really proud of what we've achieved with our apprenticeships. And if I could just come in there, Tip, because um, Design Spark's been an area that's benefited from um, having apprenticeships uh, within there. Not, I hasten to add, because we're a difficult department to recruit for. We're nothing, <laughs> of, nothing of the kind. Um, but what it did do was help bring in new skill sets uh, to us. So we were looking at it from a viewpoint of, we've got lots of rich design data information that we can capture. We need people who can come along and yeah, understand and help us interpret that. And that opened up the route towards a data uh, uh, apprenticeship that we're able to bring a young lady called Erin Blount into and Erin is she's been a superstar she's she's mm -hmm. absolutely smashed every target that we've set her um you know she's now a permanent member of the team and she's you know, taking on a whole new set of challenges around how we visualize and share our data across different parts of our business as well so from, from what it's brought into uh RS yeah through having apprenticeship routes open I think yeah the evidence yeah, it is something that we can be really proud of. It, it, it's, sorry, it's, it's a really good point as well, Mike, that you bring in, because one of the benefits to the business of apprenticeships is that we start to balance out the diversity issues that we have across different industries. So mm -hmm. in software engineering, for example, if you walk through our software engineering departments, probably 90% male, um, whereas with our apprenticeships, they were 50-50 gender split, which was fantastic. Uh, and it was it was a real uh, a real eye opener to us at the benefit of, of doing that to us as a business as well because it starts to even out uh, us for the future uh, and, and makes us a much more inclusive employer that's a really good thing to bring up actually mike because unbeknownst to you erin's being interviewed as one of our top young talent people to feature in the engineering your career um event as well ah, cool she's a superstar 
She's awesome. Yeah, agreed. Um, Tim, I guess um, it'd be pretty useful to understand from a young person's perspective, what do you think is the benefit of them doing an apprenticeship versus um, going to uni, perhaps, or, you know, a different route into engineering? Yeah, well, I can, I can talk about why they should do an RS apprenticeship, because... Oh. Yeah. <laughs> not all employers adopt the same strategy with apprenticeships so some of them will bring on very very low level entry level positions um, with an idea that they're surplus to requirement and you you might get landed with a lot of the donkey work i'm not saying that you'll you'll spend your whole apprenticeship making tea and doing the filing but some businesses do do that unfortunately at rs because we we looked at the roles that were critical to us as a business the the hiring managers for each of those departments had to sacrifice one of their headcount for an apprentice now there's a real good benefit to this as, as for the apprentice because that hiring manager has a vested interest in the success of that apprentice that you're not surplus to requirement you're not an extra headcount that then gets labeled as a free uh, a free labor um because you, if you label something as free, it automatically loses its value. But because it's incorporated within the teams, the apprentices are very, very valued by the hiring managers and they want the apprentices to succeed. We, Because of this and the roles that we're looking at, we tend to focus on degree level apprenticeships as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a financial benefit to the apprentices because you come out with it uh, out of your apprenticeship with the same degree that you would have had at university, but minus all the student debt, uh, and the lack of experience. So yeah. the worst case scenario with an apprenticeship at RS is you you leave your apprenticeship with two, three years worth of valuable work experience and a degree and no debt. And just as a side point, some of our apprentices that we've recruited have gone on to get mortgages and buy houses while they've been an apprentice um, because that's that's the sort of salaries that we pay and, and the value that we add to the, the apprenticeships. I was talking to one of our apprentices the other day who's just bought himself a lovely Audi S3, which um, um, was definitely beyond the realms of what I could achieve when I was 19. So, yeah, definitely some benefits there. And, and just to touch on that point as well, Isabella, I was thinking about the, the benefits to us as a business, because I spoke earlier about us um, not just doing it because it's a nice thing to do, but we're doing it because we need to do it. And there's a three-pronged benefit to the business. There's the financial benefit, which speaks volumes to when you're talking to the, the chief financial officers and, and uh, the finance guys around the business, because we're employing apprentices that are going to replace sometimes expensive contractors. So there's that cost saving and you, we don't pay agency fees, et cetera, all of that stuff. There's a brand benefit. It looks good from the outside looking in that we take on apprentices and we, we get a younger workforce and a, a younger workload. And the third benefit, is that it solves the original problem that we're looking to solve. So if we had these, these positions around the business that we we're struggling to recruit for, we get off that, that roundabout that where we, we were recruiting expensive individuals, keeping them for six, 12 months, and then them leaving. And then we had to then start again and recruit someone else. And we'd go through that painful six to 12 month recruitment process again. This way, we grow an apprentice that perfectly fits the role that we've employed them for because we've started from the ground up and grown them into that position so it really does benefit us in those ways um is it worth you sharing some of the work you've been doing at local colleges just to support them on the apprenticeship schemes and stuff because we've got uh, we've got the six ways of working across the business which is things like aspiration inspiration all those types of things we never mention qualification and i'm really really proud of that we we don't uh, we don't say that someone is only suitable for the role if they achieve this certain qualification. We're much more interested in what people are like as individuals, uh, and we can give them the qualifications if we're saying that they're important later. But we can't train someone's personality. We can't train someone's character. So that's what we look for when I go out to schools. I see a lot of downhearted young people that feel railroaded into certain careers uh, and. As a side point, one of our software engineering apprentices, one of our female software engineering apprentices, Amy, started uh, as an animal management uh, degree. She, she went to university and started an animal management degree, realised it wasn't what she wanted to do. She quit after a year or two and then started working for RS as a software engineering apprentice. And she's fantastic at the moment and she, she's managed mm -hmm. to secure a role. So 
I do go out to the local schools. I do engage with as many young people as I can. Uh, and we try to uh, we try to encourage as many of those to to apply for those positions that we've got as well. So we, we promote a lot of what our, uh, we promote a lot of our roles over our social media channels, uh, and we we try to encourage as many people to apply as possible. So as I mentioned earlier, I work in corporate sales, and I absolutely love working in sales, primarily because a lot of what we do is just spend a lot of time talking to customers and just understanding customers' needs. I always tend to hear um, that your needs primarily revolve around five key things. So I think in terms of the support that you guys need in terms of understanding STEM and also widening participation, there's a need around uh, getting value for money. So how do you manage to get more for your money? Um, a need around efficiency. So how do the educators create more time for themselves to be able to support students. Then there's a need for innovation. So where do you get the innovation, like the innovative products? Uh, and also finally the inspiration to actually go and push the boundaries of what is possible in terms of new products, new services, and all that sort of stuff. So how do we then take all those needs as a business and then translate them into things that we can help you guys with? So, the most obvious thing is we're a distributor, so we stock all the right products. We make sure we've got all those cool development boards, all those cool robotic products, everything else. So the sort of things that you can actually uh, build into your coursework and use to um, create new things and, and obviously meet your learning objectives, your learning outcomes. We do that at the right price. And we do give educational institutions a lot of discount terms so that you can actually get more for your money. Um, and another way that we have helped um, students and educators um, more recently during COVID, uh, we realized fairly early on when we started talking to the individual educators and students at the start of the COVID lockdown in March that we were sort of moving towards a period where remote learning was becoming a thing. So students had to stay home or in residence and had to still find ways to cover the curriculum and still meet all their sort of learning objectives. So we quickly decided to do a number of different things to support students in this period. So we started to deliver stuff to students' homes. So university could order any product and get them delivered directly to the students' addresses, home addresses. We decided to create, in essence, a, a student kit or a lab kit, which in essence was like a lab in a box that we could then ship out to students and in essence replicate the lab environment at home and in a safe way as well. And that's just a couple of things we did. We, we, we also did a third thing, which is we actually created a student project fund. And I think, Isabella, this is probably best coming from you, just to share a bit about what we did there. Sure. Yeah, so we, we kind of recognised that so many young people's um, learning experiences were, were so heavily disrupted by COVID. Um, and we really, really wanted to help support those um, young engineers to keep tinkering and keep their projects alive while they were at home. So we quickly kind of pivoted to, to open up a, a little bit of a, um, a student project fund whereby young people could apply to us for up to £250 worth of components that we could send out to them at home to enable them to carry on those projects. Um, it proved really popular. We uh, have had over 50 entries for it uh, so far. Um, and we're really hoping to support at least 30 of those um, groups of young people with their student uh, with their student projects still. We've actually introduced a really new and cool product called the Connect Point. And if I'm just trying to explain what a Connect Point is, it's like a standalone terminal with um, a touchscreen iPad on, on top uh, and a light box underneath it. And, and these Connect Points, we've positioned them in maker spaces or hack spaces. So you've got all students coming into these hack spaces, doing the experiments, and if they come across a product they need and they're not quite sure what it is, they can go to the light box and, and put it inside and it identifies what that product is, or they actually have access to ordering new components, like instead of having to go out 
and goes back to their labs, back to their computers. They basically have everything there, which has the effect of, I guess, creating a bit more time for you guys. So you can actually just focus on getting more done within that time you have within the hack space and actually getting down to creating new cool tech that we all, all know and love. Um, so that's just a couple of things I can talk about, but I know Isabella has lots of other stuff that she, she can share with you guys as well. Yeah, thanks, Kud. So um, around the edges of what you're studying and what you're doing with your technical skills, there's all sorts of other skills that need to be developed. Um, and we're here to help you with those. And having worked um, at a couple of different places that have an engineering and technology focus, got a really good understanding of what employers are saying that they want from young people joining the workforce in an engineering and technology space. So uh, primarily it's um, how can we help you to apply those technical skills that you're learning um, in a real world working environment. We have a number of different ways that we can do that. So for example, with the student project fund that we mentioned, there's a whole piece of work that we will do with you off the back of that to help you to create some great technical content off the back of your, your um, project. So that might be a blog, an article, a video, how we can help you to articulate that message and deliver um, some clear messaging back to the people that matter at your university or prospective employers. How do you talk about those technical skills? So that's one thing. Um, we do employability skills training, which is hugely important and something that a lot of employers talk about. There being a little bit of a gap uh, with young people. Um, and it's one of those topics that's so often talked about and everyone presumes that young people know what it means. But, you know, it's everything from working effectively across cultures through to um, communication skills, being an effective member of a team. All of those kind of things, we actually run um, free webinar sessions for uh, young people in universities and in colleges and indeed in um, sick forms uh, on all these topics and they can attend any of these sessions and we will run them bespoke for your class or for a subset of your class. That's another really important element of what we offer. Competitions and challenges. Everyone loves a challenge to get involved in and to test your technical skills, but again, all sorts of soft skills come off the edges of that. You know, how do you work with people in other disciplines? How do you work with people studying other things that replicate what a work experience environment looks like? Um, so we do all of that stuff too. And we have some really cool volunteering opportunities that you can get involved with over here. We're very, very lucky to have um, an, a, a, a volunteering opportunity called the Fresh Advisors Board. It's a board of young people from all over the world at different stages of their studies and their early career so that we can get them together, enhance their network, their ideas that they'd like to see a company like RS delivering. Um, and just what an amazing opportunity off the back of it, we'll give um, certificates, reference letters. Um, we can do LinkedIn recommendations and it's all with a view to helping you to become that most rounded, employable individual as possible. Uh, so lots and lots to check out and to dip into. Um, on the screen shortly, you will see uh, a URL taking you through to the RS Education web pages, where you'll see a bit more about this. And of course, where is all of this wonderful content hosted? Well, that would be in Design Spark, which is a lovely segue over to Mike. Thanks, Iz. Um, and thanks, Kudzai, as well. So let, I'm going to talk a little bit about Design Spark, um, a little, uh, just as an introduction. So I'm not going to assume everybody knows what Design Spark is. Um, Design Spark is our design engineering community and platform. Uh, it's been set up on designspark.com, um, and it provides access to software, tools, resources, um, content, learning uh, materials, projects, competitions. Um, and a whole range of other bit pieces and uh, content that people will want to investigate and explore as part of their journey to become an engineer, design a project, design a product, you build that product into something that is viable to take to market and potentially in the future bring that out as part of their own business or part of a further business that they, they subsequently join. 
Design Spark today, if I give you some dimensions around that, Design Spark has every four seconds somebody consumes a piece of content on Design Spark. Every 12 seconds, somebody is onto Design Spark um, downloading a piece of content or a resource that's going to help with their design. Every 20 seconds, somebody opens one of our design tools. Uh, and every two minutes, we see a new member join Design Spark. So we've now got an audience that is in the region of 1 million plus members, of whom just under 25% are from an education background, i.e., students or lecturers as well. So a great proportion of our membership are using Design Spark as a base for their education and learning. And the reason they're doing that is because our CAD software, first of all, it's free. Yeah, and if I didn't mention it before, I'll mention it again. It's free. <laughs> you don't need to pay for it because it's free. Um, and it works across your yeah, PCB level. So we've got Design Spark PCB for anybody who's doing electronics engineering. Um, we have Design Spark Mechanical for mechanical CAD engineers. And we have Design Spark Electrical, which is a freemium version of uh, products that's out there for anybody who's doing electrical CAD engineering. And those are the three big engineering disciplines that people will tend to move towards from a design engineering perspective. What they will do with those and the reason why students it's, uh, find that the software piece is very popular is that it gives them control over their designs. So they can track their projects through. They're not tied into anything that's gated or lost beyond university. They can take the projects with them yeah, through their career and yeah, into a professional uh, learning environment or into uh, a business. Um, and they're usually migratable as well. So yeah, the output for, formats you get, be they Gerber files or be they other uh, dimensions, they're mi they can migrate into whatever other software packages uh, you'll be using in the professional life as well. So you've got access and control to your work. Um, alongside that, yeah, though, we've got loads of great learning content and loads of great um, projects and information sources. So like Isabella and Kudzai were just talking about, on Design Spark, you will find competitions. Um, a lot of the grassroots competitions that were run um, are, are hosted on Design Spark. You can read all about them if you just look up our, our competitions area. You can see the types of entries that we get in. Um, we've had competitions that ran last year all around how to connect to community and you know, help people cope with isolation. Um, we also, for younger audiences, ran uh, a brilliant engineering competition, just trying to stimulate ideas, but things that people can do to um, uh, with their kids to actually uh, yeah, think about their creativity uh, during lockdowns. So lots of opportunity to get involved uh, and share content, share creativity and ideas, but also to learn as well. We've got some great learning content. We work with all of our suppliers from the RS world, um, over two and a half thousand of them. Um, and they provide us with some really great in-depth learning content, how to's, uh, around protocols, around applications, around you know, how to use products successfully in, in more challenging environments as well, um, as well as you know, how to adopt a piece of kit within your your future product development cycle as well. So you know, some suppliers give us access to some of their own in-house learning materials because they're keen to put them in front of as many young engineers as possible mm -hmm. so that they can understand what the po potential is and the possibilities are. And of course, they're also looking at what people do there. They're looking at what people uh, are doing with their products and they will come and talk, talk to you individually as well. And you may well find yourself yeah, uh, receiving calls from people in some of the leading suppliers into the industry who are really fascinated by what you're doing and want to work with you uh, on those projects as we move forward. So. There's loads of opportunity through Design Spark for people to really understand how they can develop themselves, how they can build their reputation. Mm. Yeah, no, quite. And, and the other thing that I, I can't help but uh, think about from a young person's perspective is, you know, all those times when you're talking to, to a prospective employer or you're looking for a placement or a work experience and you're trying to explain to them what your technical projects have been, well, there's another beauty of Design Spark. Instead of trying to explain it, show them. Put show your it. content in there. Yeah. Show it. Show it. Create it. the video. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Create, create the video. Show, show your potential off because you, yeah, there's loads of great case studies out there of people who've been able to use platforms like Design Spark, create uh, that that content, and that creates such a buzz around them as a person as well as the project. 
Yeah, absolutely. Gives you the little edge, makes you sparkle a bit more. Yeah, uh, the engineering edge, which yeah, seamless link is a podcast Ooh. series that we have out at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> I think I think Mike, I think I'm a huge fan of Design Spark, and I think the feedback I've gotten from a lot of uh, educators and students has been really great. I think the sense of community and being able to find everything linked to a particular technology, or whether it be a technology theme, or whether it's just like a specific product, is absolutely fantastic. Mm. It, it, it's probably worth also calling out that um, in, in terms of building a body of evidence, so let's say for a student, for example, building a body of evidence of their technical writing and everything else is really great. And I don't know, Is whether you wanted to touch on some of these student article series that I've seen there. Um, mm. with the likes of, yeah, is it Glasgow Femenj, who are doing a nice little series? Yes. Me, use an oscilloscope. I must yeah, say, yeah. Use no, absolutely. So our, um, an awful lot of the grassroots education programme is heavily underpinned by, as Tim mentioned earlier, diversity and inclusion. You know, I think we all know that the engineering industry needs a, a bit of a shake up with a, a, a vast um, cohort of young people coming in from different backgrounds, different ethnicities. And that's something that we pay a lot of attention to through our grassroots work as well. Um, and actually through that have come some really interesting little opportunities like the Femenj um, Student Society. So they're a bunch of young ladies studying electronics engineering um, and they suddenly became quite conscious of the fact that they were in, um, in the minority in the lab and they wanted to help future female engineering students going into the lab to feel more comfortable with it and to feel more comfortable with the tools that they'd be using there. So we worked with that student society to create a little series of, of content of, as Kunzai says, the young ladies in the lab using an oscilloscope, using various other tools and components that were provided by our team. Um, and it's a really lovely series of content. Um, so really happy to support student ambassadors in universities who are wanting to do something like that to help their fellow students. It's another way that we can uh, get involved with you and support you with some of your little missions there. And I think also, again, going back to that employability point, and it'd be really good to get Tim's perspective here. As an employer looking at bringing some of these young people into the business, what would it do to you if you saw a, a little repository of technical content from them? If you, you saw that they volunteered for an organiser like RS, what would that make you think of them as an individual? Well, one of the things that, that I look for particularly in, in applications for apprenticeships is, is not so much, like I mentioned earlier, their qualifications, although they are a good indication as to what their, their, where their passions lie. But I want to look at what they're doing when they're not at school. So those projects that yeah. they're doing over and above really show a, a future employer, this is where I'm going to go over and above while I'm, while I'm working for you as well. And, and, and that, that speaks volumes. You can't teach that. You can't, you can't quantify that on, on an application. So I think that's very, very valuable. Yeah, yeah I think that's really important. And um, yeah, the more, you know, again, what we've seen is loads of engagement around, yeah, what, what you'd call social justice uh, style like activities or social improvement um, yeah, activities as well, because yeah, there, there is a growing sense of a need to give back uh, as well, or a, and a need to help sh reshape in some cases. Um, how engineering works, yeah, for the benefit of yeah a wider societal group than yeah what it's previously done uh, as well. So, yeah, we we saw great engagement last year uh, on Design Spark through the the uh, first stage of the COVID pandemic around the use of three D printing as a technology. Again, influenced massively by people who've said, I, "I want to be able to help. I want to be able to do something useful here," and I put my engineering yeah um, skills. Uh, or my enthusiasm to good use. Uh, and I think the more that you can do things like that uh, through, uh, yeah, whether it's Design Spark or whether it be through your own university societies, um, that is only going to help in terms of uh, yeah, your future employability, whether that's at an apprenticeship level or beyond. Yeah, I'd, I would agree. And I think the, the little nugget to add there is that you just never know who you're going to meet through some of those opportunities that you can take part in. Um, yeah, could be your next mentor, could be your next coach, could be your next employer. It's definitely worth exploring opportunities around the edges of your studies. Yeah, I think one thing that we didn't touch on actually, which is probably very important is because 
a lot of students are either thinking of becoming, of obviously getting good jobs, but then the other half of students is obviously thinking about becoming inventors, doing startups and stuff. And I yeah. think, is, is it worth, I mean, obviously all these skills are applicable in both areas, but I guess, Mike, through with your innovation hat on, um, is it worth just talking about how some students can obviously work to design Spark to develop these ideas and then bring them to us as well? Because we actually do a lot of stuff to support inventors as well. Um, mm -hmm. As a big distributor, we have the reach. Do you want to just touch on some of that as well? Yeah, yeah. And, and again, I'll, I'll give some examples of what uh, what's happened in the past where people have used Design Spark tools, resources, etc., to develop products. So, yeah, we've seen examples of people who've uh, develop products yeah, utilizing the tools and the product, yeah, the components that we have within our catalog, and they've come back and become a future business and a supplier to us as well. So people like PyTop, um, who yeah, they, they built the Raspberry Pi encased laptop for learning uh, as well. So yeah, that was all developed yeah on the prototype basis through Design Spark, yeah, utilizing some of the code and the yeah, information that we put on there. Yeah, brought that through, and that, and now we are a um, seller of PyTop products as well. But from an innovation perspective, we're also massively interested in that because yeah, these are the future businesses that we might choose to invest in ourselves. Yeah, so um, yeah, we're, we're obviously looking for provable business models. Um, so uh, we're looking for evidence where we can yeah show that there is market demand that uh, can be uh, achieved through the realization of a concept. But it's a great opportunity for people who are thinking, yeah, you know, on a more entrepreneurial basis, if that's where where their interest lies. That, yeah, putting this on putting this on Design Spark, you know, attracts our attention, but it also attracts our suppliers' attention as well. They're paying, yeah, close, uh, keeping a close watch on what is happening within the wider ecosystem, the use of their products, because they're also looking at future business opportunities either as a lead supplier in there or potentially beyond that as a go-to-market route as well. Um, so for both ourselves, RS components and our suppliers, all two and a half thousand of them, yeah, there's a big audience to actually uh, play to if you're thinking of uh, trying to launch your own startup, uh, with designing a product or bringing that to market in some way, shape or form. Well, we shall flash a slide up with all of the contact details and all of the URLs to find out more about everything that we've talked about today. The one word I would use to describe my experience today Two words, life changing. It really has got to me. I really like what we've, I've heard about and they gave me ideas of what to do in my future and how I could change from the past and reflect on the bad stuff and make good stuff about it. You know, it was pretty much around addressing a need. You know, young people seeing the opportunities there are for them to excel in technology and engineering. The opportunity here is these kids are going to grow up to be something and when you catch them from an early age you can shape them to mould the society that we're trying to build. So for organisations coming forward in the future this is a great foundation for building the next generation of, um, of careers and people that we want to occupy and live in this planet. I enjoy the motivational speeches. It's worth it. You shouldn't turn down any opportunities because every single day you should progress. Yeah. I've been watching lots of the things that give me most motivation, especially from T1, because I watch him on Instagram and to see him, I was kind of starstruck, I'm not going to lie. To my colleagues that would be um, thinking of attending next year, I would say that it would be life changing and it's actually helped me out quite a lot because I've realised that for me to be successful in life, I don't have to find something completely unique, but I have to find something where I have that little thing that makes a difference to everybody else. Keep exploring, keep learning. Your experiences broaden your mind and go out there and just drive and keep going for what you believe in. Myth. Engineers can fix everything.
Reality. When I was at university, bearing in mind I studied civil engineering, nothing to do with cars, my mum was having a problem with the car. So I got back from uni, I said, Mum, what happened to the car? Why is it broken? And she said, oh, I was waiting for you to come back because you study engineering at university. No. <laughs> Myth. You have to be a genius to become an engineer. People come from all different routes in engineering, whether that be a degree, an apprenticeship, GCSEs, no GCSEs, you can be a successful engineer. In my organisation, I work for lots of people from different backgrounds. I'm assuming half of us are not geniuses, but I don't know when I said that. This is me at 16. I failed my A-level biology mock, and I'm an engineer. Myth. It's a dirty and dusty job. Nah. Actually, I sit in a wonderfully air-conditioned office with breakout areas, teas, and coffees! I've always wanted to be a diva. All engineers are boring white guys. Do I look like a boring white guy? <laughs> Myth, engineers spend a lot of time behind the computer. Thanks. The reality is, my job is actually quite dynamic. One of the reasons I love my job is that I'm always on site. Yes, some of it can be done for your desk, but a lot of it is done by actually going out there and being inspired. However, if you are one of the geeky kinds that spend a lot of time behind a computer screen, you can do that too. Myth. All engineers wear hard hats and high-vis vests. Yes, sometimes I wear my high-vis clothing and my helmet. Some engineers do, some engineers don't. It's not about what you wear, it's about how you think, and I think I look good in orange. Myth. If I study engineering at uni, I'm not going to have a life. Reality. Engineering was not a walk in the park, but having an engineering degree opens a massive amount of doors for you. There will always be opportunities and jobs available once you graduate. If you want to be the next Iron Man, become a mechanical engineer. If you care about people's health, become a biomedical engineer. If you want to go into space, study aerospace engineering. If you want to create stars for a living, become a control engineer. If you love football, be a sports engineer. If you love music, be a computer engineer. If you want to build schools, if you want to save lives, become a civil engineer. If you want to build fast boats, become an apprentice engineer. If you have an interest in the world, engineering is for you. Myth. Da, 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 da. You can't change the world. Oh well. Reality. I'm young, I'm black, and I'm an engineer, and I'm changing the world, and I'm very proud. Hi, I'm Sophie. I guess you want to hear what our schemes are like. So our three-year programme kicks off with a residential event which is called Shaping Your Future. There are two aspects of the training and learning that you'll get through joining us as a graduate. So one side will be your technical learning. You'll be assigned a chartered mentor and they'll be there to help support you achieve all the technical objectives that you need to help support you achieve chartership status with your chosen institution. This can take anywhere up from three to five years, but it's really dependent on each individual. Being in our grad schemes is more than just work. There's a huge range of things that you can be involved in. Every office has a sports and social committee and you can be involved in as much or as little as you want to be. If you're interested in something that the committee doesn't currently do, then you can always put your idea and suggestions forward and start something new. And then secondly, you'll be enrolled into our main graduate programme called Accelerate Your Future. This programme is there to help support you with your soft skills and it's all tailored on the strengths that we've assessed throughout the recruitment process. Therefore, everyone's programme is tailored to specifically suit them. We also support staff to be involved in charity work and do support with fundraising activities. So it's really, really important to us that we focus on the strengths that you have. Our graduate start date tend to be at the beginning of September. However, if you or your future team want to start earlier, then we're happy to discuss that with you. Um, we treat everyone as an individual, so let's have a chat. Working at Monk McDonald is exactly what I was looking for coming out of university. There is a variety in what I do, 
And whilst there may be times which seem challenging at first, there is always the support there you need to help you succeed. There's a real support network here and everyone's always really willing to help, which I found really useful in the early stages of my career. Everyone I've met is uh, extremely friendly, very supportive and has great knowledge in their field. So for someone like me starting off in the industry, it's a great opportunity to learn from these people. I like that, uh, I like the community that we have at Mont McDonald. There's, you know, you've got the small community in your team. And you've also got the wider community uh, across so many different countries. You know, you've got different perspectives on things, but you've also got common goals. And that's what I love about it. As a graduate, this role is everything that I imagined it to be. I am constantly challenged and put in various scenarios which allows me to expand on my own skills and develop the necessary competencies that I need in order to become a Chartered Surveyor. Coming into the role I didn't really have any expectations except that I certainly wasn't expected to work from home for the half the time that I've been here. Luckily the team and wider company gave me lots of support through this and I feel just as comfortable working from home as I did in the office. The job has been a lot of on the job learning and applying what I've learned in my studies to real life situations. Getting put onto real projects right away was really great but it was also quite daunting but then also very rewarding. Uh, so working for Montmartre has actually exceeded my expectations. Uh, the opportunities that have arisen since I've worked for Montmartre already has been brilliant. I didn't expect the amount of opportunities that have already come my way. My favourite project that I've worked on so far has been for a replacement spillway at a reservoir in the Scottish Highlands. It's involved some really interesting structural design work, which we've undertaken closely with a client as we've learnt more about the on-site constraints. I've been able to see how different parts of the project interlink and how different people collaborate with each other um, in order to achieve what we're working towards um, in delivering high speed too. So the experience thus far has been amazing. My favourite project so far has been Queen's Road Depot, where we redesigned the tram depot in Northern Manchester to enable it to have more capacity to store more trams so they could be maintained and upgraded and cleaned. And this was the first project that I saw start to finish. So it was really good to get some experience right from the beginning of the project to the end and see how it evolves over time. A project that I'm currently working on is the Northern Powerhouse Rail Scheme, which is a large rail scheme across the north of England. This project's really interesting as it's allowing me to work with a diverse range of people from a range of disciplines, which not only allows me to build an internal network, but it's also allowing me to gain knowledge and understanding of disciplines which a smaller scale scheme might not allow for. The potential impact that this project has socially and economically for the region has potential to be extreme. So to be able to look back and say that I was a part of the early stage of such a project it's something that I can be really proud of. Can you fix my car? No. Hello everyone. My name is Mimi Isabella and today I have with me Ebony and Minnow. The three of us as a collective are engineers and today we have a jar of questions but they're all related to engineering and we're all very excited to answer. Question one. Are you a genius? No. Absolutely not. I wish. I think that's the thing with engineering as well. People think that you're you have to be insanely clever. And when I say to people, no, I failed my A-levels, and they're like, ah, really? And I'm like, yeah. I mentor a friend that's um, got a degree in criminology, and I'm teaching him how to do web development. And like, he's picked it up so quick. And before, when he'd see me doing stuff, he'd be like, oh, you're so smart. Like, how do you do it? Seeing math, seeing programming, seeing all this, it mm. looks scary. But when you actually like break it down and take time and learn it, you're like, oh, it's easier than what I thought. Are you broke? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. I'm doing well. I'm able to save a certain amount of month. Yeah, you're not mm. broke. <laughs> 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 um, 
I feel like for me, so I work at startups, I am very like underpaid, like ridiculously underpaid. The more experience, it jumps up. No, definitely. It's, an, it's one of the most in demand in the, U, in the UK, isn't it? And it always will be. And it always will be. It's, it's yeah. constant. It isn't going to be a day where they're like, right, we're not using technology anymore. So like, it's, you're always going to need it. You're not really broke because all those experiences and all those skills that you've developed, people can take away materialistic things. Yeah. They can't take what's in your head. That's one thing I've been taught. And that's what my dad said. Yeah. Yeah. My mom said the same. <laughs> Can you fix my car? No. No. <laughs> totally funny story, actually. Um, my mum, the car broke down and when I was at university and I was like, hey, mum, you need to get the car fixed. She was like, oh, yeah, 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 don't worry about it. So I came back home, the car was still broken. And then um, I was like, mum, I might get the car fixed. She said, oh, no, I told one of the neighbours that my daughter's an engineer and she'll fix the car. <laughs> and I was like, hmm, wrong one. If we if we had a go, a little bit of YouTube and a bit of car, yeah. car manuals. I think, we're gonna have a I think we could, yeah. <laughs> Engineering degree, death by study, or inspired choice. When you're at uni, you live with your with, live with your housemates, and then when you hear about their degree and they're doing something completely unrelated, and how much time that they have, and you're like, oh, I'm at uni from nine to five. And you're studying, um, depending if it's whether you're doing your lectures or after, something that inspires you to kind of keep going. And for me, it was always the bigger picture and outside of uni and how much I can contribute to the world. People see sort of like medicine's very straightforward that you can you know, save lives, but they don't know with engineering instead of like tens of lives, you save like millions and thousands of lives. Well, I'm doing a master's now, so I enjoy it. So. <laughs> Do you stand out as a black or brown person in engineering? Yes. As soon as I walk into the room, I'm black. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to be who I am now. And I feel like people have started to appreciate that more, that I'm not trying to be somebody else. I'm just being me and there's nothing that you can do about that. So when people look at me, it's always automatic assumption that I'm like silver spoon fed and like I'm brown and I'm made of money. <laughs> and that is definitely not the case. I grew up on the estate and it has its advantages where you can like, you know, inspire others who probably don't see people like us up there. But yeah, sometimes it is a drawback in itself because you get reduced to those labels. I went to a school where um, I had a police officer that was a member of SAR. <laughs> Um, I thought every school had that because like it would just come and like literally in police uniform his job was to go to our school every single day and be part of the staff. I think coming from a background like that where I'm very working class, I have the skin colour I have and even in my personality I'm not a typical engineer like I care more about like fashion and my hair and my makeup so like there's so many things that put me outside even in my working environment, that yeah. if it was more diverse, I'd just prefer that so much more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd rather be a role model because, like, because of what I do rather than because of how I'm different. Yeah, yeah. but so, that's yeah. what I love about engineering because a lot of people are very multifaceted. So like for me, I love to travel, I love rap music. Like I just, there's so many layers to me. Like engineering yeah. is almost something I just do on the side. It's just nice to show people that you can do it, you can. It's difficult, it's a long road, but it's something that is possible for everybody. You can be an engineer, but you can also be whoever you want to be. And it's great. <laughs> Any moment when you thought you're better off working at McDonald's? I've actually worked at McDonald's before. It's only when it's a really, really, really bad day. And I'm kind of like, I am so stressed. My work is up to here. And my level of knowledge to do that work is down here. So, yeah, and I'm like, damn, if I was at McDonald's, all I've got to do is flip a couple of burgers, have a couple of fries, you want fries with that? And it's not a thought that's at the top of my head every day. It's a struggle, but when you get that breakthrough, oh, that's so sweet. With a startup, there's the pressure of, you know, it's costing the company money. I've had boards come back and I've made mistakes or some things exploded. You know what? I could just work in McDonald's. I could just do this. I could just get a rich husband. Relax, mm -hmm. like literally, and I'm like, I don't need this stress. And then, <laughs> but then you fix it. You have your breakdown over your lunch break. You fix it. And you're like, I love it. I love doing yeah. this. And you're like, this is fabulous. Yeah. You won't make that mistake again. I, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> Any pinch yourself? Is this really happening to me? Moments. My pitching moment was when I was recently um, awarded by the Institution of Civil Engineers, actually. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, it was meant to be like a massive event, like an event, but it was by webinar. So I kind of sat there and I thought, there's really nothing special about me. I'm not going to win this. So when they said Mimi, I was like, wait, what? 
I remember I was shaking after. I was like, oh my God, I just won, I just won. And I ran downstairs mid-meeting. Mum, I won. And then she was like, what, one more? And I was like, yeah. But even when I'm feeling down or I feel a bit of an imposter syndrome, I'm kind of like, okay, but you've been recognised for this. So pick yourself up and keep going. So, yeah. I did a panel talk. At the end, there was a competition for young girls to speak about who inspired them. And there were girls talking about me and my story. I can't believe like they actually find what I do inspiring because like, for me to have, have a degree and move to London and have a good job, it's just like, I kind of just live life on a whim. So for someone else to be like, Evan has inspired me for doing this, this and this, I'm like, ooh, go Evan, Ella, that was you. <laughs> I got really ill in my final year of my university. It got really, really bad. And I had to defer two of my exams. Graduation was not going to happen, apparently. I got a call like a month later, just before results coming out, and they're like, you graduated. I was like, but I haven't done those two exams. And then they were like, oh, you, you've already got a first class, and you've also won this award for the rest of the station, and you've got some money. And I was like, what? I would have heard the money and been like, well. I was, <laughs> I was so shocked. Do blokes make better engineers? No. No. I feel like with men, they're very good at... Um, Pretending. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of them, they'll sit a certain way, they'll wear their suit and then they'll puff up their chest and then they'll really speak in it. And I'm kind of sitting there like, you've just said nothing. Yeah. You've literally that's just it. said nothing. There's less margin for error as a female. So then you end up being better because you're not mm. making their mistakes because you can't. Like, you can't really make the mistakes. So you've got to be a perfectionist. So that is what kind of tips you over the edge and makes you a bit better. They make statements and they go for it. It's like women, we've always had to fight for rights, fight for voting, fight for everything that we have. So we know the value of it more. Mm. What's your top tip for a young person thinking about a career in engineering? Literally just live your best life. Um, I think the more you enjoy it, the better you do. I think if you worry about trying to chase grades, you'll stress yourself out so much. So just literally just enjoy whatever you're doing. Some things you like, some, some things you don't like and just take it easy. Have faith in yourself and just be resilient. If you find something interesting, like it could be anything, there's an engineering for it. So yeah. really, really be open in your options. And that's like my biggest advice, be really, really open. When we were eight years old, we probably weren't thinking of any of this. And now look at where we all are today. So you're definitely right, resilience and just having some faith. Hello and welcome to the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Strathclyde. My name's Chris. And my name is Kubong, and we are both postgraduate research students here. Today, we are going to take you on a tour of our engineering faculty. And introduce you to some of the staff and students along the way to find out why they love to work and study here. Let's get started with the main building, which houses five of the eight engineering departments. As a multidisciplinary department, students have the opportunity to study a range of exciting subjects here from product design to mechatronics and automation and operations management and engineering. It also hosts a number of world leading research centres, including the Advanced Forming Research Centre, an £80 million facility working to advance manufacturing in partnership with companies like Rolls-Royce, Boeing and BAE Systems. The department is well equipped with state-of-the-art equipment and facilities and has one of the UK's only digital design suites which combines virtual and physical design and prototyping. This department, it is about bringing together fundamental research and industry relevant skills within engineering and blending that with the cutting edge knowledge within management. So it's this unique combination of uh, fundamental research which is priced within academia and applied research which is valued by industry and that combination of bringing it together that really works well for this department. Next up in our tour we have the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. The department has a unique combination of expertise, reflected in a portfolio of professionally accredited top programmes, PhD programmes and internationally renowned research. They bring together civil engineering, environmental health, sustainability and environmental studies. They hold an Athena Swan Silver Award for their work in supporting women in engineering. They were the first engineering department in Scotland and one of only three civil engineering departments in the UK to hold the award. Students have access to the department's state-of-the-art multi-million pound labs and a large variety of equipment to help with their studies. Welcome to the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. With over 200 years of experience, 
The department is home to award-winning and internationally recognised research centres spanning energy, aerospace, fluids, structures and materials and all of the programmes are accredited by the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. The department has extensive links with the corporate sector as well as a strong commitment to students. While our worldwide alumni include distinguished industrialists and scholars, Mechanical engineering is a cornerstone subject in engineering. We cover topics from uh, transport, from health, from energy. We have a strong industrial advisory board who help steer the strategy for the programmes and help uh, take our blended learning into practical applications for industry. Welcome to the Department of Chemical and Process Engineering, one of the largest chemical engineering departments in the UK. The department has many years of practical experience in important areas, including advanced chemical processes, process design and safety and environmental protection. All of the department's established programmes are accredited by the Institute of Chemical Engineers and many of the postgraduate programmes are available via distance learning. Students will be taught in labs similar to this one and have access to the department's own dedicated computer suite which is installed with industry standard software. Next we are visiting the Department of Architecture. Their close links with the city's creative design, construction and engineering industries enhance student career prospects by developing innovative approaches and entrepreneurial skills that address contemporary challenges. The department's programmes are closely linked to world-class research, tackling industry, environmental and societal needs in a rapidly urbanising world. Students are given the opportunity to work in association with world-renowned practices as well as the public and private sectors. This allows opportunities to network and engage with professional practitioners, researchers and clients and interdisciplinary teams on live projects. Students come from across the world, creating a dynamic international atmosphere in studios and research groups. The department has specialist facilities and equipment, including two fully networked design studios and their own reference library. Welcome to the Department of Electronic and Electrical Engineering. The department's a really friendly, multicultural community. There are students and staff from over 50 different nations. The department provides a great student experience by combining its research excellence and first-class teaching with business and industry engagement, and all of these feed into its degree programmes. Many students benefit from the department having the largest department scholarship programme in the UK. Companies including Rolls-Royce, BP, Siemens and The Wood Group offer students annual scholarships which are linked to the work experience and summer internships. I always wanted to study in the UK since I was in Nigeria, that's why I did my A-levels back in Nigeria. So when I was searching for schools in the UK that were really good for my course, I saw Strathclyde was in the top 10. I really like the fact that we have a lot of practical stuff and it's not just theoretical, because whatever we learn, we get to practicalise it, which is really nice. And then also the lecturers are quite handy and you also have people helping doing the practicals, which makes it much easier for me. Welcome to the Department of Biomedical Engineering. The department's goal is to transform and improve future healthcare through innovations and advances in science and technology. They focus on improving the quality of life of people with medical conditions that restrict independent living and that enable integration within the community. The department also incorporates the National Centre for Prosthetics and Orthotics and Strathclyde is the only UK university who deliver postgraduate programmes in this field. Strathclyde is one of the pioneers in biomedical engineering, especially in biomechanics. And it's one of the few universities that offer undergraduate course in biomedical engineering. Teaching is so interactive and constructive, and the student support for international students is so well crafted. Finally, let's visit our Department of Naval Architecture, Ocean and Marine Engineering. The department is housed in their own building where the majority of teaching takes place and students have access to impressive facilities including two hydrodynamic tanks. The department is over 100 years old and in that time they've become a key provider of marine technology expertise throughout the UK and across the world. They are carrying research which is supporting industry in a useful and innovative way and staff are internationally recognised for their research. Students come from around the world to study in the department providing a truly international environment. Thank you for joining us on our tour. We hope you've enjoyed visiting our departments and finding out a bit more about our Faculty of Engineering.
this year's design show has been great. It's uh, been a showcase for some really good student projects. It's the fourth time I've judged the design show and it gets better and better every year. Uh, absolutely the highlight has to be the group design project. Um, working with uh, academics at the forefront of their field, uh, my team developed uh, the first microwave neutralizer in Europe and was recently presented to the UK Space Agency. The practical element of the design curriculum is so important here. We actually get students that come in that can use their hands as well as their brains and that's really important to us in industry. So the heart of my course has really been my final year design project. Uh, we've worked on a project that provides safe and economic water to communities in Nigeria, which has been a really rewarding uh, project. We've worked with industry-leading experts such as Takista and also at the university's testing facilities. I think that, that the main reason that uh, Southampton is so successful is that um, the, the links with industry, so that the students are able to work on actual, actual problems and actual applications. I would encourage students to come here because of the help of uh, the professors that helped me develop skills, but also develop me as a better engineer. I'm Anna Gates and I'm studying civil engineering a degree apprenticeship at the University of Exeter. My name is Sam Watson. I am a civil engineer with EDF Energy and I am on a civil engineering degree apprenticeship with the University of Exeter. It was really appealing to me as Exeter is such a good university, um, especially as it's a Russell group. This degree offers me the chance to get five years of experience in the industry and a degree by the end of it. Not only am I avoiding the student loan that comes along with a traditional route. Um, I'm also getting paid for the time that I'm working. So far, I have enjoyed both the degree and the work aspects of this journey that I'm on, and they have been quite tough, but been rewarding as a result. What I'm learning at uni is benefiting what I'm doing at work um, in terms of materials and mechanics. I'm most definitely enjoying my degree friendship, and I would definitely recommend it to everyone. The benefits of doing it are so great, having no debt, um, learning and applying everything that I'm learning and seeing the practicalities of engineering. Also the fact that I'm building a really successful foundation to a, a really successful career is one of the, the greatest advantages of the scheme, so I definitely, definitely recommend it. jam-packed session full of advice and tips 
you guys have been so active in the live chat as well so please please keep that up we're absolutely loving it here aren't we Amanda we are the I, content is great I can't quite believe just how much RS actually do for young people I'm to help them out I think I think they're amazing and if you haven't definitely check them out guys um, and I really hope you enjoyed our um, Tideway sessions as well they are part of our hidden careers sessions and when we say hidden careers I think we mean that quite literally as they are quite literally underground sorting and helping out our to clear our waterways so quite literally hidden careers so definitely check them out as well if that's something that takes your fancy um but yeah please keep up the live chat we're absolutely loving it how interactive you guys are and we have got our panel at three so keep it up and i would like to say a huge thank you to rs um education and rs grass, grassroots and design sports for all of that amazing advice and content um the apprenticeship advice that you gave was excellent as well um i'm sure everybody mm. um, listening at home got a lot out of that and it was really good to hear um, the graduate opportunities from Mott McDonald, who also do, do apprenticeships, as we heard from Jay earlier in the youth panel, which if you did miss it, um, you will be able to catch that up later um, after the event. Um, again, if you did miss it and you've not already registered for the event, we'll be popping the link to register um, in the chat as well. So you can register and we'll send you all of the follow up information from all of the employers that we're working with today that have been showcasing both their apprenticeship opportunities, their sponsored degree programmes, their graduate opportunities, the amazing speakers like Mimi. Oh, my gosh. So charismatic. Awesome, so great yeah. to watch. Um, so we'll be sending that all over to you after the event, if you've registered. Um, it was really good to see the universities as well. Now, I yeah. just want to highlight that is just three universities. I know there's been a lot of chat of where can I do an AI or robotics degree? Um, where can I find out more about that? Then Google, I have to say it, Google is your friend. Uh, do a search uh, for the course that you want to do. It'll bring up all of the universities, usually in the popularity rankings, how it works. But most universities will offer some kind of engineering degree and some universities like Strathclyde that we've just seen there offer so much more in terms of courses. But do just have a search around. So um, coming up, we have got another podcast, so another bit of an eye break for you guys from STEM.org, who work with lots of organisations, employers and young people to raise awareness of working in STEM. And we're going to hear from Helen Watson, who is graduate and is currently working at Arup. So we're going to just pop the agenda back on screen for you guys to um, check out what's coming up. Um, and then we will be from there moving into our live panel discussion with the Royal Air Force, which is going to be great. We're going to hear from uh, firsthand from four people within engineering um, careers at the RAF um, and get their point of view. So please keep your questions coming. They've been brilliant yeah, so far. Absolutely. And we've got the recruitment team at the RAF on hand as well to answer any more recruitment technical questions. So please keep coming them, keeping them in and you can email them. If you don't want to pop them in the chat, you can email them over to us at hello at campusmedia.co.uk and we'll pick them up and we'll try our very best to include them in the thread. So we're, we're going to flash the agenda back up on screen now before going into our next session.
Hello, everybody. Welcome to the STEM Sessions podcast, the UK STEM career podcast. Today, I'm interviewing Helen Watson. So if you please like to introduce yourself, Helen. Yep, my name's Helen. Um, I work for a company called Arup. I am 26 and I am an electrical engineer. Um, I mainly work around buildings engineering um, and I have been doing that for about three years now. Cool, good stuff. So um, we're going to backtrack straight away to um, you know, time at school and things like that. So was there anything that um, inspired you in your school days that got you to where you are today? So it's, it's quite interesting that I feel like I kind of fell into engineering. I was always really interested in how things work and kind of the physics behind things and, you know, looking at investigating what's happening and why things are doing, you know, what why certain things are moving and just the background of how things work, basically. And I really enjoyed maths as well. And those were what I was like good at. I hadn't really thought about what I wanted to do. But I knew I wanted to do something that had a positive impact. I kind of wanted to change the world. It sounds really cheesy, but that's what I wanted to do. And so I then looked at what I was good at, what that lined up with. And I didn't want to do, you know, maths on its own or physics on its own. So engineering was one of the things that kind of joined those sort of passions together. And at the time, it wasn't that big of a deal, climate change, as it is now. But that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to, you know, make things more efficient and, you know, really revolutionise the world, as it were. But yes, yeah, so renewable energy was what I sort of focused on. And reading around that, I decided that electrical engineering was the kind of best way to, to do that. I am now, I think, in a different place to what I expected. But actually, I think I have more impact doing what I do than maybe necessarily designing wind turbines. I think that, you know, I didn't realise how much of a scope there was within engineering to really have a difference on sort of the environment around you. Cool. So it sounds like you had an idea of what you wanted to go into, but it's a bit different to what it is now. So how yeah. is it how is it different? I'd say you've already said how yeah. it's a positive thing. You know, when you think about building design, you just think it's quite like, you know, someone sits there, draws the building then someone else comes and, you know, says, okay, this column needs to be this big. And then someone else comes in and, you know, puts a fan in so that the rooms are air conditioned. And then, you know, they just put cables in to power the rooms. I don't think I appreciated how much scope as engineers we have to impact the design. We're not just doing what people tell us to do. We're constantly pushing and pushing to make it more and more efficient. People don't realize when they're walking around a building, the thought that's gone into the room setups and different configurations of how the engineering systems fit together. And I think that's kind of the point is that you don't want to notice, you know, and if as a human, you notice the engineering systems, then there's something quite wrong with that. We're trying to design stuff that's naturally, you know, it's, it's intu intuitive and you can just use it and you feel comfortable in a space. And I think that has a massive impact as well as making things more efficient and you know that then contributes to the environmental side which is what I was most passionate about but I think you kind of when you think about climate change and especially what I thought you know I thought oh I have to do something renewable you know whether that's designing wind turbines or solar panels and actually I've learned that there's a lot more ways you can be sustainable or implement you know better technologies without using the traditional wind turbine or solar panels on a roof while, and while they're good you know, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. And it's kind of trying to think outside the box about how you can improve what you do. Oh, interesting. So around that climate change topic then, so what things do you do in terms of making sure that a building is as environmentally friendly as it can be? Uh, so a lot of the time, it's kind of a compromise of how people use the building because we could make it perfectly environmentally friendly. But actually, if people aren't going to use the technologies that we put in, whether it's like water harvesting, rainwater harvesting, or daylight dimming in lights, then it's pointless because, so um, we look at lights as a lot of a technology that we can adapt. So you can have a lot of different setups. So you can have sensors around the edge of a building where all the windows are to detect natural daylight. And if it's a really sunny day, you don't need your lights on as brightly. So they'll either turn off or dim down so that, you know, you can still see fine. You know, you can still do your job, whatever it is, but you're saving energy that way. But we found that sometimes people put blinds down. So it's a really interesting balance of trying to balance human behavior 
with the technologies. But yeah, so the light one is a huge one. Again, the same thing with like automatic switching. So having presence or absence detection. So if someone's not in the room or, you know, they've walked in and turned the lights on and forgotten to turn them off as they leave, having that set up. And then also just using more efficient equipment. So whether it's like your switch gear and cables, you can get a lot of power loss just in transmitting the power from the cable that comes in the street from the utility to actually where you're going to plug your phone in or your computer. So it's making sure that there is as fewer losses as we can get while still making, you know, making sure that there's enough power going to whatever you're going to do because you don't want to plug things in and then find that actually, you know, you're tripping the fuse every time. So uh, it's, yeah, it's a really interesting balance. Of What's your role specifically in terms of the technologies that you've spoken about? Yeah, so um, I do I do the design. We work with architects, and I also work with you know other engineers, so mechanical, structural, public health, and basically we'll just do the building design. Sometimes it depends on how it's set up. So we might be working for architects, we might be working for a separate client, the owner of the building, and we'll be given a package of work, and they'll just say, "Go away and please design us a building." Yeah, basically what it is. Um, as an electrical engineer, I am responsible for the power that comes in. So um, taking the power from the street, whatever voltage that comes in at. So if we do bigger sites, we have to put in substations and transformers and big bits of kit to sort of step the voltage down so that, you know, you're not going to stick your finger in a plug and electrocute yourself. Backup power. So do we need generators on site? Do we need a thing called a UPS, which is an uninterruptible power supply? So when we do buildings like data centers or manufacturing plants, if the power goes off for like a second, the machines just freak out and they can't handle that kind of dip in power. So the uninterruptible power supply is basically like a huge battery that also filters the power. So it basically means that if we have a power cut or there's like an issue with the supply, it's, you know, there's some fluctuations in the power that will kind of ride out and make sure that the machines are not damaged. And then the generator can start up and back up the rest of the building. I'm responsible for lighting design. So sometimes we do work with lighting designers if they're doing something particularly fancy, so sort of foyers and like a big atrium space, something like that. Um, but most rooms we would, um, as an electrical engineer, I would do that. So it's making sure that there's enough light, it's uniform enough, and also there's enough emergency lighting. So if there is an issue with the power, you need to be able to see to get out the building so there's a you know a minimum level that is you know legally required i also do fire alarm and detection design so what kind of smoke detection or fire detection systems in a building are going to be installed and where are they going to be installed making sure that it's all compliant also earthing and lightning protection so yeah, basically protecting the building if it's going to get struck by lightning. Yeah, there's lots of different <laughs> elements, um, which I really enjoy because it means my job's quite varied. So, you know, even though you're designing a building, it might be the same. I get to look at lots of different elements of the design. You know, if, even if I'm just doing lighting, there's still so many aspects of, you know, of, of what goes into lighting a room that I find it really interesting. Yeah, that's amazing because people will probably would initially think that that's something that's very niche and very specific, but actually there's so much variety in what you do. It's uh, it's incredible. And as you say, it's all things that people don't necessarily always think about at the forefront, but that's that's by design. Yeah. That's that's yeah. an example of good engineering. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is awesome. <laughs> incredible. So is there a project or something you're working on currently that you're really proud of at the moment? I am working on the design for a new mental health hospital in southwest London. And that's really interesting. And I think, you know, I really enjoy projects that, you know, actively help societies. And I also really enjoy doing lots of different types of buildings because they operate in such different ways. So we got to, we talked to the nurses that would be running the wards to find out, you know, actually, how are you going to be turning these lights on and off? And they said that they had some corridor lights and they had some floor lighting and then some ones in the ceiling. And they wanted those to be split onto different switching circuits so that when in the middle of the night, when they're doing their checks, they can have the lower, the floor lighting so they can still see and they can see in the rooms, but actually they're not going to be waking people up because there's too much light going into the rooms from the overhead lights. So 
it's things like that that I think are really enjoyable you know you get to speak to people and find out you know actually what can I do to help you in your job yeah but yeah that's, that's yeah. been one of the interesting ones it's incredible I don't think necessarily many people would think about that as well in terms of you're actually speaking to your end users there yeah I think that's really important i uh, really important because you know if you're going to design a building but people hate it it might look so pretty and be so technologically advanced but if actually if it's a pain to go in and work in every day you know it's not going to be it's not good it's not beneficial for them the owner ultimately is going to find that people aren't wanting to rent the spaces out if it's like an office space or something that's being let you know it's it's not good for anybody in the system so is there any part of your role in particular as well that you would say is your standout favorite oh um it's really tricky I think one of the projects I worked on first kind of on my own was a big standout one for me because especially I've done a lot of mega projects. So uh, working on an underground railway system with train stations and the tunnels catching them. And there was a huge team of us and, you know, we all had our little roles, but I was very much part of a team working for someone and, you know, just being kind of told like, uh, can you handle this? Can you handle this? And while that was great, it was still enjoyable. I worked on a very small restaurant that was kind of, you know, only like four rooms, very open plan, but I did everything because it was so small. And I think the first time I actually was like, you know, I have designed this. I have done all of these systems. I have this particular sense of pride that, you know, I can, I can do this. (laughs) And, (laughs) And also it's now been built and it's people are using it and it's in London. So I can go and have a look at it and see people using it. And just seeing people in the space is just so so rewarding because it's kind of like oh yeah I did that yeah. and yeah it's just really nice to see yeah it's something that you've you've created and yeah. it's now being used you know within yeah. society by people which yeah. is it's amazing yeah. <laughs> so after school and that kind of initial period where you'd discovered your real passion for maths and you found that that route um, where did you go next? Did you go through university? Or? Yes, so I went to university. I went to the University of Birmingham and I studied electrical and energy engineering. I think that course was great because I got to do the core electrical engineering, but I also did some modules of energy engineering, which covered different engineering subjects. So I did a bit of chemical engineering, a bit of mechanical and a bit of material science. And that was really kind of looking at sustainable technology. So it kind of showed me how engineering can cross over and really got some my energy passion kind of really kicked off and was there anything that you did that was aligned to engineering outside of your studies at your time at university i actually that was where i first became a, a sort of ambassador so my university had um, a few programs where they were outreach programs so i started working with them um working and we went to we developed like a class for school children to kind of help them understand about the power issues and how you know it's not just as easy as building you know a massive wind farm um out in your garden um you know because that would oh it would be great everyone would be mad because you'd have these really noisy wind turbines in your back garden um so I, I set up that and I got to go around to some schools and sort of show that off um and we they also were involved in the first Lego League. Um, which is like a project uh, where they were building robots out of Lego and they had to do little challenges. Um, So I got to go and help out at some of the competition days there. And yeah, I think it was just really nice to see kind of what people can do when they're faced with a little challenge and some blocks of Lego and yeah, off they go. Awesome. So you've been a STEM ambassador for quite a while now. Yeah, I have. Yeah. I think it's really enjoyable and like it's, It's almost more rewarding than going and seeing my buildings in real life because I'm just constantly surprised at how creative children are and like creative in an engineering way. Because when I tell them I'm an engineer or electrical engineer specifically, they think of the person that comes around to your house and, you know, fixes, uh, you know, whatever's gone wrong, you know, the the sockets or whatever. And and while that is, you know, part of a part of engineering, it's, it's, you know, there's so much other stuff and, you know, I am not, you know, in a hard hat and dirty boots all day. I'm mostly sat in an office. So I think it's really interesting to see their reaction when they find out how broad engineering is. Is there anybody that you would say has really inspired you in terms of your career journey so far? So I had a project manager um, on, so we were working on a project in the Middle East 
and there was a huge team of women and all of the project managers and sort of sub managers were basically women I think we had maybe like two men out of like seven which is very uncommon in the engineering world even like now I mean it's definitely getting better but um it's still very much a male dominated field and she was just incredible she knew exactly what was going on she was really approachable um and she just was able to connect with everyone in the team and really bring us together so you know she she had a her eye on the ball on everything she still managed to every day come around pretty much and be like how you're doing does anyone have any issues but also you know was very technically advanced and you know on top of all the issues that were coming up and she's just been one of those people that anytime I've had an issue she's always she always makes time for me that's great and I'm also picking up there from what you say in terms of how she's operating how she's inspired you that there's a real balance there and real mix of technical skills but also that emotional intelligence yeah. and, and soft skills yeah. and, and being able to relate to people I think people kind of forget with engineering that it's a very big team. You know, no, I, I've never done any project where I have been the only person on my own. You know, at minimum, there's like, you know, five because you've got a structural engineer, an architect, electrical, mechanical, and PH. And then, you you know, that's that's only the five people. You probably have more, a project manager, maybe the client, you know, you you have to work with so many people and if you can't work well with people, you really struggle. And it makes your job harder because we're constantly fighting for space in buildings. You know, I want to put my equipment there, but so does the mechanical engineer. So we're always having these coordination debates. And if you can't work as a team properly, it doesn't make your design uh, work well. You have to be very technical. You know, yes, it does have to work, but part of it is that, that you know it's going to work in a lot of different configurations you just have to find the best one and that is very much team-based and that personable skills yeah i think that actually that really shows as well in the example that you've given earlier um with the hospital yeah. in the sense that as you said you could develop the most amazing um you know technologically yeah. brilliant building but if it's not going to be you know happy or it's not going to generate a happy work environment for the people that ultimately use yeah. it that that's the people element of engineering um that yeah is yeah. fundamental i think engineering is so people-based like i can't think of any engineering examples where it doesn't come back to people you know whether it's building like hs2 the railway people are going to be using that to travel around you know designing a plane people are going to be traveling on it, it everything kind of engineering comes back to people so if you start with people, you can't go wrong. Do you have an idea of where you want to take your career next? So I do I do want to stay in the same field. I you know, I still want to do buildings. I just really enjoy doing a variety of buildings. I'm always kind of asking what's going on, what different types of buildings we're getting like projects in in the office, you know, what I can get involved with. Coming up, um, I've been doing a bit of work for a science lab and there's another hospital in central London that's going through an upgrade that I'm about to start sort of really getting involved in and that's quite challenging because it's it's an existing building um as you know London's quite packed in so we can't really like make new rooms so and we've also got to not remove anything existing before we put the new stuff in because it's a hospital so there's people on you know life support etc so those are the kind of short-term things yeah in the long run I think I just want to keep doing the same thing but but better uh, you know doing more sustainably you know I've, sometimes we come across like cost issues that you know, people run out of money so they can't put the solar panels on the roof because they're too expensive and you know little things like that getting you know getting knocked off the design um so I want to find ways to make my design better but also cheaper and more sustainable so I'm not I'm not one for like big planning and I think sometimes especially like when you kind of look at careers stuff it's all like someone's got a life plan of, you know, exactly when they want to be promoted and, you know, by the age of whatever I want to be doing X, Y, Z. And I very much flying by the seat of my pants quite a lot of the time and just like, if you enjoy it, keep doing it. And, you know, if you're, you know, as long as there's no sort of major issues with it, you know, it's not miles away and, you know, it's not like a really tricky job, then yeah, just keep doing what you enjoy and 
yeah I think you know if in three years I find that I I'm not enjoying it anymore uh, there's so much more I can do with my engineering skills that I'm not worried that I won't have a job but you know I'll find something else and then uh, I'll learn to love that so yeah just keep doing what you love I think is what I'm going to do you want to remain adaptable as well you don't want to yeah be so dead set on a plan and I think you know you can only you can you can see if you get your plan great you'd be happy but if you don't get it you'd be so upset about it whereas if I don't have a plan I can't be upset by not meeting it um so yeah but you know I think that engineering is still such a good career to go in that I'm not worried and I don't regret doing it thank you very much for coming in and it was um absolutely great to speak to you and uh yeah yeah I, that I wish, was you all yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wish you all yeah. the best thank you okay thank you Thanks for listening and thanks again to Helen. Helen is actually the second electrical engineer that we've had here on STEM Sessions. First one being Alex Sokol, who is an electrical engineer who works on the production of wind turbines. If you like this episode, be sure to check out that one too, as it shows another side of electrical engineering. This is Tunnel Vision, Tideway's brand new channel dedicated to bringing you behind the scenes on London's new super sewer. My name's Taylor Gill and I'm part of the team building London's Super Sewer. Right now, London relies on a 150-year-old sewer system built for a population less than half its current size. It was designed by Sir Joseph Bazalgette for 4 million people. Today, though, there are nearly 9 million people living in London. That system, despite being in remarkably good condition, simply cannot cope. When it rains, even just a bit, that rainwater floods the sewer system, mixes with raw sewage and spills directly into the River Thames. Anything that goes down the toilet in London could well end up in this river. That's where Tideway comes in. We're building a giant sewer tunnel to intercept those nasty overflows and clean up our river. We have 24 construction sites stretching from Acton in West London all the way out to Abbey Mills pumping station in the east. And they're all connected in one way or another to the super sewer, a 25 kilometer, 7.2 meter wide tunnel that will clean up this river. With a huge team of world-class engineers from all corners of the globe, we're cleaning up the Thames for its inhabitants, its wildlife, and for you. Victoria Embankment, stretching from Blackfriars Bridge to Westminster, was built to house Basil Jet's sewer system. We're building on that legacy by creating seven new areas of public space. Each month on Tunnel Vision, we'll show you how we're getting on. We'll show you the sites, some of the amazing engineering, as well as the people working on this project. Later, we'll show you our tunnel boring machines, giant diggers we're using to create the tunnel itself. But we're going to start by looking at Blackfriars, one of the most important sites on the Tideway project. Slap bang in the heart of London, in a part of the city rich with history. This site is officially known as Blackfriars Bridge Foreshore, and it's here for a very specific reason, the River Fleet. The River Fleet is a tributary of the River Thames. There are lots of these in central London, but most of them have been built over. We call these London's Lost Rivers. Right here, beneath Blackfriars Bridge, is where the River Fleet meets the Thames. You can't see it from the street, but many years ago, the Fleet was a decent-sized tributary. Merchants, especially from the coal industry, would use it for transport. In fact, if you walk a few minutes north of Blackfriars Bridge, you'll find a small side road called Old Sea Coal Lane. As London grew, more and more of the Fleet was built over. Sir Joseph Bazalgette, the mastermind behind London's sewer network, even used it, along with many other lost rivers, as part of his drainage network. Today, all that's left of the River Fleet is that discharge point in the River Wall. In a typical year, the Fleet CSO discharges more than half a million tonnes of raw sewage directly into the Thames. Let's go and meet the team at Blackfriars to find out some more. sites have a very similar role or purpose which is to redirect these outflows to the treatment works at Beckton uh, where the sewage is then treated and then runs through the system all over again. Blackfriars is one of the larger sites on the Tideway project but we have added 
complication which is that we're in the centre of London so being able to shut down roads or do anything in the centre of London is very hard to achieve. The biggest problem that we have is the Blackfriars Bridge here. Uh, one of the sewage outflows runs under the bridge. Uh, we need to redirect that water to our shaft which leads into the tunnel. So we proposed an idea where basically we would build our structure in essentially what's a dry dock, uh, which is our coffer dam, uh, and then we will open it up once it's built and we will float it into its position, uh, where then it will be able to redirect that water to the shaft and into the main tunnel. For today's operation, we've built this in situ concrete culvert that we're floating out to, to connect to the river wall to, to divert the flow from the fleet and on and into the, into the shaft. It's about 100 metres long, 1,200 cubic metres of concrete, weighs 3,700 tonnes. The reason we had to float out the culvert is that the piling, the coffer dam here could come no further east because of the constraints of the Waterloo and City line which, which runs under where we're, we're standing at the moment. And as well as that, then you couldn't pile under the under the bridge because of the headroom. You couldn't get the piling rigs in the bridge, in under under there. So we had to um, remove the soft material from the riverbed, uh, backfill it with stone and a concrete mattress, and then and prepare it then to lay down this floated this floated structure on top of it. So it just lays on the riverbed. Everybody here just works and pulls together. It's a fantastic fantastic site. It's very very complex and. Uh, you know, it's testament to the lads here that the, the success of today's operation, the floating of the culvert and now bringing it out tonight, it's, you know, it's a great achievement. Everything worked very smoothly, there was no hiccups, went exactly as planned. It's, it's opening up a load of work now, we have to, two more in situ culverts to build in the coffer dam and then the shaft to sink, to finish the sinking off and yeah, it's, it's all go. So that's Blackfriars, just one piece of the Tideway puzzle. Tideway is massively expanding London's sewer network and to do this, we're using six giant tunnel boring machines, or TBMs as we call them on site. Belgian engineer Henry Joseph Maus invented the first hard rock tunnel boring machine back in 1845. Around the same time, Marc Brunel developed the shield concept, a technique quite literally groundbreaking to provide a much needed structure to protect his men from cave-ins during excavation of the first ever tunnel underneath the River Thames. Fast forward to 2020 and the tunnel boring machine has evolved into a gargantuan feat of mechanical engineering. They make digging tunnels much easier by using mechanics rather than pickaxes, but the core principles still owe a debt to Mouse and Brunel. TBMs are now up to four times faster than the archaic drill and blast methods, and most TBMs are bespoke, designed to suit specific project specifications. So the cutter head of the TBM has different types of teeth on it to help excavate the muck. We've got rippers around the edge, we've got scrapers through the middle, and you can see there's a kind of bit jutting out in the middle, that's the nose cone. Up to 25 crew members can be needed to operate a TBM at any given time, and our machines will work around the clock, excavating up to 8 metres per day. Transporting a TBM to one of our sites involves many logistical complexities and the scale of engineering expertise needed to execute it successfully can't be overstated. Take for example TBM Selina, who was delivered to our Chambers Wharf site earlier this year. Selina was delivered using a giant vessel called the Skylift 3000, travelling over 800 kilometres via waterways from the port of Kiel in Germany. Selina will dig out the final 5.5 kilometre stretch of London's 25 kilometre super sewer. Finally on Tunnel Vision, we took to the streets to find out how much Londoners know about Tideway and how much sewage they think goes into their river. Would you go for a swim in the River Thames? No, I would not. No. Why wouldn't you? Because it's full of sewage. I just would be concerned about the amount of stuff that's in the Thames. Yeah. What sort of stuff? Oh, God, you know what people are like. I think about it, especially in these temperatures. No. <laughs> uh, possibly. No, no, I've never thought it was clean enough. No. no. 
Uh, never. I would, I've never thought about it. I don't think I'd do it. But on a day like today, I guess I would. I'd probably dip the toes in, maybe. Yeah, I just wouldn't do it because I know it's contaminated. <laughs> Give me a guess how many toilet flushes a year you think end up in the River Thames. Untreated toilet flushes into the Thames every year. Um. 500 million. 500,000. I don't know. It's a lot. 100 million. A million. A million? 10 million? I'm... Would it shock you if I said 8 billion toilet flushes a year end up in the River Thames? Ooh, OK, that's, that's, that's horrible. That's icky. That's very icky. 8 billion. 8 billion toilet flushes. Nobody wants to swim in that. Do you know that there is actually a super sewer being built underneath the river? I did, yeah. yeah. Uh, I did hear that, that there was a tunnel being built to uh, try and get it clean, yes, yeah, so I was aware of that. I did not know that. I've heard of rumours of some big tunnel going under the river, but I don't know too much about it. Yeah, I have heard of it, yeah. No, no. no. Sewer or something? Yeah. There's a super sewer. We have a fan. See, this is what kills us. No one's heard of it. It's because it's underground. But check it out. Tunnel vision. It's on YouTube. We'll do tunnel vision. Tunnel vision. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed that last podcast and understanding a little bit more about Tideways London. Pretty incredible. It's all going on underground. We didn't even realise. Um, but I'm joined now. We're moving into the Royal Air Force live session. And I'm joined with our panel live, um, who, as you can see all on screen, we have got Engineer Officers Wing Commander Manjeet Gator Aura, Flight Lieutenant Abby Addison, Flight Lieutenant Margaret Welton, and Sergeant Siobhan Bramley, who's a weapons technician. So hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for your questions that everybody at home has been sending in. We've got so many uh, aircraft enthusiasts there, and there's lots of technical questions about aircraft maintenance and engineering that is way over my head. So I'm hoping you guys can answer some of those questions for me as well. Um, but before we go into the live questions, I think it's really good that everybody at home sees a little bit more about you and your background and your journey so far. So we're going to show uh, a short VT now of each of you, uh, and then we'll be joining back in to answer some of these amazing questions that have been coming in for you. Roll VT, please, Lee. Hi, I'm Wing Commander Manjit Katura and I've now served over 21 years as an engineering officer in the Royal Air Force. 
I've actually served both sides. So we have two disciplines, the aero system side and the communications electronic side. But why did I join up? The reason I joined has to go back to my childhood because actually my father served 28 years himself. Uh, he was a survival equipment fitter, so he looked after helmets, um, parachutes and G-suits, anything really that would keep the pilot alive. But um, it wasn't until going to school, I suppose, that um, I started getting the bug for aviation. And I joined the after, after school um, craft design technology club and started flying, making and flying my own radio control planes, which I still do now. So, so as a child, um, I also joined the Air Training Corps, which is a great organisation that's still going strong now. And there I learned map reading and shooting um, and learning about leadership as well. But um, the one thing I do remember is that uh, it enabled me to go solo in gliders um, two weeks before I was even old enough to drive a car. Um, but that sort of gave me the bug and it sort of taught me a little bit more for myself about the Royal Air Force. After I finished school, I went off to, to do my degree and I had to study for an aerospace engineering degree at so the University of Hertfordshire. I also did a sandwich year, so I did a year in industry for a company called Best of Bell Aviation as a trainee design engineer. And uh, I had an absolutely fantastic time and even though I still had a year at university to go, uh, they even offered me a job and gave me a bonus. But I, I had to scratch the itch and I always wanted to join the Air Force and so in November 99 I joined up. Um, haven't looked back since really. So what is it about being in the Royal Air Force that I enjoy? Well to be honest with you it's a lifestyle thing so yes I need to be um, I need to understand about engineering standards and practices um, and I need to know about the latest technologies because we are constantly changing and evolving because our adversaries don't stop either so it's great to be involved in the latest technologies that are going on but it's more than that because as as an engineering officer I need to be a leader of people and uh, one of the finest jobs that I did was the, being a senior engineering officer on, uh, on the C-17 fleet um, on 99 Squadron where I had over 300 people um, to look after. Highly skilled engineers and, and our task was to make sure that everything was brought home from Afghanistan, people and equipment, safely and on time. Um, that's uh, definitely a, a high spot in my career. But being an engineering officer in the Air Force isn't just about engineering. Actually, it's a way of life as well. The social aspect is, is uh, um, second to none. Um, going in on dining in nights, celebrating the Battle of Britain, you can't get that anywhere else. The adventurous training side um, is definitely something that, um, that, that sparked my interest as well. So I've been skiing all over the world, I've been scuba diving, and uh, I'm standing in the hangar at the moment where I'm trying to learn how to fly these things behind me. But some things are away from my normal day-to-day -day job, and I'm extremely privileged to be one of the judges on the Professional Engineering Institute's Churchill Medal Award, and that's an award that's given to the best engineer um, across the Army, Navy and the Air Force. That's, but one of the things I love doing as well um, is a bit of STEM. So I love going back to schools now. Um, unfortunately, the, the lockdown stopped all that. Um, but I, I normally go to my local school one day a week and uh, we run little STEM activities there. And from there, I've also become one of the LEGO Robotics Challenge judges as well. And that's so much fun. Being an engineering officer in the Royal Air Force is quite different to working in civilian industry. At the end of the day, it's our responsibility to make sure that we have the air and space power to protect our nation. But we also get the chance to travel the world and work with other coalition countries to provide stability um, for the future. Just recently, one of the highlights was when I received my operational U4 medal in Bosnia from a two-star Austrian Major General. And all my medals I wear with absolute pride and I'm absolutely proud to serve. I'm a flight lieutenant and an engineer officer in the Royal Air Force. I'm going to tell you my story and give you a snapshot of what your life could be like too if you decide to join the Royal Air Force. But first, we just need to check that you like these. Aircraft. This is a pair of Hercules C-130 aircraft flying in formation at low level over the countryside. But we'll get back to those later. My story starts when I was 15 years old on something a little bit smaller. I was part of the Air Cadet organisation whilst I was in secondary school 
and through this I was able to do a scholarship and go solo on my 16th birthday in one of these gliders. Due to being a goody two-shoes at school, I got decent grades and I was able to get a scholarship from the Air Force for two years. They sent me to boarding college where I was able to study maths, physics and chemistry. And then I was able to get a further three years of sponsorship throughout the whole of my university place at this fabulous institution. I don't know quite how I managed to fit it all in, but I spent a significant proportion of my winter holidays skiing with the Royal Air Force and even a month over summer on exchange at the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado. And three years later, I left with a first class honours degree in mechanical and materials engineering. I joined initial officer training based at RAF Cranwell in Lincolnshire straight after I finished university. And after a large amount of time standing in very neat lines next to my colleagues, it was time to graduate and march off the parade square as an officer. And of course you get to invite your family and friends along so they can watch the parade and celebrate the special day with you. So now that I'd spent nine months learning how to be an officer in the Royal Air Force, getting really physically fit and learning about air power, it was time for me to undertake my Engineer Officer Foundation training. For this nine month course, I moved to RAF Cosford in Wolverhampton. Another training course meant another graduation when I could be joined by my friends and family to help celebrate. Here we are. The grand old age of 23, I've done three years of university and 18 months of Air Force specific training and I'm ready to be unleashed onto the world as an engineer. I moved to RAF Wittering in Cambridgeshire and I was in charge of a team of 80 engineers. We fixed and maintained a large fleet of specialist vehicles, everything from Land Rovers through fire engines, fuel vehicles, up to heavy haulage trucks that were used by other units in the Royal Air Force. One of the many benefits of having your own office as an officer in the Royal Air Force is being able to get a puppy and bring him to work with you. This is Monty. Yes, that's the RAF newspaper, and no, he's not supposed to be eating it. It's quite usual to move around in the Royal Air Force every two to three years. So after a couple of years at RAF Wittering, it was time for me to move to RAF Bryce Norton in Oxfordshire and take my position as a junior engineer officer on a flying squadron. On this flying squadron, I had engineer responsibility for just under 100 personnel. They were avionics technicians and mechanical technicians. They were maintaining and fixing the aircraft on a daily basis, fitting roll equipment, refueling the aircraft and making sure the aircraft were always available to go flying. After a couple of months on the squadron, I had a big assessment board which lasted all afternoon, where the senior engineers on the squadron had to satisfy themselves that I was competent to do my job. I knew the aircraft systems inside and out and I was able to sign off the aircraft for flight. This was a really big career milestone and achievement for me because holding these engineering authorisations was something that I've been working towards ever since I joined the Royal Air Force. It was a really busy few years of day shifts and night shifts where Monty got to come to work with me again and two deployments to Operation Shader with a small team of engineers that I was in charge of. I even managed to fit in some battlefield tours to Northern France with the team of engineers that worked on the squadron with me. We're over a decade in. I've climbed mountains in England, Scotland and Wales. I've skied down mountains in France, Austria and Germany. I've jumped out of planes over the Mona Dam in Germany. I've played hockey, netball, done personal fitness, all with the Royal Air Force. So I'm knocking on a bit now, nearly 30. So I decided it was time for one of these, and then another one of these. The Air Force is really unique as an employer. When I first joined, I signed on for an 18 year contract. And because of that, the Air Force allowed me to take two years of maternity leave with a one year career break in the middle. So I was able to stay at home for three years looking after my babies. Now I'm back in the Royal Air Force after three years off and I've been able to use all my previous engineering experience to get my incorporated engineer status with the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, which is a really big career step for me. I've been all over the world with the Royal Air Force. I'm currently working towards my masters and I just can't wait to see what the next 10 years holds for me. 
My name is Flight Lieutenant Margaret Welton. I'm an Aerosystems Engineer Officer in the Royal Air Force. I joined the military in 2003 and qualified as an aircraft technician in 2005 with authorizations to work on some helicopters, unmanned aerial systems and some air systems. Fast forward 2019, I commissioned into the Royal Air Force as an Aerosystems Engineer Officer. Upon completion of initial officer training in area of Cranwell, I went to area of Cosford where I completed my engineering officer foundation training. Since then, I've been posted to the Air Test and Evaluation Centre at MOD Boscombe Down and currently occupying the position of a rotary wing desk officer in the Continuing Air Weatherness Management Organisation. This year, I would be 18 years in the British Forces. Prior to joining, I had just completed my secondary education and was waiting to go to medical school. However, I changed my mind because I wanted to work in the aviation industry and also I wanted an adventurous lifestyle. So I decided to go for the military because it did promise all that and it has not disappointed. Because I didn't have any prior engineering or technical skills, I decided to join the apprenticeship route so that I was able to learn on the job and earn whilst on the job and I was able to further my education and learn all the important skills that will help me become a really good aircraft technician and eventually an engineer officer. You're able to build up on your qualifications such that I was able to um, complete University of Portsmouth and came out with first class degree in engineering and management studies. Aside engineering, one of the things that really attracted me to the forces was the fitness and the sporting opportunities that we have in the organization. Once I went through the initial officer training, I found within myself the ability that I had never discovered prior. So I decided to embark on an ultra marathon training and in 2020, I ran my first ultra marathon distance of 51 kilometers in under seven hours. For a sprinter, I think that is really um, a big improvement. So this year, I'm looking forward to running 100 kilometers in under 16 hours as a personal challenge. And whilst doing that, I'll raise a little bit of money on the side for charity. While seven, I've had the opportunity to live in a different country for over four years with my family. And we've managed to work in a multicultural environment work in a multinational environment, working with different people and then understanding them and taking some of the good things they do and then building our own systems and also teaching them some of the good things that we know. If you are looking for a technologically advanced organization, then I would suggest that you look at the area because from the news, you see all the different and latest technological kits that we are getting and it is really interesting to work on them. If problem solving really interests you, then look no further because as an engineer, I've had the opportunity to design and create prototypes of two solutions to two different aircraft, which later on went to the project team for consideration to be implemented into the air systems when it was required. When it comes to family, I am a married woman with three children. I've had all my children while serving. And any time when I've been posted, I've had the opportunity to move with my family. We get accommodation wherever we go, which is most of the time really close to the workplace. So you don't have to travel so far to get to work. As a female, I have no worries about pay disparities at all. As long as I am the same rank as somebody else and we are, on the same, we are in the same stage and we've done the same things, we are expected to be paid the same. Whenever I've moved around, I have made new friends either in the service or as civilian friends, because when you move up about, you get the opportunity to meet people. So some of my best friends I have made whilst traveling about and whilst doing my normal job. One of the career highs I've enjoyed is when an invitation was sent to me to meet with the prime minister at number 10 Downing Street as we celebrated Black History Month. Whilst there, I met really interesting people and it was a truly good day. If leadership really interests you, then look no further from the Royal Air Force because going through training, we are taught the principles of leadership. We get to practice it, we get to teach it, and we get to learn from other people. So if you want to inspire someone with yourself, if you want to inspire someone with the things that you do, 
and with your um, technical knowledge and abilities, then by all means, look no further from us. I would recommend the Royal Air Force to anybody who is looking for a long-term career, who is looking to go into the engineering field and want to serve their country and people. Anybody who is interested in sporting activities or adventure training, anybody who is interested in making a difference wherever they go and learning and earning money and anybody who is interested in developing themselves educationally and developing themselves as a person. If you are looking to make lifelong friends and you are looking to really improve your environment then by all means come and join us and also if you are thinking of having a family by all means you can do it in the military so just come over. Next time, when you take your Internet Explorer or you go past an AFCO, be sure to look for roles in the Royal Air Force and look for roles in the engineering branch. Hello, my name is Siobhan Bramley and I'm a weapons technician in the RAF, one of the many engineering branches. I've been in the RAF for about 30 years. Quite a long time, a lot of people might say, but I thoroughly enjoyed my time. My job is incredibly varied. I get to work on all sorts of different equipment. I've worked on aircraft weapon systems, bombs, rockets, missiles, ejection seats that contain explosives to allow the pilot to escape from the aircraft. And I'm also a qualified bomb disposal operator. In fact, I've even worked on an unexploded ordnance from the Second World War, just round the corner from my house. And I'm able to point that out to my children and say, mommy did that something I'm incredibly proud of. So when I was at school, I went to an all-girls school and the majority of girls that I went to school with wanted to be hairdressers, some wanted to be models, and one even wanted to be a tennis coach. But I wanted to do something different. At the time, a lot of people were saying, women can't do that, you're not strong enough. And I'm here to prove them wrong. I went out and I did it and I've never looked back. Being a female within the RAF and in a trade that's got a lot of men in it, people think that it's going to be quite scary. Oh my gosh, all those men, they're going to be quite hard on you. But that really hasn't been my experience. I've gained a lot of brothers, uncles and a few surrogate fathers ready to tell me, I don't think you should do that. No, I don't think you should get a tattoo. Yes, I will help you with your car, but I'm going to show you how to do it, which has been great. I've changed brake lines on my car, I've changed brakes, I've removed my fuel tank system and all of that with their help so that I'm able to be independent, to be able to look at things and say, actually, I can fix that. I don't need to pay somebody to do it. Quite a funny moment was when I even stopped at the side of the road and helped a man to change the tire as he had the little booklet out for his car. It really does make me chuckle. So being in the RAF, we are part of one big family, as I already alluded to, lots of brothers and sisters out there as well, which means that when you go out and you travel, you're having new experiences with lots of different people. I've been horse riding in Italy. I've climbed Mount Vesuvius while we were out there working. And to be able to share that with my friends who I work with has been absolutely amazing. I've played netball and volleyball in Germany lived out in Cyprus and did some kneeboarding, been to lots of different theme parks in America. I can definitely recommend Six Flags, Canada, dolphins in Oman, swimming with those, so many different experiences. And to be able to do that with the people that you work with, make them even more special. People quite often ask you, what is your proudest moment? And I've had so many moments in the RAF. Sometimes it's difficult to think about. I've got two children and they'll always be the thing that I'm most proud of. But when you think about the different things that you have done, be it attending the Afro-Caribbean War Memorial that was launched out in Brixton and being part of that, coming from a Caribbean heritage, that was an incredibly important moment to me. When I attended number 10 and met Theresa May, the Prime Minister at the time and quite a few other people, that was, really was an amazing achievement. But the thing that I'm most proud of is gaining my degree at Distinction with the help of the REF during a time when I was getting ready to work out of area away from my family. But also my father died in the same year. 
to have that support was really amazing. So with all these different experiences that I've had, and I hope that that's inspiring you to try and do the same thing, it's something I'm really passionate about. I currently work in recruiting to inspire other young women out there and men as well, but especially young women to get into engineering, to learn about how things work and to be independent. So if you want to find out more, please search RAF Recruitment, have a look on YouTube and at some of the videos that we have out there. We're on Twitter and Instagram as well. Pop into your local AVCO. There really is a lot of the different things that you can do as an engineer. Welcome back everybody. Um, it was so good to watch those um, clips of everybody. Um, I really enjoyed finding out a little bit more about you, what your job entails, um, so many different aircrafts in those uh, VTs as well. And we've got quite a few aircraft enthusiasts in the chat room who have been asking very specific questions, as I mentioned before. So it'd be great to get some of those answered. Um, but I'm going to just kick off now with, with the first question, which I think is very apt for everybody, um, is was the Royal Air Force your first choice of career? Well, I take that one first then, I'll start off. So uh, for me, um, it, it was because my father was in the Air Force and he served 28 years. I mean, I was, I was actually born in RAF Germany, so uh, what was called RAF Germany at the time. Um, and I grew up with it. I grew up with the RAF family and, uh, you know, everything. I, I joined cadets. So I did all the right things and then sort of went to university. And, uh, and then I thought, OK, do you know what? I've done my first and second year in my degree. I think I'll go and do a year out. So I worked for a company called, uh, like it said on the video, Best of Bell Aviation. And I had a really good time. And we were making things, designing and making things for, for quite a few of the aircraft, Western aircraft in the world. Um, and they offered me a job. And, and I honestly, I nearly, I nearly buckled. And I thought, OK, this is this is it. This is going to be my future. Um, but then I thought, no, nope, do you know what? I've always wanted to join the Air Force. I'm going to try it. Um, I, I would I would regret it if I didn't. And uh, yeah, once I joined up, um, the family was there. You know, it was still there when I joined up. And uh, I haven't looked back since. Uh, so for me, I joined cadets when I was quite young, about 14, 15, and then I was on a scholarship scheme the whole way through um, college and university. However, um, throughout that time, I've had um, a couple of summer placements at different engineering companies, and I um, actually did my final year project at university, my dissertation with Rolls-Royce, who offered me to stay on at university for another three years, um, get my doctorate and all that kind of thing. So I've worked with other companies whilst I've been sponsored for the Air Force the whole time and honestly I couldn't be more glad that the Air Force was there for me um, throughout that time because other jobs start at eight nine o'clock in the morning and they finish at five and that's it they just could not compete with the offer of the Air Force mm. with the family the sense of community the extra activities the um the sports and all of that all of those kind of things so um, whilst the Air Force was my first choice, um, I had other offers throughout my career so far, but I'm not going anywhere. For, for me, um, I always wanted to join the Air Force as well. I've got a brother um, who served in the Air Force. But when I uh, finished school, I met this young man who I was completely in awe of and changed my mind. Got a job working in pensions. I actually used to process pension applications and worked in that. I found it so samey. Every day was the same, nothing really changed. And I just became incredibly bored. What I love about the Air Force is the fact that we can do so many different things, try new opportunities. It doesn't matter if you don't like something, you can at least try it and find that out. And it's quite easy to do that. Um, so when we split up, the first thing I did was join the RAF and I'm still here 30 years later. So been really good. I can definitely okay, I'll finish off the question then. <laughs> Sorry Abby. That's okay. Okay so um, RAF wasn't my first choice of a career for a very long time. 
um, going through school, I was going to be a, a gynecologist. And then when I came to England, somebody told me about the British Army and it was really fantastic. They offer up apprenticeship through their aeronautical trade. So I decided to go that way. But as I progressed in my career, I saw um, the beautiful sights coming from the RAF <laughs> and decided that that is where I want to be. So I prepared myself, did all my research and then thought to myself, this is really where I'd like to be and end up having a career there. So I asked my um, hierarchy and got permission and transferred over to the Royal Air Force to become an engineer officer. Yeah. Amazing. Um, this next one, uh, I'm sure it's something everybody wonders. Um, is the RAF very strict and regimented? Um, I'll go with you, Abby. <laughs> so there's certainly a lot of structure and standards that you have to meet. Um, these are these vary throughout different stages of your career. So when you first come into the Air Force, you'll do an initial officer training course. And that's a very structured course. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn about the Air Force. There's a lot to learn about leadership. And there's an, a good fitness standard that you've got to maintain. Um, but you're on a course with lots of other people going through at the same time. So you can really um, use the teamwork and camaraderie to get through. Um, yes, there are, there are standards in IoT, in initial officer training. Um, there are various assessment phases that you've got to pass um, before you're um, ready to take your commission. Um, once you're once you've finished your phase one training, you go into your specialist training, your engineer officer training. And again, it's similar to a university course. This is your professional training now. And um, you have uh, a course at RAF Cosford in Wolverhampton. And you have lots of learning to do, lots of learning about the specific Air Force aircraft and the systems on board those aircraft. And you have exams at the end of the term as well. So yes, regimented and strict, um, definitely in those two senses. Once you get into your Air Force careers after training, then yes, the standards and regiment, regimenting, regimented um, time still exists. Um, you, you're expected to wear a uniform every day and that's got to be prepared to the right standard. It's got to be um, ironed. You, you have to um, have your hair in a specific or a set way in accordance with the rules. Um, but outside of that, once you're in your career, you as an officer, you definitely have quite a bit of control over your time and how you manage your workflow and how you manage your team. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in my experience, I'd, I'd have to say, you know, do people shout at you and people see, you know, lads army and, and things like that. It, the Air Force isn't like that um, from from. And, and this is from what I've seen, um, not just I've done 21 years now, but also, you know, go, growing up with it as well. Um, it's never been in, in that way. Um, going through officer training, um, you know, I can attest that um, our our uh, senior NCOs didn't shout at us unless we were marching about. But then you expect that. You know, they're telling you to turn left and then telling you to turn right. But um, in my in my career, I've never ha really had to order anybody to do anything. And that's a, a really unusual thing to turn around and say, but it's about leadership. And the Air Force teaches you how to become a good leader where you don't have to shout at anybody and order them. If you, if you have to do that, something's gone wrong. But we are in the military and, uh, you know, there may be a time when that needs to happen. But but everybody's on the same wavelength and they know what's going on. So the reality is I haven't had to order anybody to do anything. I can tell people to do things. And that's a leadership thing that the Air Force definitely teaches you to do. Um, but so the discipline that Abby talked about, that comes through everything. So it comes through your technical training, but it comes right from the start through your phase one training, teaching you how to, yeah, you have to you know, you do your bed in a certain way. But that's a slow process of learning to dis uh, discipline yourself. And then when you're fixing an aircraft, you'll have that same discipline that you can't take shortcuts. You need to have those standards and practices. Uh, and then as you go through your career, you learn, you know, the Air Force teaches you how to be a junior NCO, a, a junior leader. And then as you go through as an officer, how to become a leader in that in that respect as well. So um, definitely from my experience, there's no it's not really a shouty, shouty place. I think that answers the question really perfectly. And from somebody outside of the RAF, other work um, organisations and industries are, can also be perceived as strict. You know, if you're working within safety and you have to adhere by certain protocol, 
you know, that, that can be very strict as well. So um, I do think that question was probably relating to maybe what they've seen on TV yeah. uh, of people shouting, uh, but it, it's good to hear it's, it's actually not like that. Um, so our next question, were you daunted by the prospect of working away from your families and being sent to areas of conflict? I think that, that is always quite a two-sided question because there are times when you think you don't know what's going to happen in an area of conflict you know nobody has that crystal ball nothing's particularly going to be the same but at the same time there's a little bit of excitement in the fact that you're going to go to somewhere new have a completely new experience sometimes to a country that you may not have visited before and the fact that you don't quite know fully what to expect means it's going to be a bit of an adventure. So there's a side of you that looks forward to that with a little bit of trepidation and also knowing that we plan everything in the RAF. So a lot of things, a lot of the planning is taken care of. And to a certain extent, you will have a bit of an idea about what you're going to be involved with. But I have to say, as a mother's side of it, sometimes I do look forward to going away because I get looked after. Somebody's <laughs> cooked my meal. Somebody's going to help out with organising laundry. I'm not going to do that for five people at times in the house. Somebody's going to feed me and I don't have to wash up. It's a little bit Sounds like dreamy. in that respect. The hours <laughs> might be long, but it's just the same at home. But in terms of being looked after as a mother, it's a little bit like a holiday. I can I agree there. <laughs> One of the things that um, differentiates the Royal Air Force um, to the civilian companies is the fact that we are um, able to go to conflict when the government um, requ requires us to do so. And I think everybody who decides to be part of the military, either uh, whichever service they choose to, they are signing to say that when such time arrives, they will be prepared to go. So as a parent, yes, I agree with what Siobhan said, that it is a bit daunting, you leaving the kids behind or you leaving your family behind. But once you go and you know the kind of work you are doing for the government, for the country and for other nations, um, you are more than happy, mm. especially with the relief, um, with the relief that we do in other countries as well. It's, it's really good to see that you contributed to that. And on the other hand, being a wife and one of my husband, who is also in the forces, is going away. <laughs> I just sit at home and think, wow, do you really have to go now? But I feel both sides of the um, of the coin because in one in one stage I am the one leaving, and in another stage he is the one leaving. So yeah, we get both sides of the coin, and it's interesting. That's really good. Um, actually, our next question from Sam is linked a little bit to that. It takes on to that next next area. So what is the hardest thing you've experienced and the scariest? Who's going to take that one? Go on, Siobhan, you go for it. Me, really hasn't been the work side of it. It was when I had the opportunity to go caving as one of our uh, adventurous training courses and just go into that hole where there's no light whatsoever and turn around in the dark and I'm a little bit claustrophobic probably was one of the scariest things I've ever done and I won't be doing it again but with work even as a you know, I'm trained in bomb disposal you know we've dealt with things from the second world war right up to present day because of the training that we have and the extent of it it's so thorough that you tend to be prepared for what's coming ahead of you. So you don't tend to really, you might be a little bit, a little bit anxious as we all get sometimes, you know, what is going to be involved in it, but I wouldn't really say scared. I think, I think one of the most, um, yeah, not scared, but anxious. So um, one of my roles was as the senior engineering officer on C-17s. And uh, it was at the time when we were bringing everything back from Afghanistan. So all the people and troops. And I remember sitting there in, in uh, a secret briefing, briefing room somewhere. And um, we had lots of TV screens around us, you know, it was a bit like war games going on sort of thing. 
And then uh, it's going around the room. Have we done this? Have we done this? And then it comes back to me and that, you know, that all things are pointing at me saying, right, are we ready? Can we do this? Can we bring everything back in the, in the time scales that we need to? And it still, it still sends a shiver down my spine, sort of, uh, you know, puts the hairs on the back of my neck up. But, and, and it was an amazing time. It was an exhilarating time and the training kicked in, but I knew that back home, back on the squadron, we had done everything. We prepared everything. The guys were all trained. The aircraft were all prepped. But it was it was one of the one of those moments when you say, "Was I scared? Mm, apprehensive, definitely." But um, I can look back on it with what an amazing time time of my life. Yeah. I think you would naturally assume, not having been in the military before, that the scariest times would be going away on operational deployments overseas. But actually, mm. when you're ready to deploy as an individual or as a formed unit in the military you've done so many months of training that you are ready to go as a team you you've packed everything you've double triple checked um the aircraft are ready the people around you are ready and you've got that team that you're going away with as well and um, so i would have to say some of the most um, personally individually scary times were on um, adventurous training and sports so um, throwing myself down the side of a mountain on a mountain oh. bike which is something I'm not very comfortable with <laughs> and it was a real stretch um, yeah in the in the Lake District um, with my team and thankfully I didn't fall off but yeah, mm. close. I'm with you on that actually yeah. and also um, caving oh my gosh I've done that never again once and <laughs> never again uh, only one way and then one way and <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, maybe actually this one uh, would be good uh, for you to start us off on. Did you ever have any doubts about whether you could succeed within the RAF? And it's not just pointed out to you, Margaret, if everyone can have a go. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so I did not have a doubt at all that I would succeed. In fact, um, as previously said, you you get the opportunity to get all the training that you require to be a successful person in the trade or in the branch that you choose to go to. Um, everything is um, methodical. You are taught, you are given all the tools. And I remember the first time I worked or got my signatures on aircraft, I fixed it. And after that, they told me, just get in it and go and test fly it. And I, <laughs> I thought to myself... <laughs> why, why did you go and fly in it? <laughs> but then it's exactly, they said, well, you have fixed it. You know, you know what you've done and we've taught you everything. You're going with a pilot. So I sat in it and I thought, okay. And then as we lifted off, it was all going well. And then when we landed, I was so proud of myself after having fixed that aircraft, flew, uh, flown in it and then camped back. I thought, this is really good. And then I got the confidence to continue with the job. And then as time goes on, I taught other people. So we share the information that we know and we help other people to become brave. So yeah, <laughs> really enjoyed every bit of it, every time. Great answer. Does anybody else want to add anything to that before we move on to the next question? I think that's a quite a common feeling. Um, I'm quite a anxious person sometimes I worry quite a lot and whenever I have some kind of assessment at work I always get um, you know I always go into quite a studious mode beforehand um, but actually having the team around you you've always got people that have done mm. the job before they've taken that assessment before and um, that's the thing about being in the airport it's a bit like a, a big family so um, I had an assessment board at work recently um, to certify me to make uh, safety decisions and I can phone my fellow engineering colleagues who um, don't work with me now, but they work at various places up and down the UK, up and down the country. And I can draw on my previous experience with them. I can run things by them. So it's a really great team to work with. So that's great. Themselves from time to time. Perfect. And actually, Abby, you touched on this very briefly before. So I'm going to go to somebody else, um, if that's OK. Um, Jennifer is asking, um, what is the scope for progression, I guess, career progression within the RAF, within engineering. So, so I, I, if you want, I, guess, I can pick that one up. So one of my previous right. jobs, I used to be the engineering branch and trade advisor. So um, and, and one of the things is to make sure that um, uh, recruitment is really important, which is why we're here today talking to everybody, but also retention is very, very important. 
And how do we retain people now is to give them a journey going through their, their service careers um, where they can, can keep um, continuously proving, uh, improving themselves. So CPD um, uh, all the way through. So you can join up with the basic, basic qualifications of um, uh, math, English and a science um, GCSE or, or a degree in, uh, in engineering if you want to go the officer route. But then there's plenty of opportunities already in there so you're already gaining, as a technician, you're already gaining your, your, um, your MVQ level threes. Um, but then we've already put in place uh, opportunities, if you want to, to go off and do foundation degrees and go further. And then as you're going through as a technician, there's opportunities for you to commission and then go for uh, engineering officer. Uh, and and your, your education opportunities don't stop there either. As an engineering officer, we've got master's degrees opportunities. And uh, I know for a fact that we've got somebody on doing a PhD right now as well. Um, but also the Air Force for any trade has um, uh, learning credits that you can use as well. So the, the longer you stay in, the more learning credits you build up and you can use those for something else that you might, may want to do. So there's, there's always plenty of opportunities for you to go through. Um, on, the, on the officer side in particular, we've got uh, um, partnerships with all the uh, the professional engineering institutes as well. So all the training that we do um, is, is all recognized by them. And then you've got the journey that's going through your professionalization. So your incorporated engineer through to your chartered status. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's plenty of scope to, to keep improving. You don't just join up and then that's it. We want you to keep improving. That's amazing. And actually that answers one of the other questions about will my um, skills that I, and, yeah. Quali qualifications and experience that I gain within the Royal Air Force, if I was to leave the Royal Air Force, would they still be recognised somewhere else? Absolutely. No, no you're absolutely right. Um, and, and it's not just that. So not only are you already trained up, especially on, on the cyber side as well, um, if, you, if you're in, in, inclined to, to look at that, the, the sort of networks area, we have to get all the qualifications that civilian industry uh, use as well. Um, so, so they're all recognized ex externally, but then um, people see us and it comes back to this discipline thing again, and the quality and the standards that, that we're trained to do, and we, we live and breathe it all the time, um, that industry actually, they, they, they want, they like military people because they know what they're getting. Throughout uh -huh. various different stages of your Air Force career, your jobs, even as an engineer officer, can take on quite different flavours. So throughout the initial officer training period, all of that training is accredited by the Institute of Leadership and Management. So you can, if you want to, um, apply to be uh, to have a level five, six and seven and complete further study. So you can become chartered with that institution. Um, your engineering your engineering day job um, gives you the opportunity to demonstrate skills to become incorporated with some of the various engineering um, institutions um, and or go all the way through to chartered as well. Um, I've had a couple of different flavours of jobs since I've been in the Royal Air Force. I've worked with aircraft, I've worked with vehicles, and now I'm working in a more procurement based environment. And that's allowing me to gather all my skills ready in a year or so to go for my chartership. So I've only been quite a short time, but I'm actually moving through um, a, a journey um, towards my professional accreditation at chartership. Wow. Amazing. Um, that actually answers partly part of Izzy's question. So um, Izzy wants to know, as a mechanical or technical engineer, do you get to move around a lot? And Abby, you, you highlighted that perfectly, that you can move around. Um, can you stay within the engineering corp and move around into different departments within engineering, say, for example? Uh, yes, absolutely. So there's a there's a a, progression, a career progression you would take as a junior engineering officer. When you first start out, you have um, a job that looks after um, a certain piece of equipment and a, possibly a, a small flight of people to look after. And as you move through your career, um, you get exposed to um, bigger, uh, bigger flights and you get to work with aircraft. Um, in terms of your career going forwards, you, you do have quite a lot of say about which area you want to take that in. So now I've moved into the procurement world. Um, I can maybe do um, another job straight after this one and staying in the procurement world and getting my skills um, with regards to accounting and financing and project management 
um, to a quite a high level before I move on. Um, as an engineer, we can do different jobs in the Air Force. We call them out of branch jobs. So for example, I could do a tour within the recruitment world, or I could do a tour within the administrative world. Um, and so you can change the flavor of your career for a couple of years at a time. Perfect. There's so many questions coming in. This is really great. So if I could see. just touch on that as well. So, so Abby's talked about the officer um, journey there, but also as a technician, um, I actually know pilots who started off their careers as technicians you know, fixing aeroplanes, and then they've gone through, got their degrees, uh, they've done a little bit more education, um, but they've become pilots. So even as a technician, even if it's um, working on computers or fixing our military vehicles, um, that doesn't stop you from, from cutting and changing your careers if you want to, and if you want to put the effort in that you want to go and do that, which I think is, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity to do. And I, I totally agree. And I think actually working within the RAF is one of the few places where you get the opportunity to be able to work across such a diverse scope of, of roles and, mm. and, and departments, is it not? You know, if you go into um, you know, a, a civil engineering role, for example, I guess you're you're limited within that company doing that particular role unless they do branch out into other areas. Whereas within the Royal Air Force, the 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 scope is much broader to even come out of engineering if you want to, like uh, Abby mentioned. Mm -hmm. There was um, a question come in about um, communication and will my communication skills be improved? from joining the, the Royal Air Force? I'll take that Who question. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> yes, I'll take that question if you don't mind. So coming from Ghana, my first language is English slash Akan. So when I came into the United Kingdom, my English wasn't um, really good to understand. But as time went on and being in the forces, you have so much opportunity to speak to people of different cultures, such diverse culture, and you get to listen to how they pronounce, how pronounce their words. And I remember when I was in very, very early in my um, military career, I was listening to some Scottish guy speak and all I said was, pardon, what did you say, pardon? So I kept going, but eventually, I tuned my ears to what they are saying, so I was able to understand them, and they were also able to understand me. So there is a lot of language learning and picking up other accent, and that is what I think makes us so um, such a good organization because we pick up all these accents, we pick up all these different pronunciation intonations, and then we translate them very quickly to give the stakeholder what their requirement is. So we are able to work across. Um, a, a big area of, um, mm. sorry, a big area, basically mm. different countries speak to different nations. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with being nervous because if you heard the conversation that was going on in our little chat room here before we came live on air, you would realise that we were all pretty nervous before we even started talking on this. Uh, I mean, in my 21 years, I remember when I was a very young junior officer briefing 10 people um, and I was very, very nervous there. And it's the prep you do and it's the training you have. But I still get really nervous if I'm briefing 300 people in a big uh, in a big auditorium as well. So there's nothing wrong with being nervous. It's only natural. But the Air Force lets you build that confidence up at a slow pace and it teaches you um, how to talk to people as well. So uh, the Air Force will improve your, your confidence and, in, you know, and that will uh, in, in due course improve your communication skills as well, without a doubt. Certainly with regards to public speaking, you are exposed to opportunities to speak in front of large numbers of people from the very first day in training in the Air Force. And once you get into your engineering jobs, you're routinely expected to stand up and talk in front of 80, 100, 150 people if you're on a flying squadron. Um, so whilst that can be quite nerve wracking at the start, the fact that you are doing it so much, it really, really improves your confidence in the area. Brilliant, thank you. Um, our next question, we've had a couple very, very similar. So um, it's something that you can 
you can all um, have a go at. So have there been times within your career where being a woman, you have felt discriminated towards or felt uncomfortable within the work environment? Mind you, you let's take that one first. <laughs> Um, I think the thing about there are more men than women working in engineering you know it's like that throughout the country um, I think sometimes we can look at ourselves and think because I'm in the minority here as a woman is somebody going to look at me differently and sometimes we put that on ourselves without realizing it Quite often I've been in situations where there are 100, 150 men and I'm the only woman there. But I'm still Chevy, I'm still one of their colleagues, I'm still somebody that they're working with that has this job been done, has it been completed, is it in the right time frame, are we good to go? They just treat you like another colleague. It's not about whether or not, you know, oh, are you gonna need to do your hair before we go out on shift you know it's simply a case of this is the time we're meeting let's get on with it and as long as you can do that and just get on with it and don't see yourself as being different because when it comes to working we are in a sense all the same we all have a job to do and we all need to get on with it so I think there is that side of it where we definitely sometimes as women can reflect in on ourselves and see ourselves as different when it comes to the working environment. Thank you. From a professional sense, from the very word go, you have the same standards to meet as our, as male colleagues. And once you've come through your training and you've passed, on graduation day, you're all passing out from Branwell and you've achieved the same thing. So it's a very equal playing field in that sense. And right. as, in, as a female or as a, um, I don't know, some, somebody from, a, from an ethnic background, you've got to uh, try and integrate in the environment that you work in. Because when you integrate, then you'll be able to understand what is going on and people will understand you better as well. Um, there is no point taking offence to everything that people say. You just need to get them to understand you and let uh, give them the opportunity for them to uh, for you to understand them as well so it's a two-way thing and then once there is understanding of what is going on I, I, i'm sure everything is okay yeah right thank you so much we get the asked uh, the diversity questions all the time and it's really important to address it i think um, the armed forces are stereotypically male dominated and the whole of the engineering industry is crying out for more women, more people from ethnic minority backgrounds, which is why we're all here today as well, to just address that and in increase the number of women um, coming through and making applications to join uh, the, the Royal Air Force as well. So moving on to our next question. Um, this is one for um, Abby and Margaret. Do, did you do anything outside of your degree to make your application stand out? Should I take that one, Abby, first? <laughs> okay. okay, so um, I think my path was a little bit different from Abby because I had been in the military. I had served in the junior ranks and then changed later and commissioned into the um, officer role. So I built experience before going into the degree, I started off with the apprenticeship and then got a degree off the back of all my apprenticeships that I had um, accumulated and then joined the area that way. But it's not only the education bits that I focused on. There were other opportunities I had in sports, um, in adventure training, in so many other things, charity work. So. In, in actual sense, what I did was make myself competitive for the recruiter to, to pick me or to give myself the most opportunity to stand out in a lot of applications. So I would ask what sort of value are you going to bring to the organization and how do you intend to stand above your degree 
and uh, make yourself more uh, worthy of a position in the Royal Air Force or in the engineering career. That's it. <laughs> So when I made my application for the Air Force, I was quite young um, and I got a scholarship to go to college when I was 16. And outside of just going to school, I also attended my local air cadet squadron. I'd been there for a couple of years and I was quite busy and active on the squadron. I did a lot of sports um, I did a lot, um, a lot of extracurricular um, uh, drill because um, I quite enjoyed that. I think if you're thinking of joining the Air Force and you've got your degree, I think you need to think about what else can you bring to the party what can you what can you show the recruiters that um, that your interests are so what sports do you like to play and um, what um, what activities do you like to do? do do you have you ever done anything for charity um, do you like to uh, anything do you like to play chess at the weekends are you involved in any sports or clubs or anything like that and um, because the Air Force isn't just a nine-to-five job there's so many other activities that you can take part in um, after the working day or throughout the working day. So I think that's really important to think about what you can what you can bring to the table to show that you're different, to show different facets of your personality. Um, and actually we've we've got a question that leads on quite nicely from that. Um, Manjeet, I know you do a lot of outreach um, and work with schools and colleges um, to promote STEM in schools as well. So this might be one that you'd like to take. Um, but we've had a question coming in um, from our younger audience who are um, studying around GCSE level um, and then also those at degree level. Um, so I, I'm going to kind of try and amalgamate them a little bit. So is there um, an advantage to joining air cadets or a university air squad as an in air squadron as an in to get into the RAF? So, so it comes back to what Abby's just said, though. So what you're doing is it's showing an interest in, in, what, um, in what the Air Force is all about. But also, uh, just joining cadets will give you an idea. Is this for me or not? So uh, yes, it, it's, it, if you're thinking about and you really want to be in, in the Air Force, I think you already have joined cadets by then, you know, because you know it's the first stepping stone because it's something that I want to do. You know, I can't wait till Top Gun 2 comes out because I know there'll be a, a flood of people coming towards the, the, the Army Air, uh, uh, the Air Training Corps. It, it's what I did at the end of the day. But to say, will it give me um, a better um, chance of joining up? It's down to the individual at the end of the day. But what Cadets does, and, and especially what University Air Squadron does in, in a much, um, much more close-knit way to the Air Force, is it gives you an idea of what the Air Force is about. Air training corps, uh, sorry, the um, uh, university air squadrons are very closely linked. So there's lots of station visits going on there. You're practically in the air force by then anyway. Um, and to be honest with you, you have to go through all your selection process to to join a university air squadron. Abby, were you were you university air squadron? Were you? I can't remember. I was the defence technical undergraduate. Uh, okay, right, okay. Um, but um, uh, definitely, if you join university air squadron, you've already joined the air force. But cadets definitely gives you an idea and a feeling and you can visit stations as part of your summer camps and, and things like that. And it, again, it, when you when you come to your interview, you can turn around and say, I've already shown a really good interest in this. And through those different organizations, you'll be doing charity. You'll be doing um, the adventurous training. You'll be starting to talk the Air Force language even, you know, so uh, it, it's, it's a help, but it won't guarantee you to get in. Thank you. Um... Uh, yes, I, I imagine as well, by showing a genuine interest, yeah. um, you, you probably have already joined up. What's the youngest age you can join the Air Cadets, Manji? So, I, it's, oh, does someone tell me, when I joined up it was 13 and three quarters for some unknown reason. I think it's, I think it's either 13 or 14, someone correct me on that one. Uh, it might be 14 now, I think. Um, someone correct me. It's 13 and three quarters for, for I think it was insurance maybe, purposes or something. Yeah. Maybe the recruiters on the line can yeah, clarify yeah. that. And and what's the oldest age it goes to our cadets? So it's, uh, you, you become a cadet warrant officer. I think you can serve till, till about 20. But by that time already, you're, you're already looking at, um, you would have already done your, you know, looking at going to university by that. So, so people normally, you know, leave because of circumstance more than, more than being cadet. But then, you know, if you wanted to stay on, um, and this is for other people, parents and things like that, there's, there's, they always, always need 
um, people to support the squadrons as well. So it, this, this is a message that goes out to not just to the kids out there, but also to their parents as well, that they can go and volunteer their services as well. That's good to know. Um, I like this question uh, because it, it's one area that has always um, been quite a, a big thing for me, actually. And it was way back when, when I was taking my GCSEs, um, it was a consideration for me joining um, one of the armed forces for this particular uh, reason, not only reason, but uh, the question is, do you travel and spend a lot of time from home and where is the best place you've traveled to so far? I'll start that question up first. <laughs> so yes, I have traveled and had opportunity to live in Germany for four and a half years. And whilst there I had my kid and everything, uh, we used the skiing facilities a lot and the weather was brilliant as you could probably um, appreciate the hotter weathers, weathers were hot and the colder were cold. So you had the best of both worlds. And with the exercises, you get the opportunity to travel to so many countries. Just ask um, which unit is going where, and then you could apply to go to that unit and you'll be able to go to many different places in the world. So um, I've had a real opportunity to travel and to live in amazing countries. I think the hardest part about that question has got to be which one was the best? Excuse me. <clears throat> um, I was quite fortunate enough to work on a demolition raid that was just outside Las Vegas in America, which was quite amazing to actually go there with work. Again, I've, I've lived in Germany as well, and it's an absolutely amazing country. This, it's so diverse across its landscape. It really is a lovely place, and the people are great. Um, climbing Mount Vesuvius in Italy with work, again, was quite amazing. Swimming with dolphins in Oman, really good opportunity. So it's, sometimes it's quite difficult to pick out, you know, which one is the best, but the opportunities are definitely there. There's also the opportunity to do that bit more traveling if you want to, in terms of what you're doing, whether it's adventurous training, that you pick or opportunities to work with different squadrons as well. So some of that really is down to you. But on the flip side of that as well is the fact that sometimes people think because we do a lot of training, you don't get the chance to go home. You don't get that opportunity to go back and see family. And it really isn't the case. You know, our free time is our own. We spend that how we want to. It's just that with the opportunity to do so many different things, you don't always tend to go home but yeah definitely a lot of opportunities for travel yeah, yeah travel, travel is a massive sorry go on part. abby oh thank you travel is a massive massive part of life in the air force as an officer your jobs are generally two to three years in one location and then you can move around uh, various different parts of the country um, deployments you can go with a formed unit or you can go individually and these can be from anything from a couple of weeks up to six months um, but whilst I've been working in the Air Force when I was in the flying squadron we traveled extensively all over North America for um, sometimes a week at a time sometimes a bit longer um, doing um, reconnaissance missions for exercises um, I have to agree with Siobhan picking the the best Time is one of the hardest. Um, <clears throat> me personally, when I was in university, I spent a month at um, Colorado in Colorado at the United States Air Force Academy. And that was a trip when I went with um, about 15 of my fellow officers and it was an exchange program. So we got to see how the American Air Force trained their Air Force officers ready for service. And we just had a great adventure there. We went on a couple of military exercises with them and we got to experience a bit of Colorado life and we got to do lots of um, adventurous activities such as climbing. Um, skiing would be another top travel um, destination for me. I've skied with the Air Force in France, Germany, um, Austria. Uh, so it just, it just never stops. In my current job now, I'm in a procurement role and two of the main contractors I work with are both based in America. So as soon as we're allowed to travel again, I'm going to be jumping on a plane a couple of times a year for a couple of annual conferences to go to. So, yeah, brilliant if you like to move around a lot. Yeah, and, and I'll just like to finish that question off because, I mean, in, in my 21 years, I've traveled the world 
and and you know quite a few of the places it, it's been when we we've um, we deployed because we're supporting a conflict you know i've been out in afghanistan in bastion um i've been supporting the troops from oman for over eight months um uh, and and just latterly, I've done eight months eight months in Bosnia, trying to make sure that we keep the peace there. So um, at the adventurous training side, you you can't touch it. It's brilliant. I fly micro lights down to the south of France and in Germany every year as part of a tour. But why did I join up? You know, I joined to serve my country. And if my country is uh, trying to keep the peace over the world, and I have to deploy, then absolutely, that that's what I joined up for. And there's been um, at least three of my deployments I've volunteered for because I want to go out there and deploy, support what we're trying to do um, across the globe to keep the peace across the globe. Um, and, and every one of my tours has been exceptional. It's been, I can't pick up the best one. Um, you know, just, it's always your last one. So Bosnia was fantastic and to come home from that, but it's always nice to then come back to the UK because you've got such a big wider experience of what's happening in the world it makes you um, really, really uh, understand um, what the UK is all about as well. So uh, it's really, the travel is part of it. So if you can understand that piece and, and what you're going to get from traveling the world, you'll appreciate it even more when you come home. That's brilliant. Um, I'm just looking at our schedule and we are out of time. Um, and we've still got so many questions to get through. It's always the way, um, and apologies, my eyes were darting all over the screen there. I'm seeing them coming in on the thread. Um, thank you to the RAF recruitment team. They've been answering a lot of questions while you guys have been talking as well. We've had some recruitment centric questions coming in. And there's so many more of people um, who have emailed their questions in before the event started. So I'm really sorry we didn't get through all of your questions, but please do pop them in the chat because our panelists are going to be in the chat room and can answer any further questions for you there as well. Um, so thank you so much for your time. It was great to hear uh, more about your background and um, all the places you've been. I'm very jealous now. Um, I have climbed Mount Vesuvius, so just one tick there, but uh, yeah, I cannot compare really in terms of uh, the travel, it sounds amazing. Um, and thank you for, for your open and honest answers. Um, we are going to be moving on now. We're going to um, watch a, a few, a couple of videos um, and we're going to hear from Flight Lieutenant Fiona Padbury um, from Recruitment, who is going to give a bit more of an overview of um, the, the typical careers within the Royal Air Force and, and how to get into them. Um, so we'll roll VT now, Lee, please. Thank you again, everyone. Where is... <laughs> My name is Roy to me. I'm a flying officer in the RAF. The military is just not what I thought it would have been initially. I thought it was a massive commitment, and if I join, then that's it. I don't have my life. But that's not true at all. It's not 24 hours of the day. You do get your own space, and you can be your own self. This is his own game. <laughs> Knowing that I've got friends with the same sort of passion and ambition helps me. Just grinding with each other in difficult situations pulls us together. That's just the bond that you get in the RAF. People will go out their way to help you. Solid effort, bro, solid effort. There's a time for everything. I'm free, I get my weekends. Man, like. I know Stephen through primary school. And we've been friends ever since. Very loyal. He's just humble. Elton went to the same secondary school as me, the same college. He played at the same basketball club. Known him for quite a while. He's a good friend. Comfortable? <laughs> You're going to always run into hurdles, barriers. You can't run away from it, because sometimes that can be the only gate through. I've been through situations where I've been way out my depth, but I figured that I could just step up and get past those barriers. Remember, like, the trainers used to hang on these... Uh, How did they get those down, yeah? I just love traveling. I'd hope to get deployed abroad. When you travel, it breaks prejudices, because then you understand about other people's culture, and you start to realize what they're about. 
About three and a half, four years? Yeah, coming up to four years. Yeah, I've pretty much seen him more than I thought I would. Whenever he has a free weekend, I go up to see him or he drives down to see me. He's always been ambitious, but I guess the RF has made him more ambitious. I just find planes fascinating, the way they're designed. There's no other job where we can be exposed to this sort of technology. It makes me feel proud. <laughs> I love our basketball. If I'm in the senior men's team, I've still got a few seasons left. I'm now on my second phase of training in aerosystems engineering. Why do we get out of here? That's what we <laughs> Confidence, belief, resilience. The RAF has really expanded that for me. This has made me feel like I can do things that I never thought I could. Okay, ready? My name is Flight Lieutenant Fiona Padbury and I'm the Officer Commanding um, Armed Forces Careers Office, Inverness and Belfast. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the actual uh, recruitment process um, and how uh, you go through, the, through it uh, to successfully join the Air Force. Um, so there's two, there's two streams uh, to, the, to the process. There is, uh, the first stream is for uh, other ranks or airmen and airwomen as we call them. Um, and then the second stream is for officers. Um, the, the two uh, streams are slightly different, uh, but there's some aspects that are similar in both. Um, so first of all, I'll talk to you about the other ranks uh, stream. So um, initially you will um, apply to join the Air Force on our website. Um, your application will then be uh, processed by the virtual AFCO. So AFCO is Armed Forces Careers Office. Um, and your application will then be checked to see if you're eligible to join the Air Force. Um, if that's successful, um, your application will then be handed off to your local careers office. Uh, for example, anybody who joins from the northeast of Scotland, uh, the Highlands or Islands, their application will be processed through my office in Inverness. And likewise, anybody who pro um, joins the Air Force from Northern Ireland or the Republic of Ireland will be processed through the careers office in Belfast. Uh, so there is a number of Armed Forces careers offices across the UK um, which will become your local office when you're uh, dealing with your application. So once your application lands there, um, a recruiter will call you. Um, they will welcome you to the to the process um, and talk uh, talk you through what will happen. Um, first of all, you will be asked to uh, attend a online presentation, or should I say, a watch an online presentation, which is on YouTube. Um, and some careers offices at the moment are actually doing virtual presentations as well. If you're lucky enough to to be invited to one of those. Uh, following that, you'll be invited into the careers office to sit the aptitude test. Now, everybody joining from the ranks uh, or joining the ranks is to sit an aptitude test. And this will determine um, what uh, trade or should I say job that you might be eligible to, um, to go for or for apply. Whilst you might have a preference uh, you may not be suitable for that based on your aptitude test scores, but don't worry because there's something for everybody uh, within the Air Force. Uh, so we can help you make uh, other choices if you need to. Uh, so on completion of the aptitude test, you will then do a selection interview. Uh, really straightforward. Um, and that's just um, allowing us to understand a little bit about you, you know, uh, where have you been to school at? What jobs have you done? Um, you know, what do you know about the Air Force? What do you know about the job that you're applying for? And it's just a bit of a check to make sure that you know what you're getting yourself in for um, and we can uh, help you prepare the best. Uh, following that, uh, you will then undertake the uh, health assessment. So that comprises of uh, a fitness test um, for um, um, new uh, recruits or uh, new applicants such as yourself, 
uh, you will be asked to do a mile and a half run on a treadmill at one of the local gyms. Um, following the mile and a half, you will have to do press-ups and sit-ups. And the number of press-ups and sit-ups you need to do and the, the time that you need to complete your mile and a half is all dependent on uh, your gender and your age. Um, and the guys and girls at the, uh, the gym will be able to tell you what levels that you need to obtain and also your recruiter will be able to tell you that as well. Uh, so you will know what, what standard you need to achieve. Um, you will then undertake a medical uh, by, uh, this is done by our provider Capita um, and we have got no, um, no say in this. Uh, it's their process and they make the decisions. Uh, uh, so following successful completion of both those, um, you will then um, potentially be accepted to join the Air Force. Um, you will get a notification from the careers office um, and then uh, they will uh, give you a start date for your basic training uh, at Aria Fulton. So it's all really exciting um, and a really quick process, but please be mindful that you control the speed at which you go through the process. Uh, and we try not to put pressure on you uh, to make decisions quickly and move through um, so that is the other ranks process. So moving on to the officer uh, process, um, the, the first stage again is quite similar. Uh, you'll be asked to uh, view an online presentation. And again, maybe your uh, local career office is doing a virtual presentation, so you might be asked to attend that. Again, it's just for information and awareness to increase uh, your knowledge. Uh, so please do watch those. Um, because it will help you uh, in the application process. Um, depending on what branch or job, officer job that you um, are interested in will determine whether you need to do uh, what we call a CBAT. Uh, and that's computer, it's a, it's a computerized aptitude test. And that's done at RAF uh, Cranwell. And it's a day, a day of testing and it will basically um, decide if you have got the aptitude to do certain branches. Um, if we are talking specifically about engineering roles, um, within the officer world, you do not need a CBAT score to uh, become a commissioned officer uh, um, for uh, within the engineering branch. And that's because we look for you guys and girls uh, to have an engineering specific degree. Uh, so we know you've got that aptitude. Um, roles such as pilot, uh, air operations, uh, and intelligence, those are the roles that require a CBAT score. Um, so following successful um, uh, pass at CBAT, or if you don't need to go to CBAT, you will then be invited to do a filter interview. And again, very similar to the selection interview, uh, but we look for a little bit more on your knowledge of the Air Force. So um, it comprises of two, two parts. Uh, the first part is about you, uh, your schooling, your jobs um, and what you've done. Uh, the second part is uh, your knowledge of the Air Force and your motivation for joining. Um, and uh, we like to know, uh, you know what, what you know about the Air Force. Where are we? What are we doing? And what aircraft do we have? Um, you know, and your awareness of NATO as well uh, and current affairs. Okay, so the third stage is the filter interview. So it's quite similar uh, to the selection interview, apart from uh, we like to know a little bit more. Uh, so it's divided into two parts. The first part is um, about you, about your schooling, about your education. Um, and you know what what have you done in your life to date? Um, the second part is a bit about uh, your motivation for joining the Air Force. Um, why why do you want to commission into the Air Force? Um, what do you know about us? Uh, what um, roles do we do? What aircraft do we have? Uh, where are we located? Uh, we also like to know a little bit about current affairs and uh, about NATO as well. So a little bit more than the selection interview, but that's just to make sure that you are uh, suitable to be a commissioned officer in the Air Force. 
um, successful pass of a filter interview will then lead you on to the uh, medical and fitness test. Again, uh, exactly the same as the, um, the airman route. Um, successful passes at that, uh, you will then go to uh, Officer and Air Crew Selection Centre, um, or OASC as we call it. And that is a day um, at Area of Cranwell. Um, and you will undertake a whole host of different leadership activities and tasks uh, and planning um, with uh, various other people um, who are there as well uh, to undergo officer and air crew selection. It's a really intense day, uh, but also really enjoyable and a great experience. Um, so following um, you know, a positive experience at OASC, um, and if you're successful in passing that, uh, you will then get an officer offer of acceptance. Um, and then following that, uh, you will be asked again to uh, attend a familiarisation visit at RAF Cromwell. And that's for you to look around the training establishment uh, to see where you'll be going, where you'll be spending uh, your, your time uh, during your basic training. Um, and you'll also get to meet other people that will potentially be on your training course. Uh, so a great introduction to a really uh, successful and uh, long career. Um, and then uh, following that, you will receive a start date for your initial officer training. So I've just covered off the two, the two uh, processes uh, for joining the Air Force. Um, if you have any questions with regards to that, all the information I've covered today is on our website. Um, it's also available on Twitter or Instagram if you choose to follow us. And there's a whole host of resources uh, on YouTube. So please feel free uh, to have a look at those and also get in touch with your local Armed Forces Career Office should you require any further information. Thank you. I'm Chief Tech Mark Long. I joined the Air Force in October 2000 um, as an aircraft technician for avionics. I went through training and learned how to um, facilitate the fixing of aircraft um, and all the software systems on aircraft. So I've worked in a variety of different roles. I've worked fixing the um, electronics on Jaguar aircraft, um, so all the different systems are on Jaguar. Um, from laser heads to inertial navigation systems. I've then moved into the world of electronic warfare and producing software for electronic warfare for aircraft platform safety. And I'm currently working outside of my trade and I'm working within the recruitment selection headquarters, producing um, various stats and elements that are required to develop um, our recruitment. As part of my role within recruitment selection, I'm a database manager, so we liaise with various different departments within recruitment, um, as well as the Armed Forces Careers Office to make sure that the recruitment process goes smoothly and that we capture all the data that we need um, from candidates. Personally, I haven't had any issues at all with being gay in the military. Um, I think the RAF is a very inclusive organisation um, the various managers that I've worked for have always been very accepting as well as the rest of my colleagues um, and I find very comfortable about being open about my sexuality and my sexual orientation and letting people know and I'm always welcomed when I'm meeting new people and my sexuality or sexual orientation comes up within conversation when people are asking about what my personal circumstances are in my family life and background. At the end of the day, you're all there to do a job and no one's bothered about your sexual orientation, sexuality or whether you're a member of the LGBT community. And there's a very good spirit that everyone's there to get on, support each other and do the job that we're meant to do. It's always good to meet new people and you certainly get that um, when you're working in the Royal Air Force. Um, and as part of that, I've met a number of people from the LGBT community. Um, whilst you get to know each other, you find out about the different experiences that they've had, but it also acts as a good support network to get to know people. Um, 
We have the Freedom Network, which is um, a group of people that set up um, a support network for the LGBT community. But we also have the Diversity Allies program, which is starting up and looking across not only the LGBT community, but all areas to support anyone that might need some help and provide them with that signposting of where to go. Good afternoon to you all. My name is Suzanne McLaughlin and my current job in the Royal Air Force is as the Head of Engineering Branch and Trades, where I'm responsible for the recruitment, development and retention of all of our RAF engineers and technicians. I would like to begin by emphasising a fact. The world we live in today is changing. It always has been, but new kinds of crisis are transforming many of our roles and the way in which we work. From controlling the airspace over a combat zone, to delivering aid to those in need, we have been able to respond at a moment's notice, wherever and whenever needed to take on any challenge. It is in this exciting world that our RAF engineers live and work. As an engineer in the Royal Air Force, you'll become a skilled professional, a leader and a manager, and will be joining the ranks of the very best and brightest personnel. Of the Royal Air Force's 30,000 strong force today, I am proud to say that just over a third of us are engineers, covering 11 specific engineering roles. As many of you may be aware, both operations in the air and operations on the ground relies upon up-to-date technology. From some of the fastest aircraft in the world to cutting edge communications and electronics. From some of the fastest aircraft in the world to cutting edge communications electronics. This technology is the responsibility of our teams of engineering officers and technicians. My time as an engineer in the Royal Air Force has seen me develop as a communications electronics engineer. I have conducted numerous roles and I've had a fantastic time. Therefore, I fully concur with the panelists that choosing a career within our branch or trade is a decision you will not regret. Engineers in the Royal Air Force are essential for the success of every one of our missions. And as you will have gathered from today, the range of opportunities within the field is vast. Not one of us has the same career pathway as the last. Depending on your passion, qualification and skills, we have everything from engineering aircraft maintenance, IT systems, cyberspace communications and so much more. With so many areas of specialisation, you are guaranteed to have a career that you'll find not only challenging, but both rewarding and fulfilling. I have listened with great interest to the stories of our engineering panellist members today, and I'm delighted to hear that they have had such fruitful and fulfilling careers to date. Evidently, they are making the most of the opportunities that the Royal Air Force has to offer. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the audience members today for engaging with us and providing us with some excellent questions, some of which really challenged our minds. So if you like what you've heard over these last one and a half hours and you feel inspired by some of our own stories, potentially it's time for you to make your own with us. If you're interested in world-class training, working with some quality equipment and working alongside a fantastic team of technicians, then I urge you to visit our recruitment website and register your interest today. You have the potential. It's time for you to start writing your story. This is no ordinary job. Thank you.
I love apprenticeships because it allows people that are willing to learn the opportunity to get a job within the industry. It makes it possible to earn a living while getting that invaluable experience that will eventually open doors for you in the future. The reason why I love apprenticeships is because it gives you an opportunity to learn and earn and be able to get the knowledge and skills to jump on a very good career uh, pathway. I love every single aspect of apprenticeships. The new people you get to meet, the job on training, the, the college work, the work in general is just amazing and all the different people you get to meet and actually putting something into the community which you know is going to be there for a long time is an amazing feeling and I love everything about it. For me, one of the main reasons I like apprenticeships are the hands-on side of things, you know? You're not sat behind a desk all day working, you're actually machining things, making things with your hands, so you can go home at the end of the day and say, oh, you know, I did this, I did that, I made this. Um, you get to experience quite an array of uh, different working environments um, as you go around each department, so this can really help you decide where you'd like to go in the future. I love apprenticeships because they teach me the theory side, they teach me the practical side of engineering, as well as allow me to network and learn lots of different stuff from other engineers around me. I'm an ex-apprentice myself, and I've been managing, looking after apprentices and trainees for many years. They are our future, and here at Oxford Space Systems, we make sure that we give them the best opportunity we can, and we want them to be the best in the business. Apprenticeships, they're the perfect way to launch your career as you learn and you earn and you get to put that learning straight into application within your workplace. I'm very proud to say I started my career as an engineering apprentice. I love apprenticeships because they give each apprentice the opportunity to develop the skills that employers need. You can see the confidence of an apprentice develop over time as they learn the skills and behaviours to help them progress. I also love apprenticeships because you can see the value an apprentice brings to a team as their employer guides and trains them to be a skilled and reliable member of the workforce. There is such a breadth of industry in which you can partake in apprenticeship in now. It's the perfect amalgamation of vocational and academic development and they are a great gateway in career path for so many people from so many backgrounds irrespective of your diversity and your characteristics. So for me, that's why I love apprenticeship. The OAS team are incredible. They are the reason that I love my apprenticeship. It's thanks to them that I learned so many things. Currently I've been using the lathes and it's thanks to trainers like Mike that I've been able to make things like this. This is a lightsaber that I made. I've never done anything like this before. What attracted me to an apprenticeship at SSE was their policies and the fact that you're making a difference, so you're doing something better. The apprenticeship lasts for four years um, and my goal is to hopefully, hopefully progress um, and stay with SSE. So we arrive, um, usually we start at about seven in the morning um, and then we'll find out whether we're onshore or offshore. And if we're offshore, we'll load the boat up and then go out to the turbines, do the jobs that, and the tasks that need doing, and then return home. Um, when the weather's really bad, it's a non-sale day, so we spend the day at the office um, doing tasks and base checks and things for the turbines, but onshore. I am Katrina. I'm a trainee engineer in the onshore electrical wind team and based at Griffin Wind Farm. I feel very lucky to work here every day. It's spectacular and it's a very chill day-to-day -day working life and I get to work with a really good team of people as well. SSE had the most inviting uh, websites when I went on to look uh, at jobs and they've got a really good safety policy as well and that's really important to me. My message to any females thinking about joining this industry is that you just have to go for it. It's a really good industry to get into, there's loads of job prospects, Everyone that I've ever worked with has treated me really well. They'll go out their way to help you and you have a fun day at work. My one tip for anyone coming to interview for an apprenticeship would be to be confident. Uh, my one top tip would be to research the role you'll be applying for and to find out as much as you can about the industry uh, that you'll be working in as you will be asked about that. My one tip would be 
be open and honest and be yourself. Show how keen you are and how willing you are to be in the industry because in 10 years time you'll look back at it and you'll realise it's the best thing you've ever done. My tip for an SSE apprentice would be make sure you do your research on the company, make sure you know what they do and make sure you know what you'll be doing in the future. Do some research about the role before you come into the interview. It's good to, to make sure you know the role, you know what you're applying for and, and that to be something you're interested in so that when you sit down with the interviewer or interviewers, you're, you're coming across as interested, you're coming across as knowledgeable about the, the, the apprenticeship you're applying for and potentially have some questions up your sleeve that you can maybe ask to the interviewer something along the lines of what type of work do you specialise in, is it domestic, is it industrial, is it commercial, just again to show that it's, this is a job that you want, this is something you're interested in and hopefully that will kind of stand you out in, in terms of interviews. My one top tip would be enthusiasm is key and ask lots of questions. The one tip I'll give any apprentice when coming in for an interview is to be up front with any special assistance. The interviewers are willing to accommodate to your every need. Okay, so, so my top interviewing tips for apprentices is, is to relax, to be yourself um, and to be really honest with us about the kind of things that you enjoy um, because of the things that you enjoy are the things that make you a good apprenticeship that will stand you in good stead at the interview. So achieving net zero by 2050, it's obviously a bold target, but it's one that we have to achieve. And most importantly, it's one that we can achieve. Our emissions in the UK have already reduced by 45% from the levels that we had in 1990. And the main driver so far has been the change to the way electricity is generated. And as you know, we're working hard to prepare our power system for this change. But now it's our turn to look at change in the way that we all use energy in our lives and how we can make a difference at a personal level. The first step to make a change is to be aware of how much we are actually contributing to the greenhouse gas emissions with our current way of living. To then identify what small changes we can make to improve our footprints and live in a more sustainable manner. So can you be a smarter shopper and reduce food waste and use of plastic? Can you try a new vegetarian recipe once a week or once a month? Do you recycle at home and are you able to influence a positive change in your family? And uh, do you know where your electricity comes from, for instance, and is it zero carbon? So my challenge for you today is to go online, take a quest to evaluate your carbon footprint, identify the area that has the highest impact in your greenhouse gas emissions and decide on at least one action that you will commit to in order to reduce this footprint. Once you have chosen what your action will be and how you will ensure you do it, uh, go to a friend, a classmate or even your family and share what you have chosen to do and why. Sharing this will help raise awareness and knowing what you and your friends will be doing will make you realise the difference that collectively you can make. Also, once you've told someone what you're going to do and how, you kind of have to do it, right? So just remember that you have the power to make the changes to the way you live and you have a very important role to play in achieving net zero. So let's do it. Hi everyone, my name is Danny Heath and I'm the founder of Your Game Plan. Uh, it's great to be part of the Engineer Your Career event today. Uh, I'm sure you've had a really good day so far of learning and, and I'm sure there'll be brilliant sessions post this for you to keep you engaged moving forward. We wanted to take some time today to talk to you about soft skills and employability skills, particularly five that we feel are the most important and give you a bit of insight and advice on how to further hone those skills. Um, my colleague Emma is with, here with me today, so she's going to talk you through our top five soft skills from your game plan, and then I'll come back after to talk to you about how you can utilise our platform to further hone those skills. So over to you, Emma. Thank you, Danny. Um, so today, the five top skills uh, we will be talking about today are communication, emotional intelligence, resilience, presentation and public speaking, and worth work etiquette. Um, to start, I'll talk a bit about communication. Um, communication is a really important soft skill and soft skills are really important as they are transferable skills that are used in all careers and can be transferred from every job you have throughout your career. That's why they're important to hone while you're young and important to get you on kickstart your career. Um, so first of all, communication is so important in both terms of writing in emails as well as speaking 
in meetings or presentations. It's important to monitor your body language in terms of how you're sitting can really portray the way you come across in different settings. And that should vary between whether it's a casual meeting or a more formal presentation. Um, it's also really important to communicate in a non-technical way in circumstances when you are speaking to non-experts. So for example, in engineering, you may be communicating with customers who will have no knowledge of your field. So it's really important that you are able to speak in layman's terms, so in non-technical terms and portray your point across in a clear manner. Um, this is particularly important in current times as communication has really changed. Now it's over Zoom or over email. You have to be able to be much clearer in the way you communicate because there's much bigger risk of miscommunication when you're not in person with other people and you can't just ask someone a quick question. You need to be really honing your communication skills. So Google, for example, cites communication as one of their top skills for both potential and current employees to have as prerequisites entering the company. And another survey of 260 employers um, by the nonprofit organization, National Association of Colleges and Employers, which includes people like Chevron and IBM, um, they also rank communication in the top three most sought after skills by job recruiters. So communication is super important for uh, your journey in whether it's engineering or whatever route you um, intend to take. The next soft skill we're going to talk about is emotional intelligence. And we've outlined this in three key uh, aspects. This is being able to recognize and manage your own emotions as well as others. So being able to understand when someone needs your help or whether it's you need to respect them in a certain way. The second aspect is handling interpersonal relationships. So this is whether you're dealing with a customer and or your manager, your relationship to them will be differently. So the way you behave around them will be different. And thirdly, it's respecting others and resolving disagreements. Um, in the, your work life, there's likely to be knockbacks and disagreements. So it's important that you're able to take on board other people's opinions or disagreements with you and not get personally impacted about them and, and resolve them in a mature manner. Um, Talent Smart have uh, done some research and proven that, shown that Emotional intelligence is a crucial factor for success in the workplace and findings have revealed that people with average IQs outperform those with the highest IQs 70% of, of the time in terms of emotional intelligence. So it's important to highlight that grades aren't the only important thing when entering the workplace and that being able to have other skills from other opportunities or other parts of your life are important it's important that you can emotionally kind of connect with your colleagues and behave in a certain way that's respectful and taking their views on board so the next skill is resilience and when we talk about resilience we talk about being able to take on board criticism and take on board any feedback you receive in the workplace and deal with any conflicts you may have with other, other employees. Um, it's also important that you're able to manage your stress levels and manage a good work-life balance. Um, this is really important, particularly in current times when you're likely to work at home. It's important to set out boundaries between where you're working and where your home space is. Um, and it's really kind of highlighted in resilience is that when you are starting out on your career, you may have a lot of knockbacks. You may apply to hundreds of jobs and only hear back from 10 of them. It's important that you're able to be resilient and understand that that's all part of the journey and that it's not anything personal against you. 
it's just unfortunately part of uh starting your career is taking some knockbacks and making them build you up higher and succeeding in your career so i've taken a quote here which is from a social care um company so nothing to do with engineering but i think the sentiment is really important in engineering careers or any career path you might take and it says that pri prioritizing your own well-being is not selfish but vital if you are going to be able to sustain best practice in these difficult times so it's really important that you are able to go and speak to your teacher or a manager at work if you're having a tough time or whether you need to have take a break or have extra support in the workplace or in school it's going to affect you more in the long term if you bury it away and pretend that everything's okay so it's important to speak to your teacher or manager so that you can work better in your role and the next key skill we're talking about is presentation and public speaking now this is a huge part of any job you're likely to have to present in any role you may take whether you're in a sales role or whether you're doing analytical role work you will have to at some point present your work to other people whether it's to one person or a whole team you really need to and this brings in parts of the communication skill to be able to communicate confidently in those presentations so we've outlined kind of four key steps to a clear presentation and that's firstly to be as prepared as possible for a presentation secondly to know your audience this is to target your presentation to your audience so for example if you're speaking to customers you need to adapt your presentation to them or if you're speaking to colleagues who know much more about what you're talking about you can be much more detailed about your presentation um, which leads me on to the tailor your presentation point that's really important that you're able to adapt a presentation to the circumstance i think one of the main issues that people have presenting is that they go into a presentation expecting everyone to have the same idea as them or same knowledge as them and it's really important that you you take in consideration who you're speaking to um, and finally communicate with confidence you need to be convincing when presenting to an audience if not they won't be able to believe what you're saying so communicate with confidence even if you don't feel very confident it's important to come across in a confident manner so the final soft skill we're going to talk about today is work etiquette and work etiquette is dependent on the office or environment you're working in so the work etiquette is knowing how to conduct yourself in your workplace this is going to vary vary a lot between what kind of environment it is whether it's an office whether it's a lab you're working in it's you need to be able to behave in the correct way especially when there are safety concerns in place as there may be in an engineering career you may be working with uh, important substances or dangerous substances that you need to really be careful with but when we're talking about an office or an office-based role you need to know how to professionally email others in various circumstances so if it's, it's an ex external person from your business you would likely email them in a different way as you may email someone you're close with and know more personally so it's really important that you know how to behave appropriately in different different office and work environments um, and it's really important that you're able to consider others in the workplace um, we have key courses at your game plan that focus on each of the skills we have discussed today and the key skills you will learn about work etiquette relate to email etiquette and office etiquette which explain to you how you behave at your office party for example which is really important that you don't uh, behave inappropriately and 
uh, I've included a quote here that says that when you meet someone, you've got seconds to impress them. So when you're going into an interview or first entering the office, it's really important you conduct yourself in the correct way for that industry. And it's important that you research what that business is like so that you're appropriately dressed, appropriately um, kind of coming across in appropriate manner that isn't rude or insensitive to that situation. And you can also explore all of our courses on things like interview skills, CVs, and that cover all of the topics we've spoken about today. We've got courses covering each of these topics that can really help you out and give you a bit more insight into what we've discussed in this presentation. So um, Google has cited that its key characteristics of success are fundamentally to do with human emotion and social skills, which should be nurtured, developed and celebrated as the key to future success. So it's really important that you're able to hone these soft skills as that will give you a big head start in your career. And it will also help you moving from school into the workplace, as well as moving between different roles you may take within a business or moving into new roles in different businesses. So a study from a few years ago, it surveyed um, 198 employers in the UK and showed that employers prefer soft skills rather than technical knowledge for graduates they're recruiting. And this is not only going to be the case for graduates, it will also be important for school students. It's important that stu it's important to these em employers that uh, young people are good at communicating, a team player, confident and analytical, and have said that these are more important skills to have than technical knowledge. Um, what they did say that further down the line, once they've worked in the job for a few years, then the technical knowledge is more important, but going into a new role, it's important that you're able to have these soft skills rather than the key kind of, uh, key kind of technical knowledge about the business, as that's something you will in turn learn at whatever role you have. Um, and the Confederation of British Industry have also support, supported these findings. So what we can see is that it's really kind of more and more important over the last few years that these soft skills are honed and that you're able to understand what, what they mean and learn more about them and not go into the workplace blind. Um, I'll now pass you over to Danny, who's going to sum up what we've spoken about today. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. It was a great presentation and we really hope everyone in the audience found it useful. And also, please don't worry if you come out with that presentation with more questions than answers. We understand that for some of you, those skills would be new and for even more of you, they're not skills that you've had a great chance to develop yet. So as Emma mentioned, we have access to 28 different soft skills and employability training videos on our site at www.yourgameplan.co.uk. All of those courses are accredited by the CPD and after completing each course, you will receive a certificate of pass to use for your job search further into the future. Um, also as well, whilst we're in lockdown and schools are closed and potentially you're looking at ways to keep yourself busy, um, all of our platform is completely digital first and you're able to complete it on any laptop, tablet, phone or other device. Uh, the best way to register is to either go onto the platform and, and click for students and you can sign up independently and start doing the learning. Alternatively, you could speak to your teachers at school or university to see if your school is already registered to use the platform. Um, and just a nod to any teachers that are watching, uh, the platform is completely free for all schools as well. Um, thank you so much for your time. We hope you enjoy the rest of the rest of the event. And thank you very much to Campus Media for, for inviting us to come along. Welcome wow. back for the that's last a, time today. That's a wrap for today. It, we are at the end of the event now. so. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, 
couldn't think of a better way to spend World Engineering Day. And um, we really hope that you enjoyed the event and found it really useful. Judging by the chat throughout the whole day, um, it looks like you guys have found it really useful and you've really walked away with some takeaways from that. So we're really, really, really glad. Um, and uh, we were just discussing, Amanda and I, we've got a, um, a, a big fan in the chat today. Um, so Amanda wanted to give a big shout out to Ethan. <laughs> Thank you, Ethan. You have been with us all day from the start. And this is one of the longest events that Campus Media have run. Really proud about it. It's been a day long celebration for World Engineering Day. So thanks for sticking with us, Ethan. And we've loved your questions. Um, thank you to Emma and Danny from your game plan. Um, please do check out their free resources that they have, the, their courses not just on soft skills, but courses on um, finding out more about certain, certain industry sectors on their website as well. Um, and you can, you can walk away with um, you know, more accreditation and a better idea of how to tackle that first interview, for example. So please do check that out. Um, thank you to everybody who has registered to attend today's event. We know um, that you've not been able to see it all. Um, we know school's happening, we know university's happening, we know work's happening, and you, you'll have done your best to juggle it around. But if you did miss anything, don't worry about it. That is the beauty of a virtual event. Everything is there to watch on demand afterwards. So it's all Absolutely. viewable on this link on the playback that you're on now. And we will be putting that on our website as well. And we will, um, pop the links in the chat very soon of uh, how to find those. For those yeah, of you, if, yeah, yeah. Go on, well, sorry, if, Lucy. Yeah, no, so if you, I was just gonna say, if you you guys have registered, you will be receiving um, some communication from us, Campus Media follow-up, um, to show you how to access the on-demand footage. So please, 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 if you've missed any, or you couldn't catch it this morning, make sure you register, and we can definitely bring you up to speed on that. Exactly so that. And we the can... links in the chat for you so you've got that and uh, we do quite a lot of similar events as well so uh, you can also um, keep up to date with, with our forthcoming events um, what is left to do is thank you all of our partners um, who have supported this event in bringing it to you and that is everybody from the IET and the IET.tv um, Lee and Tom, who have been our production team, um, doing all the magic at the back end, making this all run smoothly. Thank you to you guys. Um, and thank you to our, the Royal Air Force. Um, really love that session. Um, such great engaging questions from everybody at home as well. That was really great. Um, lots of information from employers. Every single one of you employers who have sent us your content. A film special things to show today. Thank you so much. Um, all of the sessions will be available as on-demand sessions to view on our website and we will also be sending you links through and information pages to find out more about those speakers, amazing speakers, um, and uh, the employers and their opportunities where to find out more. Gosh we've had it all today. <laughs> We have indeed. Obviously, we can't forget um, at 7pm the IET's Young Engineer of the Year Awards. So please, please, please tune into that as well. It's looking really good. You, if you were around earlier on for the uh, finalists, you'll see how you'll see how inspiring the finalists really, truly are. So if you're like us, you're going to want to find out who wins. So please do stick around for that. Um, you'll find the information on the chat box for that as well. Um, one last thing from me, I think, um, is just we love your feedback. Like I said in the chat, it's been great throughout the day. So it's, it's lovely for us to hear um, the feedback, how you found it and how we can actually improve our, you know, we can add to our future events as well and have you there. Um, so please reach out to us on socials. I'll put that all on the chat as well if you want to follow us um, for to see what other opportunities and events we have coming up. But from me, all I've got to say is, Thank you so much and stay well. And hopefully we see you at our next event. In person, maybe next In time. In person, <laughs> absolutely, yes. Take care, everybody. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
Thank you.